Good morning to all. It's my pleasure on behalf of the Department of OB Gaini here in uh, Bangalore Baptist Hospital to welcome all of you, faculty, BSOG members, and delegates who have logged in uh, to this webinar. I request uh, Mrs. Leela to open with a word of prayer. We thank God for this uh, seminar. So be before we begin, shall we look to Lord and prayer? <coughs> Kripal Aishwarya on the night when they see it. Even the Samidali in a far Samitik in our Baru Ragi Deva, Yella Ashir Wadagalibadi and get forty forty one day. Eleven of Samastavano, Ashir Wadamari Kuruata and Nino, even the web seminar than in Ashir Wadamaru, either the Bago is on the plenty of over and group. In a Vishesh for the Kripalu, Nana Vano in Anubrace for the Bekagi, Acevina Namudani, E. Pratane, and the Bed of the Vetan there. Amen. Now I request Dr. Spurgeon, who is our Director and CEO at Bangalore Baptist Hospital, to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Shani. Good morning and warm welcome for this webinar that is being organized. Dear esteemed colleagues at Bangalore Baptist Hospital and the dignitaries of BSOG and the delegates who are joining online, I bring warm greetings on behalf of Bangalore Baptist Hospital. As you are spending this whole day on this important topic, obstetric hemorrhage, it is my desire that you be more knowledgeable and have deeper understanding of this topic. And it is my prayer that you become more wiser at the end of the day, translating the benefits so that the maternal mortality will be decreased. And I congratulate Dr. Shiny, heading the Department of OBG and also BSOG, the president of BSOG, Dr. Padmini Prasad, and all the other people who have joined in for this important webinar. I pray this will be a huge success and God bless. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's our fifth anniversary here, here at Bangalore Baptist Hospital. And we as a department have this on our calendar of events to conduct an annual CME beginning this year. We wanted to actually have it as a, a CME with interaction of both teachers and students. However, but the COVID third wave brought us down to conducting a webinar. Nevertheless, I think it really doesn't matter where we start from. What matters is where we're really heading. And we're so glad to make the start. The topic of obstetric hemorrhage, I'm sure is something that will benefit all of us, whether it's students or full-fledged practicing gynecologists and obstetricians. And we thank all our speakers, chairpersons, and other faculty of BSOG who have taken time out on a Sunday to be with us and enrich us with their knowledge and experience. And I'm sure this webinar would be of use to all, uh, all of us and even students who are present on this webinar. A special thanks to Lakshmi Sheshadri ma'am and Paili sir. And I'm sure everybody who has logged in is looking forward to an interaction with you all. I thank uh, Dr. Rajneesh especially who has worked very hard and a special mention also to Dr. Satyavani who have really worked very hard to bring this webinar to actually be on today. I thank Dr. Parmini Prasad also for helping us conduct with conduct this webinar, and I now request Dr. Padmini to please say a few words. Dr. Padmini. Dr. Padmini. Yes, it was not allowing me to unmute. Sorry for that. Namaskara. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be with you all today for a great webinar on obstetric hemorrhage, which is a nightmare for every obstetrician. I thank Baptist Hospital and all the uh, Dr. Shiny Vargis and others who have really taken so much pains from a very long period. They wanted to conduct uh, a physical meeting. We were all looking forward to it, to meet you all in Baptist Hospital. But unfortunately, due to the prevailing COVID situation, we are uh, unable to do that. But at least uh, we could have a webinar where we could meet you all. 
and we should thank god for this uh, opportunity thank you very much for arranging this and to enlighten most of us and uh, even after repeatedly knowing or listening to so many aspects of it still when you are with a patient you are still perplexed and confused and also panic so all that can be removed with a take home good take home messages practical messages thank you all for arranging such a great uh, webinar thank you very much once again i wish this webinar all the success thank you thank you ma'am i now i now request dr rajesh to introduce and formally welcome our chief guest dr lakshmi sheshadri ma'am good morning everyone focus ma'am focus ma'am on on behalf of bangalore baptist hospital and the department of obstetrics and gynecology of bangalore baptist hospital it's my honor and my privilege to welcome our chief guest for this webinar dr lakshmi sheshadri ma'am who is a former professor and head of the department of department of obgyn cnc velo currently she is a senior consultant in tirumalai mission hospital ranipet velo ma'am as we all know her has more than 50 uh, publication in index journals and many many chapters in many textbooks she has authored uh, three prime textbooks essentials of gynecology essentials of obstetrics and is a co editor of practical guide to obstetrics these books are not only found in every corner of the country but have gone abroad and many many pg post graduates and undergraduates benefit from these books ma'am's special interest is in gynae oncology and menopausal medicine she is currently working at the community level by screening uh, for in programs involved in screening for cervical cancer with visual uh, visual uh, visualization with ascorbic acid and with ma management of obesity and complications and screening for post menopausal osteoporosis ma'am on behalf of uh, Bang bangalore baptist hospital and bsog uh, we welcome you and we are very thankful to you for uh, consenting to be our chief guest once again we welcome and i'd like to request you to say a few words thanks rajnish um a very good sunday morning to all of you and uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me to be part of your uh, program uh, we all know that this uh, covid pandemic has had uh, quite a devastating effect uh, globally in terms of uh, loss of lives as well as um, um eco economic uh, crisis everywhere but i think the one good thing that has come out of it is this uh, and this digital transformation as we call it i think because of which i think all of us have come much closer and it has paved the way for a more newer form of human interaction and human connection and i this virtual platform has made it possible for all of us from different parts of the parts of india if not the globe to actually come together despite the uh, pandemic and there are these continuing medical education sessions going on almost every day and therefore we can pick and choose and be part of any one of these that interests us more and more students i think more number of students actually are able to benefit from this Uh, than um, you know, or compared to the uh, in-person meetings where people had to travel uh, from their uh, place of work. Moving on, moving on to today's topic, which is obstetric hemorrhage, uh, which is being recognized definitely as one of the most important indices of um, um, healthcare system globally of, in any country, and uh, WHO and all the countries have been. working towards reducing this uh, mortality uh, and uh, <clears throat> achieving the sustainable development goals as far as the maternal mortality rate is con is uh, concerned and you can see that many of the southern southern states have actually there are actually there and uh, kerala with their especially with their government and private partnership their regular mortality audits 
confidential inquiry into maternal deaths which is spearheaded by none other than Professor Piley, which is part of this gathering and which is, who is one of the faculty uh, today. Their improved healthcare system, their healthcare delivery, their policies have actually achieved a maternal mortality rate of 28. And I think the entire state has to be congratulated for this. The, they have just, Dr. Piley and team have just published the latest edition of the of uh, why mothers uh, die. D uh, Dr. Piley, uh, uh, may salute and congratulations to your team. However, we have to acknowledge that hemorrhage still remains to be one of the leading causes, especially postpartum hemorrhage. He continues to be one of the major causes of mortality. And of course, steps have been taken by the private and the government institution by way of uh, introducing the active management of third stage, the oxytocin, new and uh, old and tranexamic acid, novel suction and um, you know, uh, cannulae, various clams. But of course, we, the, the uh, problem continues. And we are globally paying the price for the increasing cesarean section rates. Uh, which has now uh, returned to us in the form of a new complication, which is the adherent placenta or the placenta accreta system. And of course, now will soon be one of the major causes of mortality uh, due to hemorrhage as well. And uh, therefore, now we have uh, today uh, the stalwarts in the, in the uh, field whose chosen area of work is uh, obstetric hemorrhage and uh, they will share their practical wisdom with all of us and i am as eager as all of you to listen to the deliberations today thank you bangalore baptist hospital rajneesh especially dr padmini prasad the bangalore society of obs and gyne for having me here and i wish you all the best for the program thank you again thank you ma'am I would like to now uh, request Dr. Shaini to take over uh, for the next session. Yeah, so now we'll begin with the session one and uh, we'll begin with uh, uh, introduction of our chairpersons who are chairing this session. And uh, our first chairperson is Dr. Padmini Isaac. Ma'am is was the former uh, head and uh, head of the uh, head of the department at St. Martha's Hospital, Bangalore. She's and presently, she's a senior visiting consultant at St. Martha's and also clinical director, OBG Cloud9 Group of Hospitals. She was also the past secretary, treasurer and president of BSOG. She's a member of Indian Perinatology Society and former secretary, treasurer, treasurer and president of St. Martha's Clinical Society. Welcome, ma'am, to chair the session. Our next chairperson, is Dr. Nagaratnamma, who is who all of us know was our also our past president at BSOG. She was a uh, former pro professor and HOD of OBG at Raja Rajeshwari Medical College and Hospital Bangalore. And uh, she has done a lot of work uh, while she was in her post as president. She has had several appreciation awards to her credit. She was chairperson of AICOG 2019, convener of Uduro Gaini workshop at AICOG 2019. And her special area of interest is urogynecological surgeries, high risk pregnancy, infertility, and gynecology. Welcome, ma'am, to this session. Thank you for that kind introduction. I am uh, very pleased to be associated with one of the leading problems in obstetrics even today. It is so important uh, to learn how to deal with it and we are very happy to have Dr. Piley who has taught all of us so many ways, both surgically and medically, to deal with the problem. Welcome, sir. And thank you, Bangalore Baptist Hospital and Dr. Rajneesh in particular for his efforts at uh, coordinating and getting this meeting together. Uh, 
Am I to start? Uh, yes, sir. You can please you. go ahead with your uh, talk, sir. Thank Everyone's waiting to hear from. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Baptist you. Hospital as well as Bangalore Society for this honor to share our experience in auditing maternal deaths in Kerala with particular reference to hemorrhage as a cause of maternal death. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Padmini Isaac, uh, Dr. Shaini, Dr. Nagaratnama, my friend, um, Lakshmi, Renjini, and all of you for this opportunity. Can I share my slide now, please? Sure, sure, sir. <clears throat> no. I thought of sharing our experience in managing hemorrhage, uh, which evolved as a result of the observations in the confidential review of maternal death, which was already alluded to by Lakshmi. And as she already mentioned to you, we really feel very satisfied that we could achieve an MMR of 28 by the year 2020. Our target was at least to achieve 30, and we could uh, do it to the extent of making it 28. But still, we are concerned that maternal death due to hemorrhage, which is really a cause which we should be able to address in a much better way, is still unacceptably high. And all the experience are, as Lakshmi already told you, described there in this book, Why Mothers Die, compiling the experience from 2010 to 2020, the audit report, and there is a long chapter on hemorrhage and the way we have been addressing the problems of hemorrhage. But still, we are concerned that hemorrhage is the leading cause. As you can see here, in 1920, we had 16%. Previously, it was 17%, 17%, 16% like that, almost remaining static. And uh, even up to the latest, that is still December of 2021, out of 184 maternal deaths, of which 93 were COVID related. And even in the remaining causes, if you look at it, we can see that 17 were due to PPH and APH. The previous year, 2021, out of 105 deaths, only nine were due to COVID, but 19 were due to hemorrhage. So this is what makes us concerned. And uh, the types of hemorrhage that was leading to this was, of course, a tonic was the leading cause. Abruptive placenta and traumatic were there. And thankfully, placenta accreta spectrum was there, but not a major component as we could have methods to tackle it. That has moved from being a cause of death to the cause of morbidity in our state now. Our observations on the base of CRMD, the most important point that came out in our analysis was the failure or inability to arrest the bleeding as soon as it is noticed. So we thought a paradigm shift is required in our approach to PPH. No more relevant are the acronyms we talk about, uh, hemostasis, hemorrhage, uh, uh, the four Ts, five Ts and all that. A paradigm shift is required in our approach. Time is the most important parameter. We should not anymore talk about the golden two hours or one hour and all that. We have only a few minutes. A patient can collapse in a few minutes. And so we thought about these possibilities. We have to think about, again, how to prevent PPH from happening. If it happens, how to arrest it immediately. And we should assess the blood loss objectively rather than just estimate, visual estimate and all that. And I think we have to have new thoughts on the established practices 
the various hemorrhage arresting methods, and again, a new concept about how to manage present day accreditor spectra. So in the few minutes given to me, I thought I will take you through our present concept. We have developed a new protocol for management, which will encompass all these things. As soon as vaginal delivery is expected, of course, we put an absorbent mat under the buttocks. Fetal delivery, immediately do the active management of third stage of labor, both in cesarean as well as in vaginal delivery. If in vaginal delivery at that stage, excess bleeding is noticed, most likely it is due to trauma because the placenta is still inside. But then we go on to do the placenta delivery and if there is excess bleeding noted, no question of measuring it, but if you feel there is more blood than we expect, take it as an atonic PPH and immediately the person on the spot puts the hand in and does bimanual compression. And initiate two steps. One, ask for additional oxytocic agents and two, ask for a transvaginal uterine artery clamp or a suction cannula. If with the drug before the clamps could be applied, there's bleeding stops, that's it, no more clamp. But if the bleeding continues, either the clamp or the suction cannula or both is put in. And if there is no hemostasis, in spite of that, we may then think about reapplying the clamp. Is it in the correct position? And if on reapplication bleeding stops, she goes for observation. But if the bleeding doesn't stop, then only we go to second line, other things like content damnard, bacteria bilirubin. This is something which we seldom resort to now. And if still there is bleeding, then only take her to theater. I can very happily say, tell you that in the last five years, since we started to use the clamp and the cannula, there was no occasion to take a patient from the labor room to theater to arrest the bleeding by a laparotomy. So that's the important thing. And now, if the bleeding doesn't stop with that, with the clamp, and when it is reapplied, if it stops, then we allow the clamp to stay there or the suction cannula to stay there, clamp for about 20 or 30 minutes, suction cannula longer, and the patient can be then shifted to the fourth stage of labor. So this is the flow chart. And the every laboring woman, whatever WHO says, every labor woman, laboring woman should have an IV line or at least a cannula in position. And in every case of vaginal delivery, as well as cesarean, we should follow active management of third stage of labor. What does it mean? Active management of third stage of labor is everybody's guess. Everybody has their own ideas. So we said for the state of Kerala, active management of third stage of labor means five units of oxytocin diluted to five ml, given IV slowly taking five seconds. At the delivery of the anterior shoulder, or within one minute if the baby comes out too fast. Additionally, give 10 units of oxytocin IM. And most of our patients will receive another 20 units put in 500 ml, which will run for the next two hours. This is the prevention. This is active management the third stage of labor. In spite of that, if there is bleeding, that is the steps which I told you earlier. But along with that, active management of third stage also includes delayed cord clamping, usually after about a minute, if the baby is not flush. Now, placental delivery, we do not wait for the signs of separation of placenta. Once the baby is separated after about a minute, altogether there may be one or two minutes already over, palpate the uterus, suprapubically, if it is a contracted uterus, well there, push it upwards and pull on the cord and complete the delivery. In about 90% of cases, placenta will be ready to come out. If it is not budging, leave it. So that is the active management of third stage of labor for us. As I told you in the flow chart, bimanual compression, everybody, whoever is conducting, nurse or doctor should apply that. And then ask for the drugs as well as the clamp. The drugs, any or all of the, all of the following will be considering, depending on the contraindication and all that, methogen, F2-alpha, transamic acid, and misoprostol. Not so much of misoprostol because we are not all that happy with misoprostol. And if it will be used, it may be maximum 600 microgram, not 800 or 1000. 
Tannosamic acid, if there is ongoing bleeding, we may give it IV, but it takes a little while to act. And one of these will be immediately going in. And then, as I told you, either go for the clam or the cannula. In the clam, this is the clam which we divide. It's not a very complicated one. This is actually a sponge holder. Only thing is, it is bent at right angles over here. It has got a gap between the two arms of that. And that gap is about a centimeter, which will accommodate the service. I will show you how to apply it. It's a longer one for the postpartum vagina is deep. And uh, the, this is how it is. And you can see when it is applied, one of the blades will come on the side to the lateral fornis and above that to occlude the artery where it joins the side of the uterus. And the other blade is actually inside the cervical canal so that you can grab the vessel properly with that part, the tip, the vertical part of the clamp. That's the principle of it. This is the set which has to be allowed. What we do is we take these separately and these, there may be one more sponge holder, the retractors and the sponge holder together as one pack so that this can be used as a cervical inspection set. And um, this is how, uh, just to show you how we use it. See, imagine that yellow frill is the vagina. So retract the vagina, catch hold of the anterior lip of the cervix with a sponge holder, Catch hold of the posterior lip also with a sponge holder. Pull it down and the assistant at the head end, if there is one, should push the fundus of the uterus down to make it more accessible. Open the transvaginal uterinary clamp. One blade going into the cervical canal, the other going lateral to the, to the lateral fornix. Once you have reached the lateral fornix, gently push up another centimeter and a half and then you clamp it so that you will be reaching the isthmus of the cervix of the uterus where the vessel is reaching. So that's the way to apply it. And in a live case, if you have to see it, so as you can see, the anterior lip of the cervix is held, retractor holding the posterior vaginal wall away. Posterior lip of the cervix is also held. Clamp is taken, open clamp is going into the cervical canal as was shown in the model. The vaginal wall can be retracted with the third retractor if you have an assistant to do that. Once you clamp it, once you reach the lateral fornix, what is important is push up the lateral fornix. The soft immediate postpartum vagina and cervix will yield so that you can push it up another centimeter and a half so that the blade reaches the level where the uterine artery joins the side of the uterus. So that's the principle of this clamp. You can do it on the opposite side and then leave it like that. While the clamp is on, you can go on suturing your episiotomy and all that. So that is the um, way we would recommend to use it. The cannula, which was actually originally brought to our state by Dr. Samartha Ram from Palakkad, and later, Dr. Panikir, another colleague of ours in the state, both of them work together and they both have their own slightly modified the cannula. But the suction cannula is a very simple instrument like that. As we can see here, that is a blunt tipped metal cannula with holes on the sides all around with the proximal end to which a plastic tube, which can be connected to the suction machine is attached. This is the one modified by Panikir. This is the original by uh, Samartha Ram. Samartha Ram had different designs, but I have suggested that he should not use any of the earlier models where it is very broad, slides, side slits and all that, but just a candle like this with uh, holes on the sides. These holes should be limited to the uterine cavity or up to the lower segment only, not to the vagina. If it there in the vagina, the negative pressure that you create will not be applied onto the uterus. So this is um, uh, again a video kindly supplied by uh, Dr. Samartha Ram. Uh, in this particular patient, you can see the blood is dripping in. So he retracts the posterior vaginal wall 
and then catches the anti liposuction which puts the cannula in and then connect the suction tube put it on and you can see the initial collected blood will come and um, come to the bottle and thereafter the tube is collapsed and no more bleeding and the uterus you can feel is hard so that is what he is suggesting uh, during cesarean also he suggests that we can apply it uh, to remove the cannula what he is suggesting is that we can just keep on putting your finger on the side and then rotating it releasing it from the side where the decida would have got sucked in or you can push in some saline with the cannula and all that what i would suggest is this is a case where actually we applied the cannula in a patient who started to bleed about 2 hours after cesarean and we applied the cannula and the cannula can be just twisted twisted keep on twisting it and it will come out gently so for a post cesarean case this cannula is an exemplary good instrument to stop the bleeding from if it's an atonic uterus that is causing the bleeding i don't know whether if it is a angle bleed it will stop it very unlikely but for an atonic post cesarean bleeding this will be a very good method to stop the bleeding pph during cesarean also has to be addressed and we have developed an abdominal counterpart of the transvaginal uterine artery clamp so we call this trans abdominal uterine artery clamp and the way to apply it is if it's a model one blade going into the lower segment the other on the outside let it go and then clamp the vessels you don't have to push the bladder down even if the ureter is there doesn't matter because that be cushioned by the rest of the tissues no damage but what is important is if there is an angle extending down you clamp that area so they can stop the bleeding immediately and then with a clear field mop up and find out where the bleeder is and then take care of that so that is what we would suggest for um, abdominal bleeding during a cesarean section and this is a case where we are just demonstrating how to apply it one blade inside the cervical into the lower segment the other outside the bladder is there if it is gone down fine even otherwise you can stop the bleeding by applying it and then you suture it this is the cesarean uh, wound this is the extension which was causing the bleeding so then as lakshmi already said the price we are paying for the high c section rate is the larger number of placenta accreta spectra and that killed about 5 6 patients every year in the major hospitals in our state so that is why we started to work on that we developed to tack uh, methods to tackle the bleeding during placenta accreta spectrum and that is the result of that was the iota or the common iliac artery clamp that we developed very simple clamp like this and very cheap also but it is important that it has got a guard at the tip and even when it is closed the blades will not come together there will be a gap about 2 mm there that is the tip and even when it is closed there is this gap between that is very important so that it doesn't traumatize the walls of the aorta and ratchet also a longer ratchet and this is a, just a video clip as to how we apply it the bowels are pushed away um, and then on the posterior abdominal wall over the lumbar vertebrae you can identify that's a common iliac artery of the right side common iliac of the left and above the bifurcation you can feel the or see the aorta this one you can see but in an obese patient you may not be able to see like this even with the fat and para aortic tissue around it soft tissue around it you can pull it up with a babcock gently lift it up a few millimeters with a babcock and then apply the aorta clamp either below or above depending on the space that you have apply it take the full thickness of the aorta within the blades that's important and then remove it palpate whether the pulsation in the common iliac artery has disappeared if not the application is not correct so this is how we uh, apply the iota clamp and i will just demonstrate in the available few minutes 
how we how we do a placenta accreta spectrum this we put uterine catheters when we know that it is an percreta vertical abdominal incision but now we are trying to see whether we can manage many of the cases through a transverse abdominal incision after looking through edwin chandraharan's work put a vertical incision on the fundus away from the placenta deliver the baby and in this particular case don't leave the plus element don't disturb the placenta we can put green amitage on the uterine edges antivert and esterize the uterus then here we are applying the same clamp as you saw for the iota being applied on the common iliac artery this was the way we were doing earlier until our colleagues at cotem pointed out to us that it is better to apply it on the iota and we switched over to that so common iliac artery but you have to apply on both sides and uh, here we are taking care of the ovarian supply to the uterus but that's not required anymore we can put clamps if you are planning to do a hysterectomy but if you are planning to do conservative surgery then you need to put that tunica over there and then this is the important part having got the upper pedicle separated then we come to dissect you can see the exterior the placenta which has come out of the uterus take that peritoneum on the surface of it and separate it without disturbing this coagulum which is on the surface of the percreta placenta and below that level there will be the bladder keep it down with a doens and put clamps on both sides till you have reached the level just below the placenta don't try to take the entire cervix that's the point you can leave the intact cervix there only thing is take the placenta that part where the placenta lower end of the placenta so it is a sub total hysterectomy most of the time unless the woman was in labor and the cervix is effaced and as we can see this is the exterior the placenta which had come out you inspect the stumps well do double ligation if you required leave a drain in the peritoneal cavity and come out so that is how we tackle placenta accreta spectrum these days um assessing blood loss we should have an objective way of assessing blood loss rather than basic inspection and for that we use observant mat which can be placed under the buttocks it is taken out at the end and weighed and taking 1 gram equal to 1 ml of blood loss we convert and identify how much is the blood loss at the end of the surgery or the delivery the concept of the fourth stage has to be emphasized 2 hours after delivery of the placenta half hourly observation not just pulse and bp but the nurse should check whether the uterus is palpable contracted uterus is palpable above the uterus symphysis and is there excess bleeding when the uterus is pressed down so remove move the clothes see between the thighs that there is no excess bleeding this is the observation for 2 hours after that if everything is okay we can ship the patient home so in conclusion friends what i would suggest is a new approach to management of pph is essential time is, is the maximum of maximum importance arrest bleeding immediately and placenta accreta spectrum use the iota clamp just before we started sushila was asking me about the availability of uh, interventional radiology and iotic balloon and all. we have it but we don't like to use it first of all it is so much more expensive you need a hybrid operation theater to do it and the complications of vascular access are there and not only that you are blocking the lumbar arteries over a length of about 4 cm or 5 cm when you have the aortic balloon and in spite of all that why should we go for all that just put a clamp and then do the aort the accreta spectrum like that that is our recommendation and we have now very rarely do all those things like the uterine like the stepwise devascularization internal iliac ligation and all that internal iliac ligation is still there if there is a traumatic pph sometimes we may need it but for an atonic very rarely and obstetric hysterectomy as a result of atonic pph again becoming a rarity but we do still a lot of obstetric hysterectomy for the placenta accreta spectrum which also we are on the process of trying to see whether we can reduce the number of hysterectomy rather do conservative surgery friends so this is our experience thank you very much for this opportunity to share our experience with you over to you
in terms of knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Paili. As always, it's uh, instructive and educative listening to you with your vast experience. Also, I wonder that you have uh, the amount of placenta accretion that you have. Have you found any relationship between the increase of incidence of endometriosis in Kerala and uh, placenta accreta? Thank you, Dr. Padmini, for that. Uh, we are not very proud that uh, we lead in endometriosis as well. We have quite a, uh, and it is true, wherever there is abnormal anatomy there, which includes abnormal blood supply to the lower segment, the chance of a posterior placenta leading to the accreta placenta is also higher. And the problem is, in that case, our iota clump may not work as well as we require it because more blood will reach from the posterior pelvic wall, which may anastomose with the lumbar vessels from a higher level. So the cascade of vessels in the posterior abdominal wall in the pelvic wall will be supplying the uterus more through the uterosacral, and that will be more difficult to tackle. In fact, it is anterior placenta, which has come out of the uterus as per creta, adherent to the bladder is a nightmare because the bladder dissection is a problem. But posterior placenta, which is adherent there as well as coming to the scar and becoming per creta is a worse problem because they may draw more blood to the posterior wall and the iota clamp also may not stop it completely. So we have found that a centralis placenta is more of a problem rather than anterior placenta, which is per creta. Anyway, what your question is very true. Um, endometriosis also contributes the problems and increases probably the risk of accreta. But I should admit that it is the previous scar on the uterus, especially the cesarean scar, that is lower segment cesarean scar. That is our concern. Because once it comes out, it then immediately gets onto the bladder. That's the problem. And one more thing, Dr. Pairi, when you have this third stage bleeding beside atonic, it's a good practice to uh, immediately after the delivery of placenta to be sure that you evacuate the clots that are collected in the uterus because the clots in the uterus itself can cause atonic. Very true, very true. We have to and so if we yeah. make sure by doing a vaginal examination and emptying those clots, we can prevent quite a bit of atonic BPH. Hopefully for the, uh, if the protocol was followed, as soon as excess bleeding was noticed, if you could do the bimanual compression, that will reduce the chance of that clot filling the cavity. And immediately we take two machines to stop the blood supply to the uterus. So that is a recommendation. But in reality, of course, as you said, if you have any more time, there can be blood clots inside and that also can contribute to atonicity. Very true. Thank you. There are some questions in the chat box which I may probably answer um, because I know the constraints of time that you are working at. I mean, I'm quite happy to stay on, but I think uh, the allotted time is over. That is why I thought. Yeah. You are muted, madam. Dr. Padmini, I said you are muted. Yeah. Dr. Padmini is muted. Perhaps central control room can unmute Dr. Padmini Isaac. No, you are still muted, madam. I think you can take one or two questions, Dr. Pairi, or such an authority yes, that sure. you yeah, be I am quite happy to do. Yeah, let us entertain two questions at least of your choice. Oh, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I will go up from the latest. Actually, uh, neovascularization with the previous analysis is responsible for all the excess bleeding and abnormal vessels, very true. Adenomyosis is a risk factor for PAS disorder. Yes, as Madam Patmini said, adenomyosis as well as uh, endometriosis can contribute to it. Um, often bleeding from vesicle space is too dangerous to control. That is true. That is why internal iliac artery ligation alone will not work uh, because the vaginal vessels may anastomose with the posterior pelvic wall as well. And internal iliac artery ligation may help to some extent, but not completely. Uh, 
TUVAC seems to be simple and promising. Thank you, sir, for your innovation. Is there a need for clamp or tunicate, which are easy to put and remove? We have done with common iliac artery. Uh, I don't know exactly what uh, Mrityunjaya meant, uh, but I feel that uh, a clamp to include the common iliac artery or the aorta helps a lot in controlling the bleeding. Um, uh, can I you... say uh, something, Dr. Piley, sir? Oh, sure. Yes, please. Yeah. Actually, uh, we try initially we tried to do with the clamps, uh, but I find mm -hmm. that uh, tourniquet is much better and even removal is much easier. Uh, I mean, you may be, you are more experienced with clamp probably, but uh, tourniquet does help and you can go easily without uh, uh, much damage also with that. You can because you are already lifted up, so it easily passes below. So this is what we felt. You are talking about tourniquet for the common iliac artery or the iota? Yeah, yeah, common iliac artery. Yeah, common iliac artery tunica, but I find that, um, you know, passing that underneath that, uh, all this, if you pull up with a babcock and apply it, probably you don't have to take away the areola tissue, which is enclosing that vessel that much. And that is why we thought that clamp is quicker and easier. But of course, if you have a tunica, make sure that we don't damage it much. Uh, that is the only thing I would suggest, yeah. Uh, we use infant feeding tube, uh, sir. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We can, we yeah. can. But I thought a clamp may be much faster and uh, yeah. probably safer the way we have designed it. There is another question here. You need good vacuum pressure, which is offered by the multiple holes in SR cannula and helps in opposition of anterior and posterior wall. True. And the suction force that we require is every labor room, we have the vacuum extractor. And the vacuum extractor suction is good enough. Or if you have separate floor suction, or wall suction, any of them can be used for that. Can we not have plastic cannula? Feels less traumatic. Very true. Actually, um, Hofmeyer has plans to make um, other types of cannula rather than this metal. But the advantage of the metal is the durability. You buy it, it goes with you to the grave. But the plastic and other things, how long will it stay? One thing. Second thing, you can just boil it. You know, this one. Every center may not have the facilities to do autoclaving and all that. You can just boil it. From that angle, I would think about the metal cannula as an advantage. But of course, plastic cannula with uh, sufficiently molded plastic and uh, with uh, uh, pr pressure on the wall so that it doesn't collapse on the suction. That would be certainly a good option. We have been working on that idea, but I didn't want to come as a competitor to my friend uh, Samal Saram and uh, Panikir, so we, I am not working on that, but I think Hofmeyer will come out with something very simple. Uh, actually, Johnson & Johnson Dr. also Pani, has, sir. Yeah. I just wondered why you are not so much in favor of misoprostol. No, the problem, I, I'm not against misoprostol, but in an acute bleeding situation, it doesn't work fast enough. Second thing, not like more than 600 microgram anyway, because you see the number of people who start to have shivering, the number of people who are purging, diarrhea, all these things are more with misoprostol. So that is why I am not against misoprostol. We use whatever is possible, but not against it, but not all that commonly used in our neighborhood, that's all. I thought prophylactically it's a very good uh, Yeah, if you have to, when you leave the patient to the wards, I would say 400 or 600 microgram will be a good idea. But this is there. About 20 to 30 percent of them will start shivering and um, Sometimes your pulse oximeter will not work well, and then you are in trouble. That is the only thing. Uh, that is certainly a prophylactically a uh, good choice, yes. Sir, uh, for carbitocin, you are experiencing I haven't, I haven't, I haven't started using it, carbitocin. Um, was there any case of with ureter damage in your patients? Yes, there was one case where actually what happened was we were doing the ureteric cannulation, catheterization, and uh, you know the guide wire should advance before the cannula, before the catheter. Yeah. Unfortunately, in that particular case, the catheter was pushed in and it pierced through the wall of the ureter. That was the only thing. It is not due to damage with the clamp, but while, they, while we are trying to put it. What is the risk of clamping ureter with TUVAC? That is what I wanted to emphasize. Thank you for that question. There is no worry about ureter being included. 
because you are cushioned with the surrounding tissues. You see, during hysterectomies and all that, occasionally people tie up the ureter, and later when you take the when the ligature out, kidneys start to pour out the urine. So for half an hour, one hour, even if you have blocked the ureter, really doesn't matter as long as you don't traumatize the wall of the ureter. But if both the ureters are clamped, then urine will not come into the bladder. So there is no urine in the bladder. Don't go searching for the reason for anuria. That is the only thing. Uh, so that is what I would suggest. Do you see carbitocin in Kerala? If so, what is your experience? Can it replace ocytocin in AMTSL? It might, Sushila. I don't have it. I haven't started to use it. My concern is the um, total expense, and uh, but it may work. It may come up. I am sure. I am not against it. Please start using hundred micro um, uh, in AMTSL to avoid IV. It avoids IV infusion of ocytocin and longer duration of action. I am regularly using Bellard. Fine, Bellard. Uh, no doubt about yeah. it. The only thing is, uh, it has to be used IV. Do you no, 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 sir. There is there is a two act modes of action. If you use IV, the duration of action is lesser, and it has got a lipophilic uh, mechanism. So there are dual mechanisms which work with IM. That's why it has got much longer compared to IV. And number two, sir, uh, this uh, is at the public sector is on par with uh, uh, oxytocin rate. Only for private, they have been manufacturing authority has been given to some companies. Otherwise, uh, the company which is originally manufacturing this heat stable is only providing to the public sector at the cost on par with oxytocin, that is 27 rupees. That's what has been claimed. Dr. Bella, thank, thank you. you for hearing you. Long time thank since you. Yes. Uh, good morning, Dr. Uh, Pelle. I am also using, like, where I have started using carbitocin as a active management of third stage of labor, it's initially in cesarean and then vaginal. It is a real wonder drug. It is very, very short time for the placental separation, no further oxytocin, no further IV infusion. So, a lot of nursing thing is also has gone, especially in high risk, like severe PIH or anemia, when we don't want to give the continuous oxytocin. So um, I, I'm very like it is very good drug carbitocin and not that cost it is around 370 rupees so oxytocin IV fluid like it in total it is quite cost effective as well even at 370 to 400 rupees so this is uh, my input. Yeah, Dr. Sadhana, I fully agree with you. My only concern is anything given IM takes longer time than anything given IV. And in the case of active management of third stage of labor, five units of IV oxytocin going in will work faster than uh, the anything given IM. That is my that is why I, my objection to IM. Sir, uh, of ten units IM. It sir, uh, um, uh, sir, I would uh, like to say here whether you give intravenous or whether you give intramuscular, carbitocin surpasses oxytocin in its uh, efficiency in its safety profile and in all ways. We have yes. found it to be very effective. Even when it is given intramuscular, the duration of action is for two hours. The ac action starts also fairly quickly, sir. It's not as if it takes a long time to start the acting. Onset of action is the question. That is my only concern when, because initially they were recommending only IEM. But now I see that the literature can be given IV. That case, fine. And uh, my other concern is I don't want to get into argument on these things. I am not against carbitocin. Yeah. I am not okay. against it. Only thing is, we haven't bought it. I haven't started to use it. There are other political reasons behind it. But please remember only one thing. 70% of obstetric care in Kerala is in the private. If the company is so magnanimous, I would request them to make it cheaper for public hospitals as well as private hospitals. Giving it only to the public hospitals and at the lower rate, and then to the private, I think was a bit, you know, suspicious. That's the only thing I have. They should make it cheaper for the public hospital also, private hospitals as well. Then we would have easily. Anyway, I don't sir, want to go into sir, 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 that is what the WHO argued when the trial started here in Belgium and India. We did multi center, and they only came out with public sector. They will provide with on par rate with oxytocin. Whereas, and that they have kept with that manufacturing, sir. It is available as ampule, whereas it is available in private sector as a vial. So, just to make it different, that 
that's it otherwise effectiveness drug storage manufacturing other things are same that's what i wanted to convey that thank you dr bellar please persuade them to make it a little more easily available to the public sector also because in kerala 70% is private and this private doesn't mean they are all wealthy people they only need to go to this small private hospital so the company if they want to make more money the take up will be more we make it cheaper so the business we, we had lot of argument and discussion on this sir thank you for your points dr gamit then okay okay if it is say that we can say na at if the asha is there or ramni is there then we can like have some key points about that Okay. I think uh, we should go ahead with the. Yeah, I think we are already. I think the better. Actually, uh, I have logged into that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, sir, for that uh, very inspiring talk and educative videos, also which we could also learn from. And uh, now we go on to our next speaker. I don't know. And I request uh, Dr. Nagar Nagaratna to yeah. please introduce. Yeah, I am. I am speaker. there, uh, sir. I will introduce Dr. Sheila Mane. Let mm -hmm. me introduce. I am Dr. Nagratna. I have joined. So let me introduce Dr. Sheila Mane. Can I have the slide, please? Yes. Next. Yeah. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sheila. Sheila Mane, who is uh, Uh, known as a PPH lady, and all of you know how many uh, workshops she's been organizing and uh, going across the country to um, uh, educate, uh, to create an awareness on uh, PPH management. She is uh, a prof um, uh, DNB teacher and also uh, ex professor and HOD at uh, um, B R Ambedkar Medical College and also senior consultant at Anugraha Nursing Home, Bangalore. Uh, she has served foxy in the capacity as uh, she was vice president in 2014 and also she is a chairperson of safe motherhood committee foxy uh, between 2008 and 11 she is also national coordinator for pph workshop uh, she was uh, at present she is an icog uh, governing council member and also she is uh, she was the organizing secretary of our uh, bengaluru icog 2019 20 and she is a faculty at figo simulation uh, workshop correspondent editor for uh, jogi and she has also received uh, during her uh, uh, president as uh, bsog the uh, dk tank uh, trophy uh, for uh, best community services where I, even i was also uh, a, a member that time so and also she is the lead accessor for manyata laksha and uh, here i present dr sheela mane for her talk on postpartum collapse thank you am i audible yeah i think uh, that uh, audio is little um... uh, you are clear yeah oh, thank you thank you uh, so i would like to thank uh, Dr. Shaini, Dr. Rajneesh, and uh, BSOG for giving me this opportunity. And uh, uh, it's uh, nice to be a part of this. I think after uh, listening to Dr. Paili again, it was a learning session. As all of us, we know that uh, Kerala is always ahead, and uh, I think uh, it's a pride uh, that uh, they have already attained the Sustainable Development Goal, and their maternal mortality is only 28. so hearty congratulations for that and i think uh, we have to really learn lessons from kerala all over the country thank you let me proceed with my presentation now that is postpartum maternal collapse so postpartum maternal collapse is a catastrophic event which directly contributes to maternal death now the exact data on maternal collapse is limited and it's an acute event involving the cardio respiratory system and or brain causing reduced or absent conscious level at any point during pregnancy and up to 6 weeks of postpartum so all of us we know that the causes are mainly there are many which are uh, during pregnancy also and which can lead to the postpartum collapse now the predisposing risk factors are severe anemia severe hypertensive disorders of pregnancy coagulation abnormalities sepsis prolonged labor previous cesarean section morbidly aggregate placenta 
poor socioeconomic status and there could be pre existing medical or surgical disorders chronic hypertension diabetes mellitus cardiac disease epilepsy chronic liver or even renal disease now the causes of maternal collapse if we look at the obstetric causes like hemorrhage which is again common postpartum hemorrhage placental absorption bleeding placenta previa uh, that is i mean during pregnancy and which again uh, once the patient delivers can lead to postpartum collapse uterine rupture ectopic pregnancy splenic artery rupture and hepatic rupture non hemorrhagic are sepsis eclampsia acute uterine infarction could be combined with hemorrhage again amniotic fluid embolism pulmonary thromboembolism air embolism and medelson syndrome now there are non obstetric causes also neurological like intracranial hemorrhage epilepsy subarachnoid hemorrhage central venous sinus thrombosis cardiac myocardial infarction cardiac arrhythmias infective endocarditis cardiomyopathies we have seen now most of the time these cardiomyopathies are not diagnosed in time and most of the time we have seen patient collapsing aortic dissection in large vessel pulmonary thromboembolism tension pneumothorax status asthmaticus metabolic hypoglycemia electrolyte imbalance anaphylaxis anaphylactic shock and drug toxicity like uh, magnesium sulfate and local anesthetic now there are reversible causes okay 4h hypovolemia hypoxia hypokalemia hyperkalemia and hypothermia these are the reversible causes and uh, others are thromboembolism four t's are toxicity thromboembolism tension pneumothorax and tamponade now there are uh, non hemorrhagic causes so if we look from the top to bottom eclampsia intracranial hemorrhage uh, anaphylaxis pulmonary embolism amniotic fluid embolism drugs maxal local anesthetics or illicit drugs hemorrhage i think i already enumerated all this again uh, uh, in uh, liver connected hypoglycemia and cardiac causes like arrhythmias myocardial infarction cardiomyopathy and sepsis now during pregnancy there are many organs which uh, they undergo significant physiological changes and these alterations also hamper the uh, resuscitation that is cardiopulmonary resuscitation so what happens during pregnancy there is aortic valve compression which significantly reduces the cardiac output from 20 weeks of gestation onward and the efficacy of chest compression during resuscitation that is if the patient has not yet delivered when cardiopulmonary arrest occurs chest compressions are needed to produce a cardiac output in the non pregnant situation they achieve around 30% of the normal cardiac output aortic valve compression further reduces cardiac output to approximately 10% of the non pregnant cardiac output and respiratory changes changes in lung function diaphragmatic splinting increased oxygen consumption make pregnant women more hypoxic more readily make ventilation more difficult now these are the changes in cardiovascular system we know that there is a hemodilution because uh, plasma volume is increased by 50% so there is dilutional anemia which decreases the oxygen carrying capacity heart rate increased by 15 to 20 beats which uh, increases the cpr demands uh, circulation demands cardiac output is increased by 40% again increases the cpr demands uterine blood flow potential for massive hemorrhage as there is a, a 10% of cardiac output at term is increased at the uterine level systemic vascular resistance <laughs> which sequest blood during cpr and uh, at arterial blood pressure is again decreased which can decrease the reserve venous return is again decreased by gravid uterus that is due to pregnancy if we are trying to resuscitate which again increases uh, cpr demands and decreases the reserve so again you know this is during pregnancy but i will concentrate more on the uh, postpartum collapse so all of uh, whatever we told now like the breast engagement and laryngeal edema reduces the esophageal tone so there is difficulty to intubate high risk aspiration of aspiration particularly if there is a medelson syndrome and so we have to secure airway early now reduce venous return and cardiac output by 30 to 40% so uterine dis displacement if patient is pregnant for cpr is required left lateral tilt is required by 15 to 30 degree if cpr is not required uterine blood flow up to 10% of circulating volume so predisposition to hemorrhage and hypovolemia so we need aggressive fluid resuscitation 
So we have to empty the uterus early to increase the circulating volume and to reduce the OP consumption. Dilutional anemia, again, there is a repetition which reduces the oxygen carrying capacity and all other things which we already discussed, okay? Now, what is important is like whenever we have, I think every obstetric facility must have a triage. And I must tell you, now during Laksha, we are insisting for that, that the, every obstetric uh, facility must have, and the person who are there in the triage, they should know this modified early warning scoring system, because then only they will be able to manage the patient efficiently. Now, MUSE is calculated from five physiological variables. That is mental response, pulse rate, systolic blood pressure, respiratory rate, and temperature. So an early warning score chart should be used routinely for uh, the women to allow early recognition of the women who is becoming critically ill. Now, if the respiratory rate is more than 25 or less than 10 cycles per minute, systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, heart rate more than 110 or less than 55 beats per minute, uh, not fully altered and oriented, SpO2 less than 90%, urine output less than 100 ml in four hour, and respiratory rate more than 35 CPM or heart rate more than 140. So both will have to take into consideration tachycardia as well as bradycardia. So three or more of these criteria we have to take. And uh, this is the modified early warning score, you know, and uh, these are the deviations from the normal range. So you have the temperature and you have a different color coding. So if we have trained the staff in the triage, and if they look at and start writing all these findings on this MIO chart, this is the modified. Definitely, they will be able to recognize the problems. The one which is, is red is the urgent, very urgent. So temperature again, uh, whether it is less than 34, more than 34, or more than 34.56 to 35, white will be almost normal. Then again, there could be even a um, hyperpyrexia, systolic blood pressure. Again, there could be less than 90 and uh, 90 to 99 or 100 to 110, or there could be hypertension also, severe hypertension. Same with pulse, uh, pulse rate, severe bradycardia, severe tachycardia. Again, respiratory rate, oxygen saturations again, uh, oxygen saturations on air again, and then if uh, AVPU or new CA, that is, we have to see whether there is a pain response or a voice response, or whether the patient is confused or she is educated, and urine output, whether it is less or more also. So the actions from MIOS, we have to take the score, less than two qualified nurse to review the patient at next handover, two to three qualified nurse to review immediately, repeat observations, and instigate the therapy as prescribed, four to five, Again, the qualified nurse to review immediately, repeat the observations, junior doctor to review within 30 minutes, six to seven, urgent review by SHO or SLR immediately, okay, plus inform the critical care. And once we know that the score is A, there is an urgent review by SHO, or you may have to call a multidisciplinary team or even a medical emergency team. So it's very important that we assess in modified MIA chart all this. So optimal initial management for any collapse will be resuscitation, should be administered using standard A, B, C, D approach with some modifications for maternal physiology. So primary survey and resuscitation is airway with cervical spine control, breathing and ventilation, circulation with volume replacement and hemorrhage control, disability or neurological status, exposure, adequate exposure, the patient to make a full assessment, taking care to avoid pain and potential hypothermia, because we know once the patient goes into the triad, it will be very difficult to uh, revive her, assess the fetal well-being and appropriate. Secondary, that is primary. Secondary survey, top to toe and back to front examination. Secondary survey is performance, the patient is stable. It's a comprehensive assessment which takes place after life-threatening problem is identified and treated and uncovers problems that are immediately no. life -threatening. So secondary survey is also equally important and we have to give a definitive care and specific management. Can I, uh, my screen is getting, can you just remove this also? Yeah. So the collapse, unresponsive pregnant women, check airway, breathing, and circulation, left lateral T, unless postnatal or less than 20 weeks, no breathing, no pulse, commence basic life support, CPR, 30, that is uh, chest compression, and two for the breathing, 
called resuscitation team automated defibrillator we should have a um, code blue will be uh, i think activated by that time automated defibrillator attached and shock if advised then prepare for lscs if required within 4 minutes further resuscitation as required depending on responses resuscitation team arrives role of obstetrician decision to deliver if more than 20 weeks gestation if no response to cpr at 4 minutes one should take the decision and after stabilization consider other problems like dic development bleeding risk or if there is a thrombosis risk airway yes if there is obstruction perform head tilt or chin lift to open the airway uh, the airway should be protected as soon as possible with a cuff endotracheal tube recommended equipment for routine airway management face mask or oropharyngeal airways three sizes nasopharyngeal airways three sizes laryngeal mask airways and tracheal tubes and laryngoscope handle with macintosh blade size 3 and 4 now and trachea tube introducer and malleable skillet breathing supplement oxygen should be administered as asap at high flow 100% oxygen bag and mask ventilation should be undertaken until intubation can be achieved because you may not have a person in labor room to intubate but we should be knowing the bls as well as the als techniques circulation if the airway is clear and there is no breathing chest compression should be commenced immediately hand position should be over the center of the chest and perpendicular to the chest wall and depress 5 to 6 cm 30 chest compression should be performed for every two ventilation breaths initially 30 is to 2 and once intubation is performed the ventilation should be at the rate of 10 breaths per minute with continuous chest compression at 100 to uh, 20 120 per minute two wide bore cannula yes 16 gauge cannula should be there there should be aggressive approach to volume replacement abdominal ultrasound if possible uh, possible by a skilled operator can assist in diagnosis of concealed hemorrhage defibrillation is required the same setting as non pregnant patient is used adhesive defibrillator pads are preferable to defibrillator paddles the left defibrillation pad should be applied lateral to the left breast and you should be i think we should have by that time a person who can do the defibrillation because i know everybody obstetrician will not be able to do it but there should be people those who are trained ongoing management it includes definitive management depending on the underlying cause it is essential the woman is transferred to an appropriate environment to ensure optimal ongoing care hemorrhage i think we heard definitely we have to look at hemostasis so first the general medical management and then the surgical management which we are all aware rupture uterus prompt maternal resuscitation and surgical interventions are mainstay of treatment urgent laparotomy after maternal stabilization is required and after delivery of the fetus and placenta hemorrhage control is done either by repair of uterine drain or peripartum hysterectomy non hemorrhagic sepsis i think we all must know this sofa square uh, sorry score because most of the time what happens you know the sepsis is missed okay so which is second most common cause of maternal death in india after hemorrhage and risk factors we know is a group b streptococcal infection or if there is a vaginal discharge or pelvic infection prolonged prom uh, or amniocentesis or other invasive procedures are done and even after a cesarean section after prom it can happen vaginal trauma wound hematomas multiple pregnancies and assisted reproduction so septic shock care bundle is there so we should have a get a culture profile done for blood urine and swab culture antibiotics broad spectrum antibiotics within first hour of recognition of severe sepsis and septic shock then hypotension and must measure the lactate levels if it is more than 4 millimol per liter then we have to give her uh, 20 milli ml per kg of crystallites and colloids vasopressors also may be required septic shock yes achieve cvp of more than 8 mm of mercury if uh, ventilated more than 12 mm maintain saturation consider steroids and consider transfusion if the hemoglobin is less than 7 grams acute immersion even though rare but a real emergency where the patient can just collapse incidence is 1 in 20000 to 1 in 50 uh, if it is incomplete may not be that the condition will be so severe but complete definitely the fundus will be inverted lying in vagina or outside and we know there is factors there could be mismanagement of third stage of labor uh, and nowadays when we say control contraction everybody must be properly trained to deliver the placenta once they are sure that the uterus is well contracted and the placenta is separated abnormally short umbilical cord could be morbidly aberrant fundal placenta if even it can happen during mrp and connective tissue disorders so immediate reversion of inverted uterus uh, fundus 
if diagnosed on the spot and within minutes we should look for congestion edema and contraction of inverted uterus make reversion uh, painful without anesthesia it will be uh, painful also so part inverted first should be the last to be corrected if the placenta is attached do not attempt to remove it before shifting to operating room manual reposition fails surgical replacement requires laparotomy uh, later on that is hunting terms or holtens repair and hysterectomy is the last resort in management of recurrent inversion but we should be ready to handle again atonic ppl because the uterus will be atonic amniotic fluid embolism you know it is again a nightmare even though it is rare you know it has a very high fatality 20 to 35 percent these factors are again increasing age induction of labor multiple pregnancies cesarean section etc definitive management definitely cpr is the mainstay if initial event she survived overall survival rate increases yes it's required icu management and support to care intubation and ventilation inotropic support correction of coagulopathy with the blood and blood products you may have to give even cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen even we can use recombinant factor 7 later on if the coagulopathy cannot be corrected or if the massive it is a component of massive blood component replacement plasma pheresis and hemofiltration the amniotic fluid embolism can present in three ways there could be just a collapse there could be dic or you may find that the patient is cyanosis pulmonary thromboembolism again you may, may find the typical ecg findings of s1 q3 and t3 may be seen urgent lung scan ventilation perfusion scan or ct pulse angiogram needed for confirmation but before that we will have to use all a b c d and treat the patient treatment is symptomatic with resuscitation with fluids and oxygen thrombolysis may be considered if hypotension persists surgical embolectomy in women with massive life threatening pulmonary embolus and anticoagulation must be continued later on for 3 to 6 months eclampsia delivery is the mainstay maxalp is the drug of choice acute blood pressure control to prevent major organ damage sudden cardiac arrest cpr again is the mainstay timing of resuscitation of food is the main factor in determining survival and early involvement of cardiologist or not multidisciplinary team or emergency team. drug overdose magnesium sulfate in mild to moderate 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate or 10 ml of 10% calcium chloride given by slow iv injection in severe cases prompt tracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation is life saving so hdu is the need of the hour for every labor who are managing the patients of eclampsia local anesthetic agents toxicity suspected stop injecting immediately and lipid rescue that is intralipid 20% should be used uh, mechanism of action of lipids is increasing clearance from cardiac tissue lipids counteract the local anesthetic inhibition of myocardial fatty acid oxidation thereby enabling energy production and reversal of cardiac depression anaphylaxis all potential causative agents the agent should be removed and the abcd approach uh, to assessment and resuscitation followed you can give 1 is 2000 adrenaline or 500 microgram intravascular we can be given adrenaline treatment can be repeated after 5 minutes if there is no effect adjuvant therapy consists of chlorpheniramine 10 mg and hydrocortisone 200 mg by im or slow iv route so the success of treatment requires communication preparedness multidisciplinary team approach and hospital protocols so dear friends the take home message is maternal collapse can be unpredictable and thus needs con constant vigilance structured approach using abcd should be used in assessment and management of the collapse patient cpr should be modified by securing the airway as early as possible and if pregnant patient is pregnant displacing the uterus manually management of critically ill pregnant women should be by multidisciplinary team and i must tell you recently during this covid time we had a patient who had a pulmonary edema okay and with god's grace and with everybody in time coming there anesthetist everybody we could manage her immediately i think the first abcd was done and then she was shifted to icu after 12 hours she recovered and she was a case of uh, severe preeclampsia. We could do a cesarean section later and she went home happily. So I think the message is intelligent anticipation, skilled supervision, prompt decision, and effective institution of therapy can prevent disastrous consequences. So thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you very much. And I would like to request all of you as I'm contesting for the post of ICOG vice chair to support me in my future uh, in the election. Thank you.
Thank you, Thank Dr. Sheila. You are always very exhaustive in your talk. I would say that if you have postpartum collapse, the first thing you should do is call your anesthetist. Yes. First step. Yes. Then you can go ahead with whatever else you do. You have your history, but call your anesthetist. He'll save you many a time. Another important thing is, I think, to have an obstetric rapid response team. team. Because that should consist maybe just of trained staff in the labor room and our residents and, of course, an anesthetist and a senior consultant. And then, of course, a supportive team would include a critical care specialist and, of course, uh, uh, maybe a, a vascular surgeon. But I think the rapid response team and that golden two hours, like Pailisa mentioned, is the most important, where we pick up all the signs and, you know, act as fast as possible. Very true. Ma'am, there's one question for the chat box. Uh, role of NASG anti-shock garment. I think if we know that the patient is bleeding, I don't think, I mean, if, if the patient is collapsed and if it is due to hemorrhage, it is, we can apply because all of us, we know that the blood from the periphery will go to the vital organs and the blood pressure, which was very low, will definitely be compared. See, I have an experience of using anti-shock garment once I was called for a post cesarean case with tachycardia. I mean, her uh, shock index was almost 1.7, you can say. And the pulse was so feeble. So immediately we started uh, IV fluids. We arranged for the blood and we applied anti-shock garment. At least I could palpate her pulse and I could feel the, I mean, I was able to record the blood pressure. So if it is hemorrhage, yes, immediately, hemorrhagic cause, immediately apply. Even in ectopic pregnancy also, it is useful. And uh, we have seen that the patient's blood pressure, at least uh, the revival from the shock becomes easier. So it is good to apply uh, anti-shock okay. garment. Ma'am, any experience with perimortem cesarean section? So far, I really do not have any experience. But to be very frank, during COVID time, we were so frightened because we used to getting pregnant patients. So we were uh, prepared to see that if we get any patient who is in the ICU, we have a ICU in KC General Hospital. We had just thought of it that better to keep a safe ready. So in case if we have to do, but I don't have. We have seniors here, sir. Sir, is here and sir. sir, if you have any experience. So, any experience? Yes, we had. Uh, but before that, to comment on what Shaini said, the obstetric rapid response team is a must for every delivery point. Of course, the ideal would be to have this specialist as you suggested to include uh, all those people. But in reality, for every delivery center, when we say we cannot think of vascular surgeon and all those people there. What is required is at least a trained nurse who can recognize the problem and give immediate resuscitative measures. So what we are doing in Kerala is this scheme called Obstetric Rapid Response Team, which will be given a pouch by our federation after they have trained, which will have a pulse oximeter and a face mask, portable face mask, in case you have to give a direct mouth to face mask ventilation and the technique of how to give the cardiac compression. We had in fact only yesterday, one of the sessions. And the point is every delivery point should have at least one person trained in that under the roof, around the clock. Of course your uh, public address system, this, that, everything have to be there, but at least one person under the roof it may be in the theater, maybe in the labor room. Once you alert that person, that person comes and then assess the situation and take steps one by one. So that is a very important practical point, which we are training not only the um, obstetricians or the doctors, but the nurses. And approach A, B, C, D. D stands for definitive treatment. So the most common indication for us will be a hemorrhage, where the patient has just collapsed. In which case, D takes over as D, A, B, C. It's already a cardiac arrest. It is, as American Cardiology Association also has said, it should be not A, B, C, D, but C, A, B, D. Like that. So in yesterday's session also, this is what we emphasize. A nurse should be able to apply the clamp or the cannula to stop the bleeding. Then only it will change the scenario. Of course, if it's a drug toxicity, sudden collapse, amyloid embolism, 
it may not be within the means of the nurse to tackle it completely but it is somebody who knows the common is things and in that we promote even the uh, intra osseous infusion so intra osseous to the bone marrow like that okay that is one day coming to the um, perimortem cesarean or resuscitative hysterotomy as it is called now yes we had the occasion i had the occasion to do uh, in real ambulatory embolism and the baby was taken out in about 8 minutes baby and mother saved but that happened in the hospital setting in our labor room which is an attached to cesarean theater and we could do it to finish the baby was out but it may not be so in the beyond 8 minutes we can still do but every labor room should have a perimeter say i would say every labor room and every emergency room of big hospital should have a perimeter cesarean say the essential ingredient of that is a scalpel now the plastic handled scalpel blade pre sterilized is available that should be outside that pack inside the pack should be a big sheet with a central big hole which can accommodate you. no painting no consent required once you decide on doing that what to do when you reach the uterus get the baby out put that pack should have green amitraz as well as two arms one point stitch one or two number one y cream these are the essential things needle holder and composers so a pack like that should be available once the situation comes that comes the knife on the outside sterile and you of course in our setup our situation is always better we can just say that we are going to do it but if it doesn't have that at least time has come when in fact in i think mangalore the court asked okay now obstetrician why perimortem cesarean was not done because the google and all that people have come to know the people can now start asking why was the baby not allowed saved at least why did he not do perimortem cesarean people have started to ask like that so it is time that we all make uh, provision for that thank you now we had an experience where dr satyavani also had done uh, perimortem cesarean section and it was Uh, done with a ra- obstetric rapid response team and it was really beneficial for the patient uh, now i'd like to ask uh, ma'am lakshmi ma'am to just comment make a uh, comments on this expert <laughs> expert comments i'm uh, not sure i'm going to add much to this um, i don't have much personal experience with perimortem cesarean except that i know that uh, in the setup that i worked um, we can and we had the the setup ready and could go ahead with it like dr pailey uh, mentioned uh, we really didn't have to wheel them to the theater and uh, you know um, it it is uh, everything was always kept ready and available uh, the other important thing i feel is to involve your uh, the nursing staff and not always depend on the not for the perimortem cesarean i'm talking about the management of the postpartum collapse not depend only on the doctors um we need to have some nurses identified uh, trained we should have this we they used to call it by some particular name uh, you know a, bo- a box or a cupboard in which all these are uh, kept ready and available uh, physical bundles i'm not talking about the other sepsis and other theoretical bundles but the physical bundles being available the protocols what is 1 2 3 4 for every one of these situations especially the uh, common ones what to do first what to do next being uh, you know written the guidelines being there and available and put up very prominently and people being aware of it and trained uh, these these go a long way because we think that we have an obstetric uh, you know emergency team available and that they will come rushing but many a time you find that there is a there is a delay there so having people very a team of people not an individual being at least three or four of them trained in it and having the protocols available all the time in addition to having all your instruments checking them every week monday morning make sure all your stuff work um, you know these are the i mean i have even seen an endocentrical intubation uh, tube not uh, working uh, you know when the time uh, actually when you actually need it so checking them regularly there are a whole lot of in addition to having protocols and guidelines whole lot of practical things that we need to do to be able to save our patients because we have many minutes 
um, available to yes, us. Sir. I would like and to share, madam, now as we are talking about Laksha and I am associated with uh, district hospital, uh, Vani Vilas Hospital, which is the biggest tertiary hospital, have a very elaborate triage, you know, where everything is there, okay, because they get the maximum referrals. And even in uh, every hospital now, there is a, a triage and the nurses are trained and there is a trend now that the people, those who are trained should not be posted to other places because there should be people around who are trained and these uh, charts are put up uh, the regularly, we have to conduct the OSCE and uh, the drills and all are not happening. But as we said, that sustainability is very important. Whatever we do, you know, I mean, uh, we have the charts and the protocols, but we have to see the audit is very important again and the debriefing. And I must say that under Laksha initiative, even all the public sectors are gearing up. And as we do mentoring, even for the peripheral centers, we do find that really people are gearing up even in the public sector. And I think private sector also, even though they have a small setup, it is very easy for them to train their own staff and we should be following the protocols and see that they stick to it and they do it on time as a response team. That's what Dr. Shaini and Sir also uh, mentioned about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, want to thank the speakers and the yeah, chairpersons. I I, I, uh, before Shirley, one minute. I would like to thank Dr. Sheila for a wonderful um, uh, presentation. And uh, really, we are, we are faced with uh, this uh, postpartum collapse many a time, especially in a medical college. They, we get a lot of cases uh, which was referred in the last minute. So we have uh, had a good experience with this. Really, uh, it was a wonderful uh, practical tips you have given, Sheila. Uh, that was a nice session. Thank you, the organizers and Sheila, for the opportunity given. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of Bangalore Baptist Hospital, ma'am, we want to present you this oh. uh, memento. Thank you, you so much for coming it. here in person. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I must uh, congratulate you for arranging it so wonderfully. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. I think we'll hand over the uh, uh, next session to Dr. Nalini who, and the other chairpersons involved. Oh, this is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. We now go ahead with the second session. We have interesting topics here. Coagulopathies in PPH and um, pregnancy and sexuality. It's my pleasure to introduce our chairpersons for this session. Dr. Shobha Gudi, the professor at HOD at uh, St. Philomena's Hospital, chairperson, Family Welfare Committee of Foxy, governing council member, ICOG, peer reviewer of Jogi, special interest being maternal medicine, high-risk pregnancy, menopausal medicine, and population stabilization. And welcome to Dr. Samita, the professor at HOD at Varivilas Hospital, CAC trainer and NACO expert trainer, examiner for UG, PG, and DNB, head of high-risk pregnancy fellowship, member of the Technical Advisory Committee of Government of Karnataka, who has led the fight against COVID for pregnant women for the first time in Karnataka. She has published and presented numerous papers in national and international journals and the ex-syndicate member of RGUHS. Welcome to both Dr. Shobhaguri and Dr. Savita. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very kind introduction. And uh, it is my duty now to uh, welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Sadhana Gupta. And uh, uh, before I do that, uh, thanks very much, uh, Bangalore Society, Dr. Padmini, and uh, um, Dr. Sheila Mane, and of course, uh, uh, Bangalore Baptist Hospital, 
with all my friends there. Thank you so much for having me here as faculty and it's a privilege to share this important session. Well, after the previous two scintillating lectures, where practically I think we spent the last uh, two hours in uh, labor room, right? So now, now it comes to more refined management of square velocities um, in uh, PPH, which can be the primary cause or it can happen secondary to an ongoing PPH and its correction. And to speak on that, we have a highly esteemed Foxian uh, with a lot of work under her belt, Dr. Sadhna Gupta. Dr. Sadhna Gupta is well known to Bangalore Society and, um, of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, veteran Foxian, uh, several years of dedicated community service and uh, work for Safe Motherhood Committee. And as you can see, she has held various positions. She has been the Foxy representative to Shrefok 1821. Of course, she has worked with ICOG and Jogi also. And she has her own center, the Jeevan Jyoti Hospital at Gorakhpur. Her special interests are high-risk yeah, operative yeah. and critical care in optics, safe motherhood initiatives, uh, reproductive medicine, academic and social writing. I have go gone through her uh, uh, the literature that she has uh, um, published, and uh, uh, I think it speaks volumes about her ability as a consultant. Also, she has exemplary leadership qualities and. Uh, uh, please begin your lecture, Sadhna. We are waiting to hear from you. And we also wish you all the very best for your future endeavors. Please thank begin. you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shobha. Uh, uh, allow me to uh, screen share, Dr. Rajesh. Allow me to screen share. Is it visible to all? No. 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 It just like. No. Uh, I think your presentation is open, Dr. Sadhna. Uh, just yes. Please open your presentation on the desktop because the Zoom uh, platform was you joining the page was Just. 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 Not yet. Maybe we should, uh, now it is seen. Please read there. Yes. Uh, slide show. Uh, it is visible fully or it is half visible? Just uh, uh, like slightly yes. cut off on the left side. So if you can reduce the uh, size. Huh. Yeah. One minute. Just one minute because it is having uh, some issue. Yes, yeah, please share again. You can share again. Yeah. Just one minute. Uh, sorry, actually, I... yeah. Make a slide. Yes, make a slide show. Slide show, that's all. Uh, actually, when I do slide show, na, then it is getting an issue. The, uh, the size of the slide may have to be reduced. Fine, no. yeah, it is fine. It, it is fine. fine. Huh? It is fine. It is fine. It is fine. I think it is yeah, visible. It is, fine. It, is visible. So it is fine, madam. Yes, yes, so yeah. so uh, thank you. First of all, I owe gratitude to all Bangalore Opsani Society throughout my career because it is the leaders and mentors of Bangalore Society, Dr. Kamni Rao, Dr. Hema Devakar, who actually gave me that confidence, that inspiration and motivation and followed by Dr. Sheila Mane, whom I took charge as a safe motherhood committee and learned so many things. And all the friends and Dr. Shobha, Dr. Jeevi Tejavati, Dr. Padmini and Dr. Jyotika and who not. I have been always part of all Bangalore program and Bangalore society has been always a part of our, uh, all the conferences or the academic session which we are doing. So I bring greeting from Foxy, ICOG, Safog, 
the journal whom I have served in different capacities in these 30 years and with why we are here at Baptist Hospital that we know that India contributes to a major major share of uh, maternal morbidity and the mortality and world is looking for Indian experience and contribution in healthcare system and today when we have a lot of uh, uh, when we have a lot of technical expertise infrastructure actually the issue is disparity in our healthcare system and that is the way actually SDG goals speak for it and we remember today Mahatma Gandhi, our father of nation, who lost his life today. And the best way to find yourself is to lose serve yourself in the service of others. And I think this movement, this place, our all leaders and mentors and the colleagues together, I think we are really giving a, we give a good like tribute to him. So hematological emergencies can contribute to significant morbidity and mortality in pregnant population. They can be sudden, catastrophic, and unprecedented. And there is a tech, like knowledge gap and sometimes an uh, issue in the system. And here is really like, you know, we know many things. We have come a long way with all PPH workshop done by Dr. Sheila Manes, Safe Motherhood Committee. But hematological emergencies are something where we have to look something more beyond it. So let's first understand what is pregnancy physiological status and pregnancy is a pro-coagulant state because nature has designed it like this because to check obstetrical hemorrhage there should be a good coagulation hemostasis at the utero-vascular surface and these things are protective. And it is a balance, it is formed by the procoagulant and the natural anticoagulant and the woman is fine and we are doing like all, with all these changes which happen from all the trimester in a different way and the normal circumstances <coughs> process are balanced by anti-clotting mechanism. So this is important and uh, coagulopathy, with this basic knowledge that we have procoagulant status as a pregnancy and a very finely balanced procoagulant and anti-clotting mechanism, we can have many, many coagulopathy particular in obstetrical population. Thrombocytopenia of many degree, many from physiological to immunological to thrombotic health syndrome, pro-thrombotic microangiopathic event, DIC, DVT, recurrent pregnancy loss is also a little spectrum of it. So with this, that the patient can have coagulopathy in pregnancy, do we have any consideration of anticipation of these coagulopathy in our obstetrical practice? So this is very important thing that in routine investigation in antenatal care can be alert that this patient can have the coagulopathy and the coagulation panel includes CBC, prothrombin type, PTT, plasma fibrinogen. But it is actually the complete blood count and the hemogram which tells you much more, which warns you that the things might be wrong. So the platelet count, what is the, like my uh, RBC, like it is showing any hemolysis, any early sign of hemolysis. And that reading should be our practice because CBC is the thing which we are doing to all patients. We are revising, we are repeating in the third trimester, close to term. And this is the time where we should be aware that this patient is a high risk for any coagulopathy. And the second thing which I want to like uh, communicate that take history of any anticoagulant drug like warfarin, aspirin or heparin, which we are, aspirin and heparin is being given to so many patients for so many reasons. And that is the very important thing to be considered. Now, platelet count, it is if it is less than 1.5 lakh, it is defined thrombocytopenia. And whenever there is a platelet count below 80,000, we should start workup for the other causes. And let's like do, because sometimes we see coagulopathy is very rare and it we might not get it, but it can be very, very easily come as postpartum hemorrhage. So this is a patient, she had a off and on booking and she comes in the labor room 
and when we the the uh, this the, the complete blood count reveal it is around 30000 patient this low platelet count when everybody is fighting for this low platelet count platelet count was arranged but the patient have severe postpartum hemorrhage despite platelet transfusion blood units and she continued to have the low platelet and the hemorrhage despite hysterectomy and despite platelet transfusion and finally the diagnosis was made immunological thrombocytopenia steroid and iv immunoglobulin good did good to the patient and patient made a very rapid recovery after steroid and the immunoglobulin so this is an enigma actually nowadays every patient before we say the patient says uh, oh this is my platelet is low and should i eat kiwi and what is the thing and there is no danger so if it is more than less than 80000 start working we must be aware that 75% are gestational because of physiological dilution and physiological, but 25% can be due to different causes like ITP, TTP, SLE, and the hemolytic anemias like in the dengue. So this is very important and besides immunological and thrombotic thrombocytopenia, we can have the inherited specific orders which is lack of platelet glycoprotein autosomal dominant disorder different syndrome but what we need to know that this inherited thyrosid th thrombocytopenia can present only as a case of postpartum hemorrhage there is nothing patient suddenly comes into the pph and it is around 30 percent 30 to 40 percent of these patients have the primary postpartum hemorrhage immunothrombocytopic uh, papira there is a antibodies against platelet and these antibodies create these these are destroyed very very rapidly in reticulo endothelial system and around two percent of these immune thrombocytopenic peripura have got the serological test for the lupus so this is very important and it sometimes usually remains if the pregnancy we leave it remains like a something chronic disease with the low platelet count. So pregnancy does not increase risk of relapse or worsening. This is important. And platelet count, it is a victim that around 30 to 50,000, we should start thinking of platelet transfusion and primary treatment is the corticosteroid or the IV immunoglobin. This one important because mother and fetus go hand in hand. And in immune thrombocytopenic perpura, there can be still birth fetal loss and fetal bed as well as the neonatal thrombocytopenia and sometimes neonatal hemorrhage. Still for ITP, cesarean delivery is not recommended to avoid neonatal thrombocytopenia. This is important. And as we say, the IV immunoglobulin and steroid are treatment of choice in few situation, even in pregnancy, splenectomy, may be considered when there is resistance to corticosteroid IV immunotherapy, then the splenomectomy should be considered. And again, it is a role of the multidisciplinary team. And I have got some few experience from the very senior that they did splenomectomy and patient did very well. So it is CBC which should be read out very well. And we should consider that platelet count in a very observant manner, do not panic, do not give major reaction, do not frighten, but try to find out the cause and try to follow the course of the thrombocytopenia. This is again a common situation, patient coming with the missed abortion after around 10, 14 weeks and she comes to you, you advise it is 10 to 12 weeks, here she has been given echo aspirin, aspirin, everything because to like continue pregnancy, but she had missed abortion and suddenly patient when you do suction evacuation, there is a sudden tachycardia and the blood pressure low and the oxygen saturation, everything. So suddenly it is a simple procedure. We don't like so much counsel that, that this is a 10, 8, 12 week, a 10 or 11 week missed abortion and it is a simple mm -hmm. procedure. But suddenly patient is started bleeding. In all cases of missed abortion, we should anticipate coagulopathy. Because it is said in early mid trimester abortion, it is around not that low incidence, it is around 1% that patient can have PPH due to coagulopathy, due to sepsis because of the gram negative or streptococcus, streptococcus, and molar pregnancy is another situation where we can have a DIC like picture. So, this is important that even the first trimester or early second trimester, that is around 10 to 11 weeks 
especially missed abortion and intrauterine fetal death we should be ready to have like the diagnostic mater modality for the coagulopathy as well as the treatment modality for the coagulopathy the case situation like three which we say it is a, it is a most difficult thing patient is having mild rise of blood pressure pre eclampsia and i will to say that pre eclampsia is pre eclampsia like there is a boundary between mild and severe manifestation but we take pre eclampsia every time very very seriously and because we never know where the mild manifestation become the severe manifestation so this patient on the uh, like sudden rise of severe rise of severe features she had sudden iufd abruptio she was taken for induction of labor and the patient had the delivered the dead baby and they had the retroplacental cord and the heavy bleeding and the unstable vital and where things went wrong we tried it because pre eclampsia health dic they come like a fire it is on one story it is fire and suddenly it is all over the story and we did everything we do try to do everything very best but it is a disease process it is a real real threatening thing which makes the coagulopathy in picture suddenly they manifest so it is a help it is dic following abruptio and iufd and it is a overlapping pattern and the clinical problem is that they are overlapping they are like my like a mirror we don't know it is health or it is dic or it is both so there our investigation modalities and our observation comes and i will just like to take a little bit what is health and what is dic and where they overlap and where they are different so it was the louis moinstein the older people have got a something very very sharp observation and they come with this health that it is a call of mother for the help and we don't know why few people have got the help but 32% of the patient there can be associated pre eclampsia and there is a general activation a rajesh kindly mute everybody general activation of coagulation cascade so it is not preventable many many times but it is observable and it is a treatable many patient have no symptom it is just a vague malaise viral flu like symptom or something like a shoulder pain or something epigastric pain because of scratching of the liver capsule 50% of nausea and vomiting and headache the i mean to say that symptom can be very very mild but if it is a flu like illness upper quadrant pain be very very careful do a very careful examination and do keep keep your all differential diagnosis in order and see what is in peripheral blood picture sign of hemolysis that increase ldh unconjugated bilirubin increase serum G, uh, albumin transferase uh, ast lt level and the low platelet count and again why it is overlapping 20% of all women with help can have the associated dic we have a classification full fledged help and the the partial help. class 1 class 2 class 3 and the partial and full health and dictum is this that when there is a full health syndrome we should not do conservative treatment we should plan for delivery of the patient but in partial health if the gestational age is low then we can go for the like a temporizing measure and like that supportive treatment so overlapping health and dic is very very like a crucial thing and unless what is one thing which message i want to give that unless dic is present the pt and aptt and fibrinogen level are normal in patient with health syndrome so this is very important low platelet count can be there in dic as well though it is not pathognomonic but in dic the coagulation profile that is normal in the health syndrome and we can have a lot of maternal complication abruptio eclampsia renal failure cerebral pulmonary edema liver capsule hematoma and suddenly shock and there can be around 1% maternal mortality and a lot of perinatal problem that's why we want that if there is a full fledged health syndrome or the health manifestation of pre eclampsia we should not delay delivery of the baby because of the further deterioration of the baby and we can have the stillbirth or asphyxia or neonatal thrombocytopenia treatment of help is supportive it is trying for help for the support 
and manage like severe preeclampsia this is one key point i want to give whenever there is help patient may be having a only 130 by 80 blood pressure but manage it like severe eclampsia with max self with anti hypertensive and the platelet transfusion to be considered around 40 to 50000 steroid a big big controversy but steroid help in raising the platelet count not the overall scenario and overall prognosis and it is again that if the only dic then the fresh frozen plasma we will discuss but the platelet transfusion is the main stay only when the platelet count is around 40 to 50000 uh we have to give there is a chances of the like the the, the bleeding from the hematoma from the side from the surgical sites and sometimes we can have this subcapsular hematoma which is a real real life threatening emergency and need so many multidisciplinary times and uh, this thing i want to like communicate to everybody that the iss the society does not recommend health management as a separate entity but consider as a severe presentation of preeclampsia so if it is time to need to revisit and rethink so coming to the dic that is coming what is say it is a thromboplastin getting into circulation and activation of all coagulation cascade and in patient with the ic we have a all severe acute maternal morbidity issue massive blood transfusion intervention hysterectomy and even mortality combination of dic and pph is very very fatal and actually we don't know where how to define dic and how to score the severity of dic especially in obstetrics so it is a thrombohemorrhagic disorder first is a microvascular thrombosis then clot started lysing and there is a consumption coagulopathy and there is a coagulation and fibrinolysis going hand in hand and the patient can have a lot of coagulation factor deficiency and multiple organ thrombosis because of the vascular thrombosis multiple organ dysfunction so it is a rapid cascade match the the series the fire is on the like a, like a, it has been like ignited all over and what activate dic this is very important because for diagnosis of dic there should be triggering obstetrical event and what are triggering obstetrical event it is abruptio af embolism fetal death sepsis septic abortion then aph and pph pph can cause dic and dic can cause pph aph can cause dic and dic can cause pph so it is a like in a nexus of the uh, even they have joined hand and they are uh, like putting the life into the fire and of course the molar pregnancy acute fatty liver these are the things induced abortion what we have said that they can terminate into the dic as a final picture and this is a very like very good paper we have got that the abruptio pph preeclampsia these are the common causes of the pph and how we can anticipate and diagnose dic nothing is diagnostic it is a alertness it is a overall sense of the picture and the investigation suspect first it is a bleeding suddenly pph suddenly it is massive pph abrupt onset patient is suddenly in shock what dr shila said it is suddenly patient is collapse and the symptom of hypoperfusion of various vascular beds so in depth high index of suspicion is very very important it is sometimes you can see petechia purpura sometimes you may not even see and the shock and acidosis now bleeding time clotting time you know sometime today uh, technology so much expertise that we talk of simple thing then everybody says oh it is thin it is something like backward but still bleeding time clotting time and clot retraction very very simple test it nothing cost you but you observe in how many time is the bleeding time in how many minutes a good clot form what size of clot form and that clot persisted for how many minutes it is a simple test tube it is a simple patient to ml blood and it is 20 to 30 minute you may get report at least in 20 to 30 minutes from lab and it is in front of you which guide you that this patient might be having dic so these are the finding low hb thrombocytopenia usually a constant feature and 
still thrombocytopenia is not specific to DIC and may be due to the other cause what we have taken. So prothrombin time after bedside test, prothrombin time APTT, they have to be sent. Prothrombin time test the integrity of extrinsic and common pathway and the uh, APTT test the integrity of intrinsic and common pathway and the fibrinogen level. That is very, very important because the most important thing is the fibrinogen level because if it is 50, treatment is different, 100, it is different, 150 it is different, 200 is different. So it is the most important predictor of the outcome and the predictor of what component we should do and how rapidly we should do. D-dimers are again because they are not found into the blood anymore. So when you find the D-dimer, it is one of the most important criteria for the diagnosis of the DIC and should be taken very, very seriously. So PPH is unpredictable and any like a investigation which can help in predicting this, again, I want to uh, like emphasize to all that if fibrinogen level is less than two gram per ml or per liter or 200 milligram per deciliter, it is one of the most important predictive marker that this patient can have the postpartum hemorrhage. So in case of severe preeclampsia, in case of IOFD, in case of high risk situation, we can do fibrinogen label even before patient goes into the active labor emergency because it has been found to be the most important predictive marker for the PPH. Thromboelastometry, costly machine, but it is a good machine to take care of what component we should give. It is available in now many ICU and lab bedside ultrasound. Very, very important because we have to treat the cause for DIC that is retained product or something what is left in it. Scoring has been proposed by many society. It is for a non-pregnant and it is for the obstetrical population developed because, you know, many things for this coagulopathy has come for the trauma patient. And trauma patient score might not be useful, but still they are a good guide like PT, platelet count, fibrinogen level, and FDP level. You give the score and see the severity. And for obstetrical patient also, there has been criteria. And one thing I again repeat, there should be obstetrical inciting event. When this is inciting event, then our all investigation and everything is start working. So coagulopathy all are overlapping and you have to be very alert and a body obstetrician should know about coagulation disorder. I will say it is rising creatinine thrombocytopenia with neurological feature. It is thrombotic, thrombotic cytopenia, thrombocytopenia. Similar feature without, without a neurological involvement, but rising creatinine and anemia, it is hemolytic uremic syndrome. If there is cystocytes with rising liver enzyme and thrombocytopenia likely to be helped, if hypertension, it could be preeclampsia. So this is the basic knowledge and we must know. And the final condition, what is it? It is the obstetrical inciting, prolonged PT, APTT, presence of FDP and D-dimer. And then it is the diagnosis and watch on the organ function. Finally, DIC, postpartum hemorrhage, peripartum collapse. It tests the strength of our faith, our guts, our leadership, and our toughness. And first, we have to treat the cause, that is fetal death, abruptio, termination of delivery, and managing cause of PPH, and then all the supportive therapy, that is IV fluid and the blood component. Because when there is a good circulation, that liver will clear all the fibrin FD dimer, and it will start creating coagulation factor. So the supportive treatment is the circulation, 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 nicely, fully, because we need a good perfusion of the tissue, especially the hepatic and the kidney tissue. We don't use dextron once upon a time. We use and it aggravates DIC because of fibrinogen dilution and fibrinogen inactivation. Very, very important thing and not overdo with the crystalloid and we have to go for the blood component. O negative, we have a, like a lot of thing about the FFP, but I will take only one or two key messages that FFP is not used as a plasma expander. This is very important and it is used only when there is a PT and the PTT is High, longer and the fibrinogen level is less than 150 milligram per deciliter. So it is not a part for the our circulation therapy. 
cryoprecipitate when very very severe dic and we want to have a quick thing especially in pih when we don't want to overlap cryoprecipitate is very very important and platelet transfusion around 30 to 50000 massive transfusion protocol we always say again it is the experience of the trauma one is to one is to one but there has been a lot of question mark about it again i want to say very very emphatically that massive transfusion protocol starts after 4 to 5 unit of prbc has been given within 2 hours or so it is not so that the from first five you say one rbc one ffp no it is after 4 to 5 unit and the fibrinogen label should be the directive what we should do because one is to one is to one platelet might be quite okay sometime in dic so platelet can cause itself their sepsis so we have to be quite orderly and we have to be quite alert and always like like take consultation from the transfusion medicine specialist and the hematologist vitamin k can be given to all recombinant factor a k have to turn because the costly drug is a fashion of today it is like na somebody really always say oh it was like a miracle but it is a got a limited role it is very costly 60 to 80 microgram and it has been found effective only when the plasma fibrinogen level are reasonable if it is less than 50 it is not going to be very much effective and it if it is to be used it should be used early this is very important that in a very severe PI, like fibrinogen deficiency or in very late stage of dic it is not going to affect and it has got its own thrombotic incidence as well so this is a word about it heparin and tranexamic acid not to be used in dic and pelvic arterial embolization efficacy is compromised if dic score is more than 9 point i am highlighting because we are too much fond of doing like talking about the high expertise which is not available to majority of institution and patient so we must know that we have to go with the basic and we must have the team and lead the team and never lose hope because these patient are young if you maintain circulation good blood component and correct the cause of dic the liver start preparing the manufacturing the coagulation factor and the patient comes back so the key point are the this thing etiology emergency care system what everybody was talking about blood component and hdo and ico so it is uh, can we have the last one or two sl uh, slide for the secondary pph with inherent coagulopathy the patient had a normal delivery she was taking paracetamol brufen and all that and suddenly on 10th day she had a massive pph moderate to massive pph and this was the picture it is 5200 mg prothrombin time this and the patient was diagnosis what we can have all this drug induced valvin disease dic microangiopathic hemolytic anemia just i want to say one or two comment that inherited coagulopathy like von valvin disease of varying severity they cannot present they might not present at the time of delivery because the pregnancy is a pro coagulant state and in pregnancy we have a higher status higher titer of von willebrand factor but when the von willebrand factor gets low after delivery then patient comes can come as the secondary pph so it is a label right the nature is very very kind so it is a pro coagulant state and we have we didn't have the primary pph but in secondary pph consider the inherited coagulopathy also so <laughs> coming to it we owe to our women that we are ready for detection anticipation and management of coagulopathy the combination of coagulopathy and pph is very very complex it is a drastic it is a monstrous and we as a like a divine people we have to be there because the divine you know the joining the divinity is very tough and the god has to come to the earth to join the divine teacher it is today is the death anniversary of father of nation who says my life is my message and it is the thing that only our life and ways are our message and leader leads by example not by codes thank you very much i seek your kind support for my candidature for foxy president bangalore society has been like it is it has groomed me what i am the 
majority of share is by the Bangalore society leaders, peaceful colleagues and friends. And I hope that we will stay together. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sarna. That was a wonderful presentation, a very brave effort to deal with this highly complex subject. Uh, I think you did an excellent uh, uh, presentation and uh, you brought out very clearly that, uh, uh, that there is uh, the primary need. The primary need is to, is to stop the bleeding and uh, restore the circulation and uh, then uh, find out the cause of the regular pitching. And uh, one thing which I also needed to put in perspective is uh, you highlighted very well uh, that the obstetrician should know when to trigger for the massive transfusion protocol. And I also want to bring in Dr. Sadna here that we must have a hematologist or at least a very um, experienced physician who has good understanding of uh, hematological and uh, coagulation abnormalities when we are dealing with such a patient. And you brought out the complexity of use of advanced factors like activated factor seven and uh, other blood components very well. And also when we are dealing with other coagulopathies other than optic DIC, we need to have a high alert for transfusion more fresh frozen plasma. I think you did highlight the need for cryoprecipitate in certain obstetric conditions also. So thank you very much. I think uh, uh, what do the hosts say? Do we have one or two question time or should we move to the next speaker? Yes, uh, we have uh, two questions here. One, the role of uh, thromboelastography, which I think Madam has uh, already highlighted, but maybe you could just brush up on it now. Thromboelastography is a, it is a actually, I didn't even know that it was very costly. I thought it was costly, but it is very costly. But what is it in a graphical manner? Actually, it directs that what component should we have. And the people have started using in the intensive care system. And there is a like a real thought process. Uh, in many societies, we say that we can have in our obstetrical OT and obstetrical HDU that system also. And it gives you, it, it seems like a little complicated graph, but once, once we get the specialist and used to it, and it shows that when the fresh frozen plasma is needed, when the patient is having anemia, or what is the severity. So it is a real machine for the, like, first of all, what is the status of DIC? It can help in scoring and that direct the blood component therapy. So it is a point of care test and the world is talking about the, these point of care tests, which we can have immediately at the bedside because the lab investigation takes a little time. But the thromboelastography gives you instant things. So it is a point of care test and maybe way ahead because everybody, everything comes in its own way and we have to be aware and up, like a rich institution can really like thinking of having thromboelastography machines in our unit, in obstetrical unit. I think more evidence needs to be built up around how to interpret the uh, results and how to yes. translate it into uh, changing the component therapy that you are, uh, you know, already doing for the patient. So uh, with that, I think we can come to the end of this session. A uh, lot of compliments there, Dr. Gupta, for you, uh, that your presentation was very useful indeed. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Dr. Samita, you can take forward the session. Yeah. Thank you, madam. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Padmini Prasad. Uh, Madam is like not only famous among the medical fraternity, she is uh, very famous among the common people also. She is uh, active in the media in the form of uh, TV shows and uh, news articles. So where she will be enlightening the uh, common people regarding the medical issues. And she is a medical director of Ramamani Nursing and Maternity Home Institute of Sexual Medicine, Bangalore. She is a president. Uh, Bangalore's BSOG 2021-2022. Uh, uh, she's a chairperson for the sexual medicine and STD committee, Kasuga 21-22, member of uh, World Association for Sexual Health, committee member of sexual education, sexuality education, International Society for uh, Sexual Medicine 21-22, uh, 
she is secretary for uh, council of sex uh, education and uh, parents food international uh, national coordinator for sexual medicine committee uh, foxy 20 to 22 co-opted member of national family planning association of india 21 and 23 special interests are sexual health and infertility and madam always her uh, talks are so different and interesting and welcome madam over to dr padmini madam uh, ellarigo namaskara good afternoon to you all after a series of such high level talks and with, uh, loaded with information and uh, enlightening uh, lectures and i am going to speak on something different but it which is a very basic thing and attached to each and every person and where many times uh, the our obstetricians cannot help and uh, patients are having lots and lots of questions about that can you see uh, see my slides yes yes ma'am yes sir yes. Oh, and I, I, I actually I was just in a one overlapping talk and yeah uh, now all others mute please so what i am going to talk about is the sex or the sexuality during pregnancy because so many times you all will be perplexed if a, because present day um, mothers they are they have got lots and lots of information awareness they read lot of articles they look into the media and they are very well aware of the sexuality and the sexual concerns so the couple has lot of questions regarding the sexuality whether to have intercourse during pregnancy how much to have when to have if they don't have what will happen and if they can have a, a intercourse what will happen whether it leads to any complications whether it has got any effect on the baby or what is the role of the husband or the partner uh, during the sexual interaction because it is going to lead to lot of uh, uh, the couple disturbance interpersonal relationship and so many people going i know so many of my patients who come crying that uh, throughout pregnancy and then uh, staying with the mother for one year after delivery and no sexual interaction the husband has lost interest in her developed extramarital relationships or sometimes if you don't advise them properly they think they can have sexual intercourse and come back with so many problems also so what to do with that how to advise so you should be uh, having a proper scientific in- information Uh, to advise your patients when they come to you because you cannot just brush aside and then uh, just say why do you worry about this and uh, better in uh, to be on the safer side don't have intercourse at all during pregnancy we don't know what will happen so this type of vague uh, advices or vague answers should not be given to our pregnant women so every obstetrician should have some information about the sex and sexuality during pregnancy what the physiological changes what hormonal changes are there what effect it can have on the sexual response cycle the woman sexual function is a complex interplay of physical emotional and psychological factors between the couple or partners pregnancy is a very natural phase in a woman's life both pregnancy and sexuality are natural and normal phenomena of a woman's life to be a mother is a natural instinct of every woman as you all know the pregnancy or childbirth is not a disease the couple need not be denied of sexual pleasure and happiness when pregnancy is devoid of any complications sexual relationship is part of quality of life the woman and the couple will have plenty of questions regarding sexual activity during pregnancy they feel shy and are hesitant to discuss the issue with their doctor doctors also think that it is not an issue to discuss changes in sexuality can be significant during pregnancy and in the postpartum period unless physicians are familiar with scientific data the potential for providing patients with misleading or incorrect information is great patients may rely on anecdotes old wives tales or other incorrect sources <coughs> when the woman conceives and welcomes her new bundle of joy the whole family will be preparing to welcome the new member 
the woman starts getting many advisors regarding diet, sleep, dress, travel, etc. The only advice she is not getting is about the sexual relationship. Sexual behavior depends on age, culture, relationship, physical changes, discomfort, fear of fetal damage, partner sexual function. During pregnancy, there are various hormones which have an effect on physical and mental changes that can have an impact on sexual functioning. Like progesterone, which is responsible for physical and mental changes, estrogen can affect sexual desire and function. Oxytocin can release during orgasm can cause uterine contractions. Prolactin in increased level can affect sexual desire. The psychological changes like decreased self-esteem, anxiety, fear, body image, perceived loss of attractiveness, cultural differences, myths about sexual practice, and interpersonal relationship. All these things have got a bearing on the sexuality. The physical aspects of sexuality in pregnancy, like nausea, vomiting, urinary frequency, urgency, back pain, fetal movements, breast changes, genital changes, <laughs> vaginal secretion, and abdominal girth can cause discomfort and can have a bearing on the sexual activity. Healthy sexuality is essential for good quality of life, as I told you earlier. Sexual activity, even during pregnancy, is essential for self-esteem, couple relationship, and well-beingness. To be on the safer side, it's the usual advice is that abstinence throughout the period of pregnancy. After delivery, a woman normally stays in her mother's place for 6 to 12 months with self-imposed abstinence. The side effect of abstinence during pregnancy and postpartum, that is for about two years nearly, will cause disturbed interpersonal relationship or extramarital relationship of the husband. It is a very common thing which I have seen. Every couple has plenty of questions regarding sexual relationship during pregnancy. Because of the taboo attached to sex, many couples do not consult the doctor. Many do doctors also do not think and it is an issue too. So the various questions during pregnancy, is sex during pregnancy safe? When it is not safe, can sex harm the baby? Can intercourse orgasm cause abortion or uterine contractions? Is sex drive increased or decreased during pregnancy? And what is the man's view? Hence, doctors should be aware of the sexuality concerns during pregnancy to answer the queries of the couple. Most pregnant women can engage in sexual activity throughout pregnancy in the absence of any complications. The sexual desire, libido, arousal, orgasm vary during the three trimesters. Couples should keep some level of intimacy going on throughout the period of pregnancy. This helps them to keep the relationship healthy. The sexuality or sexual relationship does not always mean only erection, penetration, and ejaculation or the penovaginal intercourse. Various other activities are all part of sexuality, which will give the mental health and then boosting the morale and also a good intimacy and companionship. Most researchers suggest sexual desire during first trimester of pregnancy decreases. And the reasons are obvious, especially if she is suffering from various other symptoms of pregnancy. Some studies indicate that it increases during second trimester. As you all know, the mid trimester is fairly comfortable period in the three trimester. Some women report greater sexual satisfaction during pregnancy. Sex during pregnancy is a low risk behavior, except when it is a high risk pregnancy or there is bad obstetric history. The psychological usefulness of the sexuality, some research studies in 1980s and 90s indicate that Overall sexual satisfaction was correlated with feeling happy about being pregnant, feeling more attractive in late pregnancy, and experiencing orgasm. The natural prostaglandin content of seminal fluid can favor the maturation process of cervix, make it more flexible, allowing easier dilatation and effacement of cervix. There is some evidence that exposure to partner semen prevents PET due to the absorption of several immune modulating factors present in the seminal fluid. During pregnancy, the fetus is protected from penetrative thrusting by the amniotic fluid and by the cervix. 
the thick mucus plug that seals the cervix helps guard against infection while orgasm may cause mild uterine contractions and also the nipple stimulation as prostaglandin in semen they are temporary and harmless so nature takes care of everything everything is there so only thing is we are assisting nature not that but the nature is always there to help us will sex be different during pregnancy many report that sex feels different during pregnancy some find it more pleasurable other feel it less pleasurable increased blood flow to the pelvic area can cause engorgement of the genitals the heightened sensation that results may add to the pleasure during sex more vaginal discharge or moistness can also help for some the genital engorgement may give uncomfortable feeling of fullness there can be mild abdominal cramps due to uterine contractions after orgasm the breast may feel tender and unusually sensitive to touch particularly in first trimester so some women may not like the breast stimulation the partner should know if anything feels uncomfortable if the woman is not enjoying intercourse the couple can indulge in mutual pleasuring hugging kissing oral sex or self stimulation couple can experiment and make adjustments if the woman is, is feeling too tired moody or nauseated then that can be avoided she may feel overwhelmed by physical and emotional changes at some point of time the libido can return in the second trimester after morning sickness and fatigue have eased up the desire can wane in the third trimester particularly is in the last month of pregnancy she may be too big or exhausted to make love she may feel self conscious about her own body she may be preoccupied with the approach of labor and birth of the child so she has to reassure her husband that she continues to love him the orgasmic function the reduction of orgasm is noted in some studies clitoral sensation may reduce during pregnancy non coital behavior like masturbation hugging kissing can be continued women likes close physical contact according to masters and johnson sexual behavior of pregnant women remains unchanged or decreased during first trimester with improved sexual function during second trimester and again a decrease during third trimester <laughs> according to bancroft sexual problems are linked to emotional and marital satisfaction so the couple should keep the lines of communication open and support each other as best as they can will sex harm the baby that is the question many couples have in their mind the baby does not get hurt by making love the thick mucus plug guards against infection amniotic fluid and strong muscles of uterus will protect the baby with orgasm baby may move around more this is because of increased heartbeat of the mother and the uterine contractions when sex during pregnancy should be avoided and you all know about all these high risk pregnancies i don't have to elaborate all these things so any high risk pregnancy bleeding toxemia and bad obstetric history all this or if there is any genital infection is it normal if there is no sex during pregnancy that another important question which women come and ask me so is it okay doctor if we don't have uh, say is there my mother says that you should have sex otherwise you will not deliver normally and so that is it okay even if we don't have intercourse yes it is normal pregnancy hormones can reduce libido if one feels positive about the pregnancy and the associated changes one can feel more sexual if the woman is unhappy or feels insecure or have relationship problems this can have a negative effect what is what is normal for one person not need not necessarily be same for the other person what is the dad's concern or partner's or dad to be's behavior man can feel as attracted as usual during the first and tri- second trimester he may feel less interested in the third trimester so le- reasons for lack of interest in the dad fears that sex can hurt the baby worries about the wife's and unborn baby's health apprehension about burden of parenthood self consciousness about making love in the presence of the unborn child so doctor should discuss the fears and concerns with the dad to be and reassure and advise him so a couples counseling becomes very important is oral sex safe during pregnancy yes normal oral sex won't harm the baby 
avoid blowing of air into the vagina. This can cause air embolism. It is also safer just kissing and licking the region. So sexual positions, when you are advising the uh, woman or the couple about the what sexual positions are safe, anything which does not involve the deeper penetration or pressure on the abdomen will not have so much of effect on the pregnancy. As the pregnancy progresses, the missionary pro position is not comfortable anymore. Woman and top gives more satisfaction, lying sideways, coming to the edge of the bed with the partner standing or kneeling in front, lying side by side in spoons position, doggy position, making love sitting on the partner's lap. So in any position, pressure on the abdomen and deeper penetration should be avoided. <coughs> So what are the various sexual dysfunctions which can happen during pregnancy? In female, as usual, it can be a reduced desire, it can be anorgasmia, or it can be even dyspareunia due to various physiological changes. Similarly, in the man, there can be decreased desire, premature ejaculation, and also erectile dysfunction. So these are some of the expected or presumed complications of coitus. That is prematurity. Studies show no relationship to uh, PROM, premature labor, low birth weight fetus. So fetal distress, no association of orgasmic uterine contractions, prostaglandins in semen, STDs have not caused any labor or fetal distress. Vaginal bleeding, deep thrusting and soft cervix, sometimes they can have postcoital bleeding. So infection, only in women with trichomonas, bacterial vaginosis, mycoplasma infection, there can be increased risk of preterm labor. Otherwise, there will be natural protection. So what about making love after birth? This is another very important thing before you discharge the uh, woman. This is another thing when you are advising her about all the other things, the rest diet, breastfeeding, and how she can be the travel and the hygiene. So another important thing is about the sexual relationship. When they can get back to the, into the, whether they um, go in for sexual relationship or not, but the advice to be given as a part of routine by all the obstetricians. So do you really have to wait? And how long you have to wait? The, the, whether it depends on the mode of childbirth, whether it can affect sexual life, whether it is natural birth, C-section, episiotomy, assisted delivery and the men's concerns earlier they used to put and husband's not little making it tight so that to avoid any lax vagina because so many of people they have come back to me after that because of the lax vagina husband is not uh, feeling happy and they are not enjoying not getting the orgasm and so many ladies I have done the tightening of the vagina also so this is another important if they say they come back they are not enjoying they are not happy Test the, the, do the examination, see whether there is any lax vagina, old tear, not uh, unhealed episiotomy. All that can be corrected and you can give her really a good life for the couple. So when is it safe to have sex after the birth of the child? Wait until the bleeding stops completely and wounds have healed. Normal involution of genital tract has occurred. One is physically and emotionally ready for sex and with the use of contraceptives. So two things about the contraceptives and the sexual relationship, the importance becomes very important. And Shobha Gudi knows very well how it has, the contraceptive advice has to be uh, given and uh, repeatedly she has been talking about that. So these are the two important things. So normally, even traditionally, culturally, you all have seen that there is a ritual formed after six weeks, that is 40 days or 42 days. In any religion you take, that is to show that the normal relation involution takes that much time and later they are ready for the sexual relationship. A small number of couples have sex in the first month after delivery. Many wait until six weeks. Most couples try sex by three months. Most studies advise to start sex six to eight weeks after delivery, either normal, caesarean, or instrumental. If one is not yet ready to have sex with sex, the other has to continue with foreplay by being physically close to each other. Because of these uh, traditional factors that the husband is uh, not at all allowed near the woman, and for so many days, uh, they will be away, they think, because those days, the abstinence itself was a major uh, contraception. That is how those uh, traditional factors also have come into effect. 
तो lack of sex desire after delivery may be because he is feeling exhausted, lack of sleep, demands of motherhood, high prolactin hormone, low estrogen, feeling low postnatal depression, fear of pain and stress. Post cesarean, it's like recovering from a major operation. So, what are the self help tips that you can give? Try just cuddling and being intimate at first. Gradually get used to being sexually aroused. Enjoy each other's company with plenty of foreplay without expecting it to lead to penetrative sex. Try lubricating gel. Initially, they can start using lubricating gel so that that can avoid lot of dyspareunia. Try making love during baby nap time. Keep doing pelvic floor exercises. This is another important advice you have to give to get back the pelvic floor muscle strength, and that will also improve the sexual functioning. If there is persistent dyspareunia, call the doctor and get help. Eat well, drink plenty of fluids, and rest whenever you can. So to have sufficient energy left with, she needs to look after herself also. So more focused research is needed regarding sexuality during pregnancy and childbirth. Most patients welcome the freedom to discuss this topic. Practical advice as a part of prenatal care should be a routine by the all the obstetrician. So if there is any problem, ask her to ask the doctor for any query or problem regarding sex during pregnancy. You can, when you directly tell her, the couple will be thankful to you, very happy, and they also start becoming comfortable talking about the issue. So, thank you very much for your patient here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, madam. Actually, it was a really enlightening talk, madam, because it's the most neglected topic. Most of us don't discuss with our patients, especially in a public sector hospitals where there are a lot of patients and there is a lack of privacy. And uh, especially, I think uh, even in India, I, I think most of uh, the obstetricians don't discuss. I think after listening to you, I think because uh, women are hesitant to ask, I think we only should initiate the topic. I think we should start advising as, as a part of uh, the antenatal advice, I think. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you for a kind introduction and also for your input. Thank you, Dr. Savita. And all the best, uh, Dr. Sadhana Gupta. For, <laughs> I thank the chairpersons, Shobagudi and Savita. Thanks a lot. Thank you, madam. Thank, uh, I thank uh, Baptist Hospital for giving me this wonderful opportunity. We thank our chairpersons, Dr. Shobagudi and Dr. Savita. And our speakers, Dr. Sardana Gupta and Dr. Padmi Prasad for that useful and informative uh, lecture. We next move on to the next session and I ask Dr. Rajneesh to take over for the panel discussion. Thank you for the opportunity. Have you lost? Thank you. Yeah, can you get all the shiny? Mm -hmm. Shall we move on? Yes. Are we ready? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. We've had two in two hours of intense uh, talks, nice talks, which has actually charged us up. We've been learning quite a lot. We'll move on to another exciting uh, part of the uh, webinar, which is uh, most awaited the panel discussion on the placenta accreta spectrum. Uh, it's my honor and uh, privilege, and on behalf of Baptist Hospital, I would like to welcome back Dr. Paili, our teacher, our mentor, and he's been always with us throughout. Dr. Paili is the senior consultant in Rajgiri Hospital, Aluwa, and his special interest is high-risk obstetrics, maternal mortality, and pelvic surgery. Sorry, sir. We missed your introduction in the first part. I'd like to welcome, welcome back Dr. Lakshmi Sheshadri, my teacher, 
my head of the department and my mentor for many, many years from the day I started uh, my medical college. And we have a very good expert panel group here. And we were expecting Dr. Lata, Dr. Uma Devi, Dr. Sushila, and Dr. Asha Kiran to join us in person. But because of the COVID uh, situation, they were unable to come. But good news is that Karnataka has raised off all the curfew, and we are back to square one. So please welcome back to Bangalore. Bangalore, the weekend is open after this webinar. <laughs> so let's go to the introduction of the session. We are going to have a panel on placenta accreta spectrum. And to my right are two of my lovely colleagues by name, Dr. Satyavani in the center, and Dr. Maria, who is uh, to her right. In the panelists, we have Dr. Lata Venkatraman. Can I have a CV, please? So Dr. Lata, she is the current, uh, current director of the South Bangalore OBGYN doctors uh, and associate. Her special interest is actually mentoring, guiding, and being a very good support to all the PGs and the doctors. Her special interests are medical disorders, vaginal surgery, and technical innovations in OBGYN. We also have Dr. K.V. Malini. She is the professor and head of department at Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee Medical College and Research Institute. Ma'am has been the, in the state advisory committee for the PCPNDT and has been the past president of BSOG. She's been organizing chairperson of ISOPA and joint organizing society uh, secretary of AICOG 2019. A senior UGPG teacher, she's also been a DNB teacher, examiner and assessor. She's a recipient of many awards, including best papers, and Achiever Awards. She's been faculty in state, national, and international conferences. Her special interests are NDVH, operative obstetrics, high-risk obstetrics, and endoscopy. Next in the panel, we have Dr. K. Uma Devi, a very senior person in the Bangalore Society. She's currently the head of the department in the Santosh Hospital, Bangalore, former professor and head of department in Ramaya Medical College. She's been a teacher for 46 years and an examiner in for MD DGO courses and a trainer for the as for MRCOG examiner. Former South Zone member representative of BCOG, RCOG, and vice president BRCOG and treasurer BSOG. Her special interests are high risk pregnancy, fetal medicine, and gynae oncology. We have also in the panel Dr. Sushila Rani. Uh, she is the director of Manjushri Specialty Hospital, consultant Vikram and Bhagwan Mahavir Jain Hospitals, chairperson postgraduate forum Bangalore OG Society, president BSOG 2006 and 2007, chapter secretary IMS, and scientific chairperson AICOG 2019. Also in the panel, we have Dr. Jyoti Shinoy. She is chief consultant in the Department of Orbs and Gynae at Manipal Hospital, Yashwantpur, Bangalore. Special interests are maternal medicine and high-risk pregnancy. And we also have, last but not the least, Dr. Asha Kiran Rathor, Associate Professor, Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute, Bangalore. Her special interests are obstetric medicine, critical care obstetrics, operative obstetrics, and medical research and medical education. Welcome all panelists to this. We are very thankful to you for your concern and for joining us during this panel. I have now hand over to Dr. Satyavani to start the panel discussion. A warm welcome to all the uh, expert panelists and our uh, dear Dr. Paili sir and Lakshmi ma'am. Uh, welcome all the delegates who are who have joined in virtually. Uh, uh, the today's panel discussion is on placenta accreta spectrum, also called as abnormally invasive placenta. Although the incidence of all causes of obstetric hemorrhage is on the decline, this is one condition which is on the rise and definitely due to the increased number of cesarean sections. 
and it is associated with significant maternal morbidity and mortality. And it is well known now that antenatal diagnosis and management of these women by a multidisciplinary team will definitely improve their outcome. So going on to, to the cases, the first case that we are going to discuss is a 26-year-old lady who came to the OPD for a regular antenatal checkup. She was a gravida 3 para 2 living 2 with previous two cesarean sections and she came at 22 weeks. She had her prior ANCs at Dodwalapur nearby and on examination she was moderately anemic. Ocitic examination was normal. She, her hemoglobin was 8 gram percent and on morphology scan there was no obvious anomalies, but she had an anterior placenta covering the os. So, Dr. Asha, do you think we need to be concerned? What are the chances of uh, placenta accreta in her and what do you think we should be doing next? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, Dr. Rajneesh and the uh, uh, team BSOG and the whole team of Baptist Hospital for the opportunity. Going with the case, uh, this patient definitely is of concern to me because she has two uh, different disorders here. Uh, previous two cesarean and a placenta previa. She definitely has a high risk of placenta accreta spectrum as high as 40%. And one more thing which is concerning is her hemoglobin is 8 grams per cent. So we have to follow her up with the anemia and we treat her anemia in the first point and also screen for a placenta accreta spectrum. So in the routine anomaly scan, when we find a woman having previous cesarean and with a combination of placenta previa or a low-lying placenta, the next step would be to do a detailed ultrasound and study the morphology of the placenta by a transvaginal ultrasound combined with color Doppler and look for signs of uh, placenta accreta spectrum. So that would be the next step which I would be uh, doing. Yeah. So as suggested, uh, we repeated an ultrasound imaging uh, at our hospital and the baby was doing fine. Uh, baby was fetus was 22 weeks and there were no obvious anomalies, but the placenta was, she had an anterior placenta previa with placenta accreta. There were multiple grade 2 and 3 lacunae present. The bladder wall uh, disruptions or, uh, were present. There was a huge placental bulge. The myometrium was thinned out. And on putting color, they were, there was a lot of uterovesical vascularity and plenty of bridging vessels were there, which were running from the surface of the placenta deep into the, deep into the, from the surface of the uterus deep into the placenta. So she had all features of placenta accreta and her placenta accreta index was of uh, nine uh, points. So what I would like to highlight here is this patient had all features of placental invasion and yet it was missed in the anomaly scan done outside. This is to highlight that uh, unless our mind knows, our eyes cannot see. And so we have to increase the awareness of this uh, condition among our uh, colleagues also, be it the radiologists or the anesthesiologists who may not be fully aware, aware about how serious the condition this is. So, Dr. Jyoti, could you uh, discuss the role of ultrasound in the diagnosis of placenta accreta spectrum? And can you please uh, uh, give us few, uh, a small uh, discussion about placenta accreta index? Yes. Dr. Jyoti? Yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, team. First of all, I would like to thank the team Baptist uh, for inviting me for the panel discussion. Uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, your radiologist was uh, uh, really good in picking up all the findings uh, related to the placenta accreta. Uh, so ultrasound, despite all the technological advances, remains <coughs> in the diagnosis of placenta accreta syndrome. Having said that, we know that uh, population studies have told us that despite all the advances we can miss in about 50 to 60 percent of the cases we may not diagnose because exactly what the uh, panelist uh, sorry the moderator told us that until unless you are looking for it you are not going to get it mm -hmm. so how are we going to solve this problem so maybe we need to do targeted yeah. focused maybe a protocol performer to look for placenta accreta features 
in patients when you are doing the scan at around 18 to 24 weeks, that is what is universally recommended. That is during the anomaly scan. So there are a number of ultrasound findings uh, that you can see. Uh, there are some findings on the grayscale, some findings on the Doppler, as well as on 3D ultrasound. But the, not all the uh, parameters can be given the same importance. So that is why we have the placenta accreta index. So placenta accreta index, basically this looks for uh, sort of risk evaluation and stratification. So if I have a tech sample patient sitting in front of me and asking me, doctor, tell me what is my baby's risk, my patients, that is my wife's risk of having placenta accreta and this index might be helpful. So it is uh, predicting the individual's risk of placenta. So this paper came out in about 2015 in the American Journal of Ops and Gynae. And in this retrospective study, they looked at patients who had more than one C-section along with the ultrasound features, along with Doppler features, suggestive of placenta accreta, and then they came out with the index. So basically it is for risk strat stratification of an individual patient. So the scope more than four had a very sensitivity, specificity, as well as a positive, as well as negative predictive value. Whereas a score of less than four, you could reassure yourself that, yes, I can deal with this particular patient. Having said that, this study was not without drawbacks. We looked at only patients who had C-section. We didn't look at patients who didn't have a C-section or who had other surgeries like DNC, myomectomy, or any other uh, factor that increased the placenta accreta uh, condition. Similarly, it was a retrospective analysis, so it was not a prospective. So again, what the mind didn't know, the eyes didn't see. Uh, another drawback of this study is uh, also that, uh, I think that, that is the main thing that I wanted to highlight here, that it is really not the machine, it is the mind that should know do, to look for placenta accreta features on the scan. And uh, recent studies have come up and saying that you can start suspecting it as early as the first trimester NT scan. So, there we go. We go to the next question. Question, Dr. Uma, ma'am, can you uh, highlight the role of MRI in diagnosis and grading of placenta accreta spectrum? Now, Dr. Jyoti has very clearly mentioned about the ultrasound features and how it is very helpful in diagnosing the placenta accreta spectrum. So ultrasound is like a gold standard in the diagnosis of placenta accreta spectrum. And uh, MRI is not going to add any additional features or any additional points to diagnose. Probably in three situations, we have to think where it may be of help. That is in a posterior placenta, where there is a PAS in the posterior placenta. We don't have the bladder interface there. So in that case, uh, uh, MRI will be helpful. And also in places where you find that the depth of the penetration and the extent of involvement of the myometrium can be better picked up by MRI. And also if it crosses to the parametrium, see the transvaginal probe can detect only what is in the middle and it cannot go lateral beyond the incision. So in those cases, MRI may be helpful, but it does not add any uh, extra values in the routine cases in an anterior placenta. So we do need not have to do an MRA in all the cases. And also moreover, MRA has got uh, the cost factor, the technical expertise needed to uh, study and properly. And maybe the same error as we uh, get in the ultrasound where we don't look for it can occur in the case of MRA also. And also sometimes we, uh, the gadolinium, even though it is supposed to be safe, it can produce some complications, neurological and immunological and inflammatory causes in the fetus and the gadolinium deposition. So it is not going to add any additional features, but I would like to say some features like a thick intraplacental bands and also the increased blood vessels in the placental base, these things, and uh, in addition, the thinning of the myometrium and uh, the heterogeneity of the intraplacenta, all these things can be picked up by the MRI, which of course, we all know that ultrasound also can pick up. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, 
Dr. Paili sir and Lakshmi madam, would you like to add your comments on the uh, diagnosis of placenta uh, uh, accreta by ultrasound and uh, MRI? Everybody in the literature says that there is no added advantage of MRI, except in the posterior placenta, where probably the ultrasound penetration may not be deep enough. So we can get an idea. In practice, what we found was that MRI adds, because we get static images, which we can see at leisure. We can argue that you can take pictures by the ultrasound also, but we have found that MRI gives a, probably a better um, delineation as well as more than anything, the sagittal image that we get with the MRI uh, will get us a better idea about the bladder outline and where to expect the bladder invasion like that. No, you muted, sir. Please. You muted uh, Dr. Pairi also. Unmute Dr. Pairi. Even though the MR, the literature as well as most of the people say that MRI doesn't add. In practice, most of the time we ask for MRI. That is true. Lakshmi ma'am, can we have your thoughts on this? Uh, um, you, I think we should remember that whatever is available in the literature, they are not based on randomized controlled trials. I mean, we everyone has only case series and everyone just writes about their experience and based on maybe uh, a, number, uh, a small number of cases. The specificity is a little low with both. I think the sensitivity will really depend on the experience of the person who is looking at it. The most important thing here is your clinical uh, what shall I say, your um, anticipation or, uh, you know, expecting or knowing that this particular patient is actually prone to having a pleasant accretor syndrome, like your typical patient of uh, two sections with anterior, etc. In a posterior placenta, it is extremely difficult to anticipate. When you see a posterior placenta, we kind of say, no, no, it's going to be all right. So, uh, think that every patient that you are, you are uh, doing an ultrasound scan on, especially in the second trimester, you have might have a accretor spectrum. With experience, with, uh, you know, with your more and more patient being diagnosed, you probably might come to depend or rely on your ultrasound scans. But practically speaking, I agree with Dr. Piley. There is an index of suspicion. There's a little uncertainty with many of us. And therefore, we end up asking an MRI. But if you are very sure, you know, with the entire case scenario, two, scenario, two previous section, there is this uh, lacune and uh, thinning of the myometrium, etc. When you're certain, an MRI probably not required. But when you're a little uncertain, I think MRI goes a long way. Because here it is very important to have a very definitive, whenever possible, or as far as possible, a definitive antenatal diagnosis. We may slowly decide to depend only on the ultrasound scan, but it will take time for us. Because no, really, no one person has adequate experience. Yeah, Dr. Piley, you wanted to say something. I may add a point. We have seen both ways, where the radiologist has said there is no accreta, the fit accreta, and vice versa also, when they were very concerned, and on table, we don't see that way. The other point I want to highlight is, we have to expect a placenta accreta in every woman who had a cesarean in the yes. past. So as a rule, what the Kerala uh, CAFO policy is, every woman who has a pregnancy following a cesarean section should have a dedicated scan at 32 weeks with the request clearly asking for, looking for the placenta and exclude a previa uh, accreta. That should be there. Otherwise, radiologists will talk all about the baby and forget to ask about the, mention about the placenta. So what we have said, one of our quality standards is every patient with pregnancy following a cesarean should have a dedicated scan at 32 weeks with a clear request in the request form to look for placenta accreta. And if, even if it is anterior and they say no accreta, such patients should be tackled only in centers with facilities to tackle an accreta placenta. That is how we put that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am.
Uh, another challenge that we face uh, while dealing with the placenta accreta is the heterogeneity of the definition. Definitions. When you're looking at the literature, you have a lot of papers where it is addressed as placenta increta or accreta or morbidly adherent placenta. Hence, to remove this uh, heterogeneity, the FIGO has uh, introduced a grading in 2019 wherein they have uh, divided it into uh, abnormally adherent placenta and abnormally invasive placenta. It is a correlation of the clinical findings and the histological criteria. So in the abnormally adherent placenta, we have the villi only going up until the superficial myometrium. And on, in such women, when you open the abdomen, you really don't find any uh, uh, findings on the surface of the uterus. But when you're looking at uh, grade 2, that is abnormally invasive placenta, the villi have gone deeper into the deeper myometrium and may have even reached the spiral arterioles. In this case, we may see... Uh, uh, increased amount of neovascularization on the surface of the uterus when it is opened. But when we look at grade 3, where the, uh, uh, the, the villi have gone deeper uh, up until the serosa, so this again has been divided into three uh, groups, into A, B and uh, C, where A, the uh, villi has reached up to the serosa, but it has not involved the bladder and the parametrium. B, where the bladder is involved, and C, where it has, the uh, placenta has invaded into the broad ligament. So with this clear classification, now uh, it would be easier to compare outcomes and also look at the prevalence and other things. So uh, now coming back to our case, so we have a gravida 3 para 2 living to at 22 weeks with an invasive, abnormally invasive, invasive grade 3 placenta, 3B, because we see that the bladder wall is also involved. So now, uh, Sushila Rani, madam, uh, what would be the challenges you would encounter in management of this patient and how would you counsel the patients and the attendants? <laughs> I think there's some problem with unmuting. No, 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 it's all right. I've unmuted myself. Yes, uh, see, we are looking at a 3B in the sense uh, this is a percreta with invasion into the bladder. And it's a case of previous two cesarean sections. Yes, this sir. woman definitely needs a tertiary care center delivery under very experienced uh, hands. So if I were to handle her in my own small hospital, then it would be very difficult. So I'll definitely shift her over to a tertiary care center where uh, proper facilities are available. This is first thing that I would tell her. The second thing is that she needs more intensive monitoring. I would get a family around and explain to her about the problems of a placenta previa, placenta per creta, that at any point of time during the pregnancy, from now till about 34, 35 weeks, she could have bleeding, she could go in for preterm labor. And because of uh, preterm delivery, there is a problem of prematurity in the baby. There could be a possibility of prematurity in the baby. And it, when it comes to bleeding, there could be a torrential bleeding without any notice. And therefore, one needs to be prepared for this. And that um, there could be, even at the time of delivery, she uh, even if it is done in the best of the institutions, there could be a possibility of heavy bleeding, a need of um, transfusions of huge amounts. And therefore, the problems of transfusion, there could be injury to the bladder and the surrounding organs. And um, that she would need an intensive care. I would also explain to her about the possible cost that she needs to expect. Even if she were to um, um, go into a government hospital, um, this is it, there are a lot of uh, physical, psychological and financial implications to this very, very high risk pregnancy. So this is what I would say. Uh, I would counsel not just the patient. It's not a question of uh, scaring the uh, mother, but it's getting the family around and getting them to be prepared for a complicated uh, pregnancy and delivery. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Pali sir and Lakshmi ma'am, would you like to add anything to what uh, Dr. Sushila has spoken? Not really to add, but to re-emphasize what she said. Conveying the seriousness to the relatives how you will do is a really delicate situation. In my first and second books, if you go through that, we have written specifically that the relatives, not the patient herself, but are told about even the potential or the possibility of death on the table. Yeah. At that time, we, our experience with management of hemorrhage was not as it is at the moment. Now I don't tell them about death, but I tell them certainly about the bladder injury, massive transmission requirements, 
as okay. well as possibly bladder injury, you know, because that is a reality when there's a bladder invasion to get that bladder free of a laceration on it is sometimes difficult. So that is how I put it. But I can tell you the same patient that you are presenting now, I have one, 22 weeks, doctor yes. couple, mm -hmm. and they were asking me, you know, it's such a problem to come. Why don't you terminate the pregnancy now itself? Yes. What will be your answer? 22 weeks. I would say that uh, terminating the pregnancy now is not going to make it less complicated as to terminating the pregnancy a little while later. At least she will have a baby on hand here. She will go through a whole lot of uh, morbidity and uh, um, 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 problems um, without even having a baby on hand. And the possibility, I mean, see, okay, we get rid of the pregnancy. Now, what about the next pregnancy? There is again a risk of uh, another uh, placenta previa, a creta. It's not really correct that if we do it now, the problem is same as if you do it at 34 or 36 weeks. Certainly, the total volume is less. And the manageability is a little less, is more than if you do it at 34, 36 weeks, no doubt about it. But I would put the same point as you mentioned, it is going to be a difficult situation even now. And so why not wait till you get a live baby? That is the way I, I have put it across to them, but I don't think they were very happy because having known that it's a placenta per creature and knowing and reading about it, they were really concerned and wanted to get rid of that pregnancy. If necessary, you take the uterus out, we have two babies before. So that was their attitude. So you have to, that, that can be really challenging. Supposing they are stuck on to the idea of getting the pregnancy terminated now, considering the fact that this is a third pregnancy and probably they have two live children, uh, we could still go ahead and terminate the pregnancy if they have understood the risks of uh, the pregnancy. Yeah, true, true, Shushila. Especially now that we are allowed to terminate up to 24 weeks, uh, we can think about that because Certainly, the risk is more if you wait till 34 weeks compared with what it is at the moment. Yeah, I think the issue becomes even more difficult if they, if it is a primary gravida or second gravida who has only one child. And anyway, you have to actually open. You're not going to be able to terminate this vaginally. And then you have to either say conservative, conserve the uterus or definitely do a hysterectomy. Whole lot of challenges. Agreed that the hemorrhage will be probably a little less compared to what it would be at 34 <coughs> weeks, but it's a very, very tricky uh, situation and I think that decision becomes very difficult. Uh, 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 regarding, I mean, what was discussed by Dr. Sushila about the uh, man counseling and management, I think the most important point here that I would like to emphasize is that be ready to shift the patient to a tertiary, refer uh, to a tertiary center if you think that your center, you cannot manage her in your center. I think that's a bottom line there. And then, of course, telling them about all the, there's a huge list of complications. How you put it across to them will really depend on how many of them can actually understand and uh, how much do you want to, you know, how, how uh, you know, uh, there, are, there, are, there are many aspects to it. But yes, all the complications must be discussed. Dr. Piley doesn't agree with me. Yes. No, sir. not that I don't agree. I want to qualify <laughs> one point that you mentioned. That's yes. about the tertiary care center, which is a tertiary care center. Yeah, I mean, the one which has all the multi, everything can, can be handled. Yeah. Usually we say that every medical college is a tertiary care center. No, no. Or no, no, every no. hospital which has a multidisciplinary team. Is. No, this has to be a place where they have specific experience of dealing with it. I think facilities, a surgeon and a urologist, minimum, these two, who have experience if possible, or at least who know how to tackle. This is a minimum. Just because this is what will happen actually later on. What we are, what I have suggested to government of Kerala is, just like in the West, we should have certified centers to tackle placenta accreta spectrum. In the whole of London, only two hospitals are allowed to tackle it. True. Why not London? Only two hospitals are allowed. In the US, if we go, if you say states may have only one or two or three centers for the whole state, because the problems are uh, so severe and uh, the cases occur very infrequently 
unless you have the expertise of managing it, somebody doing it the first time will very likely bungle on that. So I think it is time that even in our country, we designate centers which have which will tackle it, and so that they will accrue more experience and the facilities. Can I understand? Again, yeah. I agree with you, sir, completely in the sense that like you have the sharing cross, which deals with all the uh, molar pregnancies in the UK, whatever. I think um, it is high time we identify. I completely agree with Dr. Piley because this situation is something that we are going to face more and more and we need experts. You have oncologists and you have info, you know, endoscopies. I think we need to have placenta accreta spectrum specialist centers where everything is available under one roof and people know what to do. Step one, two, three, four, and whom to contact. I think that is going to be very essential and mandatory in the future. I agree with you, sir. Sorry. Uh, moving on, uh, Uma, ma'am, would you, where would you, again, coming back to the same point that uh, Pali sir was highlighting, where would you like to manage a patient with high-grade uh, placenta accreta sector? No doubt, in a center where it is a multidisciplinary team is available. There should be ICU facilities, blood bank, there should be surgeons, and there should be urologists, and even a person who is trained in a gynae oncology or who can tackle the situation of controlling the hemorrhage is very much necessary. So it should be in a center of excellence, accreta center of excellence. So the multidisciplinary team has, Pali sir and um, Dr. Lakshmi has told, experienced obstetrician, imaging experts, the surgeon, either gynae oncologist or urogynecologist, anesthetist, mostly an obstetric or cardiac anesthetist, urologist, and interventional radiologist, because in the post-operative period, sometimes we may need to take the help of the interventional radiology if there's bleeding, and neonatal care. So there should be not only for the mother, for the neonatal care also, because sometimes we have to deliver them preterm. And these are the multidisciplinary team which are needed, ICU facilities and blood transfusion. There should be availability of blood, blood products available, and which is going to be used at the time when we need the most. So it should be definitely in a center of excellence. But of course, if we miss this diagnosis, uh, every obstetrician should know how to tackle hemorrhage and probably attending to Pai Lisa's workshops, I think we can at least know how to control the hemorrhage and say shift to the center of excellence. But once we have diagnosed that it is a grade three B, we should not handle the situation in smaller places, send them to the center of excellence. I think um, if I may add on, the yes. International Society of uh, AIP, that is Abnormally Invasive Placenta, has come out with very good guidelines, actually, 2019. And it's uh, what is a center of excellence has been beautifully described. Um, so yes. it's a level five, a facility which should be available to tackle these issues. But unfortunately, most of the time it goes unrecognized in our country and the mortalities happen due to that. Um, so the scan by fetal maternal medicine specialists cannot be overemphasized actually. Thank you. Thank you, Latama. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, Dr. Malini, ma how, would you like to suggest how to proceed with the antenatal care of this patient? Um, thank you, Satya. Um, so this is a tricky situation now. She is uh, gravida three, para two, living two, and diagnosed to have a very advanced grade three uh, B, possibly grade three C. I don't know. Um, placenta accreta spectrum disorder, and she is at uh, twenty-two weeks of gestation with eight grams of hemoglobin. Okay. So the first thing is correction of, which is most important. Okay, so because it is an advanced uh, stage of uh, placent accreta spectrum, she may start bleeding any time. So I would uh, like to give her uh, injection FCM and for correction of anemia provided it is uh, uh, and efficient anemia uh, because it will uh, bring I mean uh, bring up the hemoglobin uh, faster when compared to oral iron or even. Uh, um, say uh, iron sucrose injection, 
but at the same time i would like to keep two three uh, uh, voluntary donors ready because any time she may start bleeding and then you may have to uh, transfuse blood okay so that is the first thing and i will uh, insist about the uh, regular antenatal uh, checkups so during uh, antenatal checkup you know it should be a little more frequent so first of all i find out like where she should go for example my hospital of course i don't know it is not a center of excellence but it's definitely a tertiary level hospital because i work in a medical college hospital but we have our own uh, you know shortcomings like sometimes a critical care bed may not be available nico bed may not be available we don't have interventional radiologists and things like that but other facilities yes of course they are available so i'll find out like how far she stays from the hospital so if she is uh, see many times you now people coming to government hospital they come from far away places so sometimes we do keep in uh, the patient in the hospital for longer time you know instead of uh, her coming every time and all that and if she doesn't understand like what is the um, like uh, seriousness of the situation sometimes we do keep them uh, in the hospital for longer time uh, it all depends upon the distance and uh, like her uh, uh, like uh, um how she can reach the hospital in case of emergency and things like that okay so that should be insisted upon and then uh, like uh, i would uh, like to repeat the hemoglobin maybe at uh, 24 to 26 weeks when you do the single step ogtt and uh, during each antenatal checkup of course i'll monitor the maternal health and uh, uh, the fetal growth and um, well being just by clinical examination i would like to repeat the uh, scan at 32 weeks just to you know uh, for interval growth and uh, just to see like what is happening to this uh, placenta um <clears throat> and uh, um, of course uh, like you know now she is at uh, risk for preterm delivery or any time she may need a termination of pregnancy i would like to give her a single course of uh, corticosteroids dexamethasone 6 mg a uh, four doses every uh, 12 hourly uh, and uh, this uh, the timing of steroids is a bit of a uh, controversial but i would like to give maybe after 24 weeks definitely i will give because i'll feel more safer any time uh, termination of pregnancy means we will we'll be you uh, know we will have a better chance uh, because rcog recommends that the steroid should be given after 34 weeks within say 35 to i uh, mean plus 6 days and uh, i will uh, see admission of course depends upon the as i said like it depends upon the type of patient that you have suppose she is well educated and she understands everything and everything like there are no maternal risk factors no fetal risk factors then definitely i will uh, admit her uh, maybe 3 to 4 days uh, prior to the uh, planned uh, um, management so management in this case would be uh, Uh, elective uh, cesarean section with hysterectomy with placenta in situ which is the gold standard she's already has got two living children so i don't think we should hesitate to go ahead with the hysterectomy because it is definitely a life threatening situation actually pass uh, so maybe i will admit her and the timing will be uh, i will be more comfortable if there is no no problem 35 plus Six days. That is within thirty-six days because many of the literature says that after thirty-six weeks, the risk of bleeding is more. So, provided she doesn't have any problem, I will try to pull on till thirty-six weeks. That thirty-five to thirty-five plus six days. And uh, though the RCOG recommends uh, one week a little later, uh, so. before like you know just before planning the um, uh, delivery i may be three days prior to the this thing i will advise her admission because i have to already like i have to inform the multidisciplinary team i have to, at least i can inform urologist and the onco surgeon uh, who will be able to you know manage the situation and i will not only inform that i will insist that they should be there in the ot okay many a times what we do is like we start the this thing in case it is needed we will call you no not, not that kind of a thing should not be there i will also inform the uh, blood bank officer uh, that such things you know she may need uh, uh, you know uh, massive blood uh, blood transfusion or blood product transfusion uh, uh, things so uh, i will keep everything ready and all no no torture should be informed that they should be available at that time 
Uh, thing is, I have to again, like um, Dr. Sushila has already mentioned about all the you know uh, risk that is involved uh, uh, with this kind of uh, situation. So I'll reiterate all the uh, points, and then again, I'll take a high risk consent. You know that is very important preoperatively. So. <clears throat> Uh, I'll explain like the possibility of uh, uh, injury to the surrounding structures, the massive hemorrhage, the need for uh, transfusion. So I'll take separate consent for uh, I mean, surgery as well as uh, uh, transfusion of blood and blood products. And uh, the anesthesia, usually it will be regional anesthesia, but sometimes you may have to uh, convert into general anesthesia. Once general anesthesia is given, we can't inform the patient as such anything. So I will inform her beforehand only that she may have to have the general anesthesia and uh, see sometimes it, though we have taken consent for uh, hysterectomy it may not be possible to do the hysterectomy because it's already grade 3 b or grade 3 c in such a situation i may tell her that i may uh, leave the uterus behind because she should not ask me like, you know, you had taken the consent, but you are not done the hysterectomy later on, right? So maybe that consent also should be explained. Of course, uh, uh, sir has told, like, you have to go up to, like, you know, maternal death also. Sometimes you have to explain the risk of that. Uh, um, <clears throat> okay, I'll try the 12 table. I'll yes. try. Excuse me? Not talk from, from one of the delegates. Thank you, ma'am. Um, no, 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 no. One, one more thing is before shifting the preoperative preparation, no, definitely yes. I will uh, tell the urologist that this is the situation. So maybe like uh, he may plan for uh, ureteric stenting because this is a, a situation where it may be useful. And I don't have an interventional radiologist, but if it is, he is available, maybe he can put an intra-arterial uh, uh, catheter also for ballooning or, or embolization or whatever. Uh, and of course, like uh, before shifting, I'll give her antibiotics and keep tranexamic acid ready because just after the anesthesia, you can give tranexamic acid also to prevent the blood loss. So I think, uh, yeah, that is it. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. So uh, moving on, in this case, her anemia was corrected. Count the patient and the attenders were counseled about the seriousness. The donors were arranged, steroid prophylaxis was given, the growth was monitored, the fetus was growing well, but the, the placenta seen, the vascularity in the placenta was increased and there was a suspicion if it was spreading into the parametrium. Of course, we couldn't do a MRI on her because of the cost constraints and the uh, multidisciplinary team had met and uh, we had a case consultation as to who will be there on the day of the planned proposed surgery. And we plan to deliver her at around 35 weeks. Can I, before we go on, can I ask a question yes. to uh, the yes. panelists and Dr. Piley? When would so, you actually give the steroids? I mean, it's all right to say I will give it any time from 24 to 34 weeks or even 36 weeks. That's not the controversy I'm entering into. In somebody who is, you, we have diagnosed, um, when are you going to administer steroids? They need it because you're going to definitely deliver them by 34, 35 weeks. I, think I personally is... thought I would, um, I personally that thought I mean. would uh, delay it uh, till say a few days before the planned surgery if they have no problem. On, whereas if they have significant issues because of which we are considering an early delivery, I might give it at that time. I don't know whether everybody agrees with me. Yes, I just yes. I, I also agree with you, madam. Uh, so if there is a risk of a threatened pre I mean, like a preterm labor, sometimes, you know, even the cervical length, some people don't believe in that on predicting the preterm labor, but she is at a risk for preterm labor. So if there's such a thing, uh, any uh, um, uh, such uh, alarming situation is there, then you can give steroids at that time. Otherwise, you can delay yeah. it. Or if there Dr. Piley, do you agree here. with me? Doctor, this is central Doctor. placenta previa. If it is a central placenta previa, yeah. then probably I would give it around uh, 28 to 30 weeks uh, once. And then, you know, if she does go in for... Uh, an emergency surgery at any point that she goes in for her emergency surgery, I would give her a rescue dose. Um, otherwise, uh, if it is just uh, anterior placenta previa, which is dipping into the lower segment and things like that, then probably, you know, I would uh, prob probably delay it till about 30 to 34 weeks. Okay. 
um, um, Sushila, uh, I was just thinking, uh, an, uh, an accurator is very, I mean, is, um, unlikely I would think, is unlikely less to likely bleed. to bleed so early. Yes. So, yes. Uh, and it is probably, I'm going to be anterior and not really sitting there and covering the eyes. Um, I don't know. I mean, I agree with you. This, this really has to be, you have to play by ear. Dr. Piley, you were going to say something. Yeah. Sorry. We usually try to give at 28 to 30 weeks. And then, okay. and added those. suppose she could carry the pregnancy till 34 weeks, one shot just prior to uh, the previous day. Uh, one, just one more injection. That is our protocol. Uh, Why so? Why so? Because at 28 to 30 weeks, because in case you are forced to deliver at uh, 30, 31, 32 weeks like that without sufficient time to get the lungs mature at that point, that is why we give early. The other problem- Does that happen give, often? Does that happen often? Uh, it has, it has actually. Uh, and this concept that I have heard many of our seniors also saying that placenta accreta, if it is a real accreta, it will not have APH. No, absolutely wrong. They can have. The accreta area may not bleed, but the rest of the placenta may bleed. Yeah. So you can have APH, I mean, developing placenta previa also can bleed, accreta placenta also can bleed earlier. We have had occasions yes. to go in earlier in this patient particularly you have to be careful because you see the vascularity around the bladder yes there's occasionally risk of bleeding into the bladder and now you are told that she is starting to have this extending to the parametrium more frightening than actually dealing with the bladder is parametrial extension so in these respects i would give a 28 to 30 weeks to be sure in case i have to take her up early and if she doesn't throw up bleeding before our plan date, and I would prefer to take her at 34 rather than wait till 35, 36. Okay, right. that I agree. I agree with that. Okay, uh, so yeah. I think that is that is probably. I mean, I just wanted the postgraduates to have a take home, uh, you know, definite uh, protocol as to when to give the uh, steroid <laughs> and not think that you know this huge range between 24 and 34 weeks. No, it is. You, let us say the protocol should be that you give a dose between 28 and 30 weeks yes. and a rescue, like Dr. Sushila said. Sounds sounds like a plan. Thank you. There are repeated uterine contractions. You know, she gets abdominal pain and now and then spotting. <coughs> or the cervix is short also. So we yeah, anticipate that time you have to give. Yeah, then maybe uh, depending on that, we may have to give it a little earlier. Yeah, Satya. They are symptomatic. Uh, uh, Dr. Sushila Rani, can you uh, discuss the informed consent and the type of anesthesia and the preparedness that is needed in this case? Uh, like I said, you know, the, um, the consultation, the entire conversation that happens even during the antenatal period needs to be recorded. That, uh, that is also a kind of a legal document that is required because you don't know when she will be again. And the consent uh, might be difficult to take in a uh, situation of emergency. During, uh, if we have a planned surgery or whenever we take her up for surgery, Apart from the usual consent for surgery that we take, this is a situation where you tell her all the possible complications that can happen during surgery. And uh, the, 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 for example, you know, the excessive bleeding that can happen, the additions that can be there, difficulty in delivering the baby, and the possibility of a uh, uh, um, um, humongous amount of blood that might be needed at the time of surgery possibility of injury to the bladder, especially in this case, and sometimes to the surrounding structures. And um, um, I, I also you need to take a consent, uh, now detailed consent for anesthesia. It is a, a part of the consent form that you tell them about the uh, consent for anesthesia. Sometimes you may need to put in a, a central catheter that also needs to go in the consent for anesthesia. And um, also a consent for an ICU admission also needs all these have to be explained clearly in their own language and uh, consumer. Anesthesia concerns, yes, like, you know, um, because we will need to transfuse huge volumes here, uh, we need to take care to put in a wide bore uh, um, IV cannula, say 14 or 16, or sometimes you might even need to put a central uh, cannula just to be prepared. And um, epidural analgesia, it, it, I would leave it to the anesthetist are comfortable with an epidural analgesia, fine. Otherwise, probably a general anesthesia. It also depends upon the 
habitus tu putih, you know, whether the how the neck is, etc. So if the, the, the anesthesia part of it is the decision that needs to be taken by the anesthetist after doing all the rest. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, so, Sati, can I add on? Uh, sorry, sure, ma'am. Sure. Okay. Can I add on? Sure, sure ma'am. Yeah, yes, I think a case conference is very important. Everybody yes. should be on the same board. I think yes. a case conference around 30 weeks, if she hasn't, ha hasn't had any antecedent problems, could be probably around 30, 32 weeks can be uh, had. And all the <clears throat> preparations uh, from uh, the anesthetist side, obstetrician side, everything should be done. Yeah. I agree with you, Lata. Uh, I agree. Uh, so, it, uh, uh, yeah, better, probably. The multidisciplinary and the consent can be taken, and it is better if it is a recorded, video recorded. That's one. And also, I think intra arterial blood pressure monitoring is important. And also, CVP might not be always required. But IABP is quite useful, um, especially if we are giving a regional uh, with the preparedness to convert into the GA. There's some background noise, no? Or yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 One of the participants is taking the uh, thing from outside, I guess. So I think that is, we are trying to sort that out. Uh, moving to our case, uh, she, uh, she presented with mild labor pains at 34 weeks. So as Dr. Parini mentioned, you should have posted her at 34 weeks and then probably you would have avoided this emergency admission. So now Dr. Akshakiran, what are the preparations you would want to do before the surgery? I think majority of it has been already discussed by our uh, uh, experts. And just to complete the, uh, for completion sake, could you just reiterate a few points? Uh, yes, so now this patient has come in an emergency situation, so it is an unscheduled uh, delivery. So we have actually very less time for the preparation in such a scenario. Um, so ideally, the, such a kind of a scenario shouldn't happen. Uh, so first thing I would do is alert the anesthetist so that they get time to do a pre-operative evaluation. And I would check on the availability of blood and blood products, which is most important because time is very less. I would be posting her for a emergency cesarean section in a very short time. I would alert the neonatologist and to a minimum, I would alert the urologist. Urologist role is very important here because uh, it is a percreta placenta invading into the uh, bladder. Uh, so apart from all these, I would also want to do a preoperative ultrasound so that I get to know exactly where is the upper margin of the placenta and uh, maybe I'll keep the ultrasound machine in the uh, OT itself so that I can re-emphasize uh, the findings intraoperatively uh, to localize the margin of the placenta because uh, that is the most important step when, uh, uh, when it comes to avoiding the major obstetric hemorrhage. And uh, next thing I would do is I would talk with the attenders again. Of course, this patient is well counseled and well prepared throughout antenatally. But again, I would re-emphasize everything uh, which has already been told to the attenders. And also, I would uh, tell all the options of management which can happen with the patient. Because there is no one formula uh, uh, where we can manage the pass disorder. So what we are exactly going to do is determined only by the intraoperative findings. Uh, so uh, I would uh, give keep all the options open of hysterectomy, uh, expectant management, conservative management, and the same will be explained to the patient. Thank you. Uh, so since this was a, a grade 3B with suspicion of grade C, we planned for a internal catheterization. Uh, but however, as uh, uh, Sir has emphasized this, that it is rarely useful in this patient, what happened was they could place a balloon on one side and on the right side they couldn't do it because uh, 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 the anatomy was not favorable. So it only added to the cost and it was a lot of major uh, help in our uh, in this case. And the fetal heart was good after the procedure. And so uh, Dr. Yeah, Jokisha, even, the, even the literature uh, uh, 
is not very convincing about preoperative pelvic devascularization, either in the form of radiological intervention or uh, some uh, authors also say that uh, before actually proceeding with the hysterectomy, we also can do an internal iliac artery ligation as a prophylaxis. But the results of internal iliac artery ligation will, would be similar to the radiological measures which we use to occlude the uh, internal iliac uh, vessels. So both are actually controversial and uh, right now there is no much uh, strong evidence in its support. Uh, Dr. Jyoti, would you like to discuss the role of internal iliac balloon occlusion? I, I heard that you've had a case series on uh, uh, women managed with internal iliac occlusion. So could you elaborate on that please? Uh, I would agree with Dr. Asha and especially after listening to Dr. Piley's talk, I am tempted to say there's absolutely no role for internal iliac balloon occlusion, but having benefited, reaped the benefits of uh, using interventional radiology management for the treatment of placenta equita disorder, placenta previa and PPH, I would say there is a role, but it has to be decided on the case to case cases. So I won't say one formula fits all. So what is the idea yes. of balloon occlusion is basically you're placing these uh, intra-arterial catheters via the femoral on either side internal iliacs so that when the need arises, that is after the baby is delivered, you're occluding this, reducing the pressure and carry on with what you intended to do. But unfortunately, the balloon occlusion, if you go through the literature, there is only one thing that comes up repeatedly controversial. We can't recommend it. RCOG says the same, ACOG says the same. Why? Because balloon occlusion is not something that can be taken lightly. So there are two varieties of balloons that are available. One is a compliant balloon, another one is a non-compliant balloon. Nowadays, luckily we have compliant balloons that have reduced the risk of thrombus formation as well as uh, uh, trauma to the vessel. It's a non-compliant balloon that increases the risk of trauma to the vessel, thrombus formation and the risk associated with it. Yes, we did have somebody not in our branch, in some other branch of Columbia Asia previously, where the patient had a balloon occlusion for a placenta accreta spectrum disorder. No, no, she'd had just a placenta <coughs> free, had multiple myomectomies in the past where they expected trouble due to additions and this was kept on standby and they did utilize the services and unfortunately patient did have thrombus. So that is about balloon occlusion. But what about embolization? I have no doubt in my mind that embolization has played an important role in reducing the bleeding in patients with the placenta previa. When it comes to placenta accreta syndrome, we can't say that it is the same benefits, but there is definitely benefit in reducing the bleeding in patients with placenta accreta syndrome as well. Let's see in what conditions we can benefit uh, use the benefits. So basically you have a patient who is pregnant for the first time. She's got placenta previa, suspected placenta accreta, she's not going to let go of that uterus easily. She is keen on conserving the uterus. In such cases where you are thinking of retaining the uterus, that is intentional retention of the placenta, or you have a patient where the placenta previa accreta syndrome is focal. It is not diffuse. The whole uterus is not involved. You can actually remove the placenta in piecemeal and utilize the benefits of the internal iliac embolization. Another case where actually the triple P procedure, we, we are all aware of that. And uh, uh, Edwin talks about uh, pelvic devascularization stepwise. Uh, another case, let's forget about these situations. You have planned, you, everything is planned and you're planning to do a cesarean hysterectomy. Unfortunately, you go inside, you can only deliver the baby. There's nothing that is visible other than the fundus of the uterus, you deliver the baby and it is all, it's kind of plastered, nothing you can do other than you call the intervention radiologist, you don't have to place the balloons before, you can, you can actually use the internal, sorry, the femoral catheter and go for the internal iliac, embolize the vessel, close and come out hoping that this is an unintentional retention of the placenta that you're dealing with, but we don't have any other option. Under such circumstances, embolization is definitely useful. There is no doubt about it. A third case scenario, you've done the cesarean hysterectomy, you, you, you've done everything possible, and maybe we use the aortic clamp or whatever we have used and we got on with the case. But unfortunately, when you release the clamp, you realize that there is a nagging bleeder deep in the pelvis. You're really, really not able to see where it is bleeding. Neither you can ligate nor you can cauterize. 
my intervention radiologist will definitely help me in embolizing these vessels. It is not easy. The vessels that we deal with in placenta accreta syndrome, they're not simple vessels because they, they're like parasitic leeches. They extract the, 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 the vessels come from virtually every other artery in the pelvis. So they are not going to be, you can't embolize one vessel because it's a collateral that is supplying the vessel. So it is not going to be easy, but every attempt can be made to stop the bleeding on table before the patient is shifted to ICU. Another rare situation is, I think Dr. Uma mentioned about it, that you've done everything possible, bleeding is under control, you left to drain post-operatively, you realize that within two hours, the drain is full of blood and you're worried. Yes, the interventional radiologist can come and help you embolize the vessel. And many cases, they have helped us in embolizing these vessels. So there is no doubt about it. But what is the problem with the, uh, putting the femoral artery catheter in patients where you're dealing with the placenta accreta syndrome? The problem is that you have a placenta accreta a spectrum disorder. Actually, you are actually into the bladder and you want the urologist. The urologist wants the patient in a lithotomy position. The, the interventional radiologist is not at all happy. He's saying that you cannot bend my leg. I am going to be in trouble if, you, if I leave the catheter here and you're going to put the patient's legs in lithotomy, modified lithotomy position. It is very difficult. Practically, you will have difficulties in dealing with these patients. Although my intervention radiologist, the other way is saying that, Madam, nowadays they do the coronary angio through the radio, so we can try that. Well, we have not attempted it yet, but if the need arises, we should be able to deal with it. The cost is an important factor. It is not going to be uh, uh, easy to afford these facilities, but it's the cost of life versus the cost of embolization. I would take cost of embolization is definitely something that we can at least we could speak to the management and get some discounted uh, procedure done for the patient to benefit the patient. So to summarize, embolization has a role. On a case-to-case -case basis, we can decide. Occlusion, probably not because of the associated complication. Embolization is not without complication. Sometimes you can have non-target embolization. That is, you've gone to embolize one vessel, but you, the emboli has gone somewhere else and caused bladder necrosis, it can cause some other, uh, some other embolization, some other vessel can get thrombosed and cause complications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alisa, could you uh, uh, talk about the techniques of reducing blood loss in the perioperative period? Unmute yourself, sir. Yeah. Did you ask me or? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I think we mentioned this in the morning in my talk as well. Yes. The first thing I want to comment on is that certainly there is a place for help from the interventional radiologist in certain situations. But my concern is, first of all, about the internal iliac artery occlusion. Here is a patient who has got a placenta, which is removing after the anterior placenta. Is the sound still the sound from my side? I don't think so. No, no, they are trying to sort it out, sir. Okay. Uh, but you can hear me. Yes, yes. We can yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Internal iliac artery ligation alone or even occlusion alone may not take care of the entire blood supply. As of Chris was rightly said, the blood vessels come from all over the place. Yes. But there's a definite risk of the anterior abdominal wall over the bladder going on to the anterior uterine wall. And that is why the inferior epigastric artery also has to be blocked. We actually started experimenting with internal iliac artery ligation prior to tackling the placenta and miserably failed. That is why we worked on how to occlude the vessel above that. We started with the common iliac artery. And inadvertently, then we found that occluding the lower end of the iota is easier than even occluding the common iliac artery, which has to be done on both sides. So that's it. In this patient, I would prefer to block the common iliac, balloon the common iliac, or even the lower end of the iota rather than the internal iliac for the reason which I mentioned, because that will not help us to occlude the inferior epigastric, which may supply over the bladder to the, um, to the uterus. That's the first thing. Second thing, at the end of the procedure, many times, if you're not happy with the hemostasis in the pelvis, we do come out with occluding the internal iliac artery, tying the internal iliac artery on both sides. I haven't used interventional radiology yet, but instead of tying the internal iliac, which is actually not that difficult um, when you have the open abdomen in front of you, uh, instead of that, you can think about interventional radiology, but interventional radiology has, as you already heard, 
its own limitations and problems and cost involved. And that is another problem there. So to be uh, frank, I would think about putting the uh, op abdomen open and then put either the common iliac arteries on both sides or the common iliac or the internal uh, iota blocked first, then proceed with the surgery. And at the end, when we are finished, if the hemostasis is not satisfactory at the bladder base, I may go and do a bilateral internal iliac artery blocking. Okay, sir. Thank you so much for those uh, uh, tips. Now, moving on to the case, she was posted for an emergency cesarean followed by a cesarean hysterectomy, which is, of course, the way forward in this lady. On opening the uterus, we found multiple, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, profound vascularity. Also, the placenta was seen bulging through, and we could see the placenta through the serosa. So, uh, Dr. Lata, ma'am, what are the options for management in this patient, and what is the preferred approach? <clears throat> I think it's very important to decide whether you are going to leave the uterus behind or take it out. I think, I mean, if you um, already, uh, this lady has been planned for cesarean hysterectomy, um, as I gather. Okay. So the abdominal, I mean, well, obviously it's a MDT and um, um, the all the um, senior, um, um, anesthetic senior obstetrician um, and also vascular surgeon if required or interventional radiologist, um, et cetera. And also the blood, all these should be available in theater. And uh, regarding the abdominal incision, even before we put the incision, I think it's important uh, that we give a gram of tranexamic acid, IV, um, so there is uh, enough evidence, uh, evidence from women's trial. So I think that should be followed here also. Abdominal incision, um, vertical incision may be more comfortable, but it's not always a recommendation. Even male art incision can be done or lower abdominal transverse incision with partial muscle splitting. All these can be managed. One more thing that I find as an advantage with MRI is sometimes uh, MRI can give you an idea about uh, the adhesions. Um, I did take a vertical abdominal incision on a lady who had um, the uterus adherent in the lower part to the rectus along with these vessels penetrating through the rectus um, muscle and fascia. So it was very useful that the MRI had showed us that and I could take a vertical incision. So MRI may be useful in detecting adhesions and if there are significant adhesions, maybe a vertical abdominal incision might be preferred. Otherwise you could tackle it with um, transverse incision also. Again, it depends on the expertise of the surgeon um, and also what I mean, the assistance, et cetera, et cetera. So um, classical incision um, to um, uh, um, deliver the baby, there should be a clear margin between the placenta and your incision. So there should be a clear uh, um, amount of myometrium between the placenta and the incision. So classical incision, delivery of the baby and closing the um, incision before we tackle um, the history, I mean, we go on to the hysterectomy. So we should avoid, in my view, we should avoid oxytocin because the placenta, if it is not fully accreta, it can start separating and there can be torrential bleeding. So oxytocin can be avoided. You have to, I mean, again, weigh the pros and cons if, um, um, if there is um, a significant bleeding, then you think the uterotonics are going to control it. Maybe you could, but protein use of oxytocin should be avoided. And you would close the uterine incision, as I was mentioning, and get on with the hysterectomy. But what we have done in the last few cases that we have had is we just clamped the internal iliacs on both sides, we clamped them. 
uh, I know it might be slightly cumbersome compared to common iliac clamping, but um, uh, all the complications associated with internal iliac ligation or embolization will be avoided by just clamping and releasing the clamps at the end of the procedure once you are happy with the um, uh, uh, hemostasis. So, uh, and also I do use a swab on a stick. People say that they have to be placed in lithotomy and the urologist might not like it. Um, I'm sorry, the interventional radiologist might not like it, but the urologist might need it, etc. But probably uh, keeping slightly the legs apart um, and also putting a swab on a stick into the vagina can give us a fair idea about where the cervix is ending and where the vault is. And also, I mean, keeping the legs apart um, might itself give us uh, enough space to see whether there is significant vaginal bleeding. So these are the few things that I wanted to say about the incision and also a few precautions that you take during surgery and how you get on with hysterectomy. Um, conservative management, I think there are very few indications when future fertility is definitely desired. And if there is going to be torrential bleeding, for example, if the parametrium is involved, et cetera, you don't want to sort of as far as possible touch her because it might cost her life. And if you have found this PAS unexpectedly at cesarean section, maybe it is safer just to leave the placenta and close it and come. Or if there is um, focal accreta, obviously a, an excision and um, uh, I wouldn't say conservative, but excision of that area of the uterus and removal of the placenta could be done. So I think conservative management because of the complications associated, especially in our country, maybe it has a limited role apart from these indications that I mentioned. Um, so would that answer your questions? Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Sir, uh, your thoughts on uh, the challenges during surgery? Sir, please unmute yourself. Leda already mentioned to us some of the practical issues. And the first thing is whether you would put a urinary catheter. I would prefer to put urinary catheter prior to abdominal incision in this case, because palpating and knowing where the urinary is a bit help when we think about for the dissection of the bladder. So that's the first thing. And that incidentally will give you an idea by the cystoscopy how much the bulge is into the bladder or how vascular it is and all that. The type of incision on the abdomen is another critical point to decide. I had been doing all along only vertical incision because that gives us freedom to esterize the uterus and the added problem that was just mentioned and occasional is previous to cesarean. It is not all that rare that you just may be stuck to the anterior abdominal wall and you go down with a transverse incision, you really had it. So if an MRI has shown you any chance of addition to the anterior abdominal wall, certainly go by a vertical incision and warn the patient that you may go well above the umbilicus also. And uh, once you have gone into the abdomen, as was shown in that image here, there's a really uh, frightening scene that you get when you open up abdomen. And the first thing is to get that baby without disturbing the placenta. So for that, you have to put an incision well above the placenta. But if you are planning to do conservative surgery as and more and more people now advocate, you may not be able to go well above the placenta because that may be an incision on the fundus of the uterus or even on, onto the posterior wall of the uterus. You can do that, but if you do that, then again, if you are conserving that uterus, you have a fundal incision of the uterus and a part of the lower segment already gone along with the placenta in this case. So whenever possible, what I would now plan to do, not many, only one case so far done, plan to do is after knowing where the upper border of the bladder is, well above that, where the vessels are seen vertically running, we may coagulate them and put an incision above that transversely, which may not be above the level of the placenta, but that placenta is not accreta there. So you can go to the membrane level, break it and get the baby through that 
as soon as possible, as soon as your baby taken the baby out with the trans abdominal clamp that I have shown you, put clamp for both the uterine arteries, sterilize the uterus and go and clamp either the common iliac artery or the aorta and thereafter we can breathe normally because until then every second she is bleeding, going to be bleeding more. Having got the baby delivered, if it is for a hysterectomy already decided, which I will take more favorably in this patient because this is a third pregnancy and three babies, I would say, I would not try to take risk of keeping a uterus for the sake of keeping the uterus and take a risk of secondary bleeding and all that. So in this patient, I will more favorably think about hysterectomy. But in somebody say, as you said, previous one baby lost, only one baby alive or no baby alive, you have to retain the uterus, I will take this sort of a risk. Esterize the uterus, put clamps on the major vessel, whichever you have chosen, aorta if possible, otherwise two common iliac arteries, and then you decide whether you are going to do a hysterectomy or whether you are going to take the placenta out, segmental resection, or if it is a really parametric invasion too much on opening the abdomen, you have to think about the possibility of getting the baby out without disturbing the placenta and Secondary hysterectomy, as was mentioned by Leda, is not a bad option because after two or three days, even when you go in, the torrential nature of the bleeding will be much less than when you approach with the placenta, the active placenta there in situ. Now, the most difficult thing is to get that bladder separated away, down, and go to a level below the level of the placenta. I don't go to do a total hysterectomy in these cases. My aim is only to see that the bladder is pushed down enough so that we can go to the lower level of the placenta, at that point transverse clamping and do a subtotal hysterectomy and come out. In that process, we have to clamp the uterines on both sides. That is where the ureteric catheters help us. We can palpate and feel where it is, avoid clamping that, stay medial to that, and then go down and do that. Having said that, it may sound very simple, okay, you can manage like that. It can be extremely difficult, especially if it has gone to the parametria. Now, the other point about bladder injury. Bladder injuries usually happen at the level of the previous scar where the addition is maximum. And at that point, the, blood, the holy bulb in the bladder will help you to identify the border of the bladder. So when you put a holy catheter in the beginning, make sure the catheter bulb is free to move inside the bladder so that you can bring it up and see the outline of the bladder there. And that will help us to know the bladder. And whatever, the other thing to keep in mind is bladder, we can use the green almond touch type of clamps so that it will not crush it, but at the same time, temporarily reduce the bleeding. When you are separated the bladder and if you are successful in completing the um, hysterectomy, before you get out, when you release the clamps, you will see if there are bleeders which are very likely at that point, you may have to sometimes even reclamp and then taken care of with mattress stitches, the bladder waste bleeders on the vaginal surface or the cervical surface or the bladder wall itself and then only come out. A drain in these cases is a must because very often there will be subsequent bleeding, which will give you an idea if there's a drain. So these are a few practical points which I thought I would share with you. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, sir. Uh, in this case, as suggested, we delivered the baby by uh, classical cesarean section, uh, by breach. Cesarean hysterectomy was planned and we proceeded with that. And uh, during the uh, completion of the hysterectomy, bladder had to be opened to ensure complete removal of the placenta. The total blood loss was about 3 to 3.5 liters and the drains were placed and patient was shifted to the uh, ICU. So, uh, Uma ma'am, could you discuss about the complications we would encounter in the post-operative period? If this patient had a cesarean hysterectomy and uh, we are very sure that she would have received massive blood transfusion, blood products, and also prolonged surgery, and also sometimes overloading of the fluids also can occur. So, uh, here the complications which can occur in the post-operative period are she can have one due to the blood transfusion itself, due to the overloading of the fluids. And also when the, we are trying to arrest the bleeding, we might not have completely arrested and there may be sometimes a bleeder which can bleed later on when the blood pressure picks up. 
so there could be some bleeding also so we have to be ready to uh, shift her to the icu where we have all the facilities for monitoring her carefully and also for detecting pulmonary edema diagnosing early and management and she can also get a transfusion associated lung injury so all facilities should be available so we can anticipate this in the post operative period bleeding we can anticipate and in addition she is a candidate for a thromboembolism thrombosis and thromboembolism so we should be ready in those cases where there is no excess bleeding and we have done a prolonged surgery after um, um, about 6 hours we can give her um, anticoagulants so these complications should be anticipated in the patient in the post operative period so uh, this patient she received blood products but uh, in about 3 to 4 hours we noticed that she was collecting inside and the drains were uh, collecting blood so a pre-laprotomy was done and the hemostasis was secured. So as mentioned by Dr. Uma ma'am, one of the important learning points here was the importance of the blood pressure at the closure. Although the monitor on the uh, was showing a BP of 100 by 70, the minute the patient was shifted to the critical care unit, her BP was only uh, around 80 systolic. So it is important that they have an intra-arterial line placed and uh, the BB uh, measurement or the monitoring happens by an intraarterial line. And uh, once the uh, she had uh, uh, she was her BP picked up with the uh, uh, drugs that she started using, so she had to be taken up again, and the bleeders had to be tackled. And all in all, she received uh, 10 RDPs and uh, FPFPs and uh, uh, right, right, pack cells, and uh, she recovered well, and she was discharged on the ninth post-operative day. Now, yeah, can I just one question? Yes, yes. Uh, in this lady, you had mentioned that you had put the internal iliac, sorry, internal iliac uh, balloon catheters were in place, isn't it? So, so this is the place where I would use it in the post-operative period. If it is left inside with the small dose of heparin infusion, we can use it to block those vessels without taking her back to the theater. And we yeah. have done it. Yeah. And Actually, it's if, uh, if, if you had, uh, if, when I presented, I told you that the uh, internal alia could be catheterized only on one side. The other that side matter was... at all. That is what I want to stress here that you don't have to catheterize both sides. When we do the routine interventional radiology procedure, we go through only one side, and that same catheter can be taken to both sides, and you can embolize virtually every vessel in the pelvis with one catheter. Only when you're putting the balloon, you want to but you want to occlude both the internal iliacs. That's why you should put it on both sides. Otherwise, it is really not required. One catheter is more than sufficient and leaving it for 24 hours is something that is recommended and done routinely world over is very valuable because having put it, we should have utilized the services of that interventional radiology so that this lady would have, we would have avoided relaparotomy for her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. For another, yes, sorry. Another uh, small thing to share. Um, if we are not very happy with the hemostasis, I think pelvic tamponade can be created by using Bakri balloon and bringing it out through the vagina. I mean, the, uh, the limb of the Bakri balloon through the vagina. So Bakri balloon can give a good tamponade. And a couple of times we had to do it when we hadn't used um, the uh, balloons. Yes, I agree with you, Jyoti, that uh, balloons... Uh, yeah, should be left very useful, for very 24 useful. hours and yeah, yes, yes. It, they could come to our rescue if there is yes, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Uh, in the case of your aortic clamp, uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. In the case of an aortic clamp, um, you probably release the clamp at the end of the surgery, check if the hemostasis is made sure, etc. Now, we would be uh, supposing we are operating under epidural analgesia. And um, there is some amount of hypertension already there, and we have released the clamp. Post-operatively, isn't there a possibility of uh, the pressures coming up and therefore uh, uh, bleeding again from some vessels which have not bled before during the time of surgery? You are probably asking me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. That possibility is there, as not only particularly when you are using the aortic clamp in any situation, as was mentioned, the patient is not to back to the normal blood pressure or even otherwise some vessels can be in spasm and later on open up. So that risk is always there. So what we try to try to take care is the back side of the bladder, which is the site of the bleeding maximum. We usually make sure that we just 
clean that area to avoid any vessel remaining in thrombus. And any doubt, we actually do bulk stitching of that uh, the wall of the bladder, you know, per string, like the one that we do placental bed, like that. Even if you have a bleeder as such, you can coagulate it. In this particular patient, um, uh, I don't know who it was commenting on the Invest Radio. Was it uh, Jyoti or? Uh, yes, Dr. Jyoti. Yes. Jyoti, I mean, the right side could not be cannulated. That is what I understood because the anatomical problems. Yeah. So in that yeah. case, you think um, embolization will be okay? Will yeah, be absolutely, okay? absolutely, Dr. Piley, because you, the, the idea with the intervention radiologists, they want to go as proximal to the bleeder as possible. But if it is not possible, they could actually, if they, as long as they avoid the major vessels, and the targeted vessel embolization is what they would want to do because there are fine catheters available because when we have vaginal bleeders, sometimes the bleeders are so, so fine, but their arterial bleeders, they have fine catheters because having worked with them for over a period of time, uh, virtually no vessel uh, is left behind without embolization. Working with that, uh, an eminent radiologist, intervention radiologist like Dr. Indushekar, I've never seen him fail because I worked in UK and it used to take a long time for them to embolize these vessels. It would take an hour or so. I have seen Dr. Indushekar embolize the vessel in a lady who came with pelvis full of blood in about 10 to 15 minutes. It's like one of those things. And the, surge, uh, the, the obstetrician who accompanied the patient said that this looks like a hi-fi sci-fi movie because it is possible, but you need to be in a center of excellence where they have an, a, a, an excellent interventional radiologist. We have a team of doctors, lucky for us, and uh, they can embolize. Yes, they can. Even yeah. if the catheterization is not possible, they may not be able to go to the uh, particular vessel, but slightly proximal to that, they can embolize and uh, find catheters. That is what is important because you can't use with the routine catheters that we use in a, an obstetric because they, they use uh, fine catheters for embolizing small, small vessels anywhere in the body. And those catheters can be useful. Certainly, I, um, if we can avoid a real apparatomy with an embolization, that is to be preferred, no doubt about it. Um, yeah, we had also one case with Dr. Indushekar had come years back to our hospital and this patient had a bleeder after the internal iliac artery ligation also she had bleeding from the vaginal arteries so he went through the opposite side and he negotiated through all the vessels through as dr jyoti rightly said yes, so a good sir. interventional okay. radiologist yes, definitely absolutely. absolutely can do wonders yes the same dr indu shekar only yeah, yeah absolutely yes yeah, the only difficulty is you don't get that in the <laughs> that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think these are these procedures are so operator and expertise dependent mm -hmm. that uh, yeah, you know, you will have to really decide depending on what we are dealing with and what we have on our hand. Yeah. yeah. There was some, what expertise is available. Some discussions in the chat box about leaving the placenta. There are two things. What I mentioned and what Leather mentioned was leaving the placenta behind temporarily and then going in and doing a secondary hysterectomy. But leaving the placenta for good. Uh, for autolysis is an entirely different thing. I am not a fan of that. And even if you are doing that, please don't use methotrexate for such patients. That has been now proven that to yep. do more harm than good in autolysis of the placenta. Mm -hmm. Sir, thank you, sir and ma'am. Uh, we are going to go to the next case. Uh, sir, yes, sir. One more point. I, I heard, I don't know whether I heard correctly, about piecemeal removal of the placenta in some cases and all that. Piecemeal removal of the placenta in these cases, I think, uh, not maybe not in this case, but piecemeal removal of placenta is, to some extent, uh, to my experience, is really dangerous because you are leaving behind placenta and that will really bleed more. If it is a term placenta, I think it is disaster. If you remove it piecemeal, you are going to have uncontrollable bleeding in your hand. The very purpose with which you started off, meaning I, I suppose you started a piecemeal removal only because you wanted to remove the placenta alone and conserve the uterus. And you certainly won't be able to do something like that. I think you either leave it alone, like Dr. Piley said, if you feel you cannot remove it because of its extreme adherence and, and, and uh, invasion, and then do later. People even embolize in between. You know, they embolize two days later and then go in and do the hysterectomy. I mean, all that is really individual practices. Or you do a proceed with a hysterectomy and do a complete job. I think getting into trouble doing anything else. I think anecdotal experiences are very different from what mm -hmm. should be the protocol. Yeah, I think uh, removing, changing, yes. removing piecemeal was in a case where, uh, I mean, I think that was what was mentioned. 
that it was in a case where they had not diagnosed placenta uh, accreta and it was a retained placenta and they tried to remove the placenta found it was not i mean that is what i understood otherwise i don't think uh, that is applicable to ps uh, we had left behind the two placentas one was a uh, 34 weeks she, that she was a primary with placenta for creta i am uh, in creta and also in that patient, we had given methotrexate <coughs> some years back. But now going through the literature, they say that methotrexate should not be given. But uh, it was a wonderful yes. experience. The placenta started coming away in pieces. Uh, and it took nearly two months for the whole placenta. We watched her carefully. And uh, we gave her broad spectrum antibiotics. And she recovered very well and went home. So we'll, methotrexate... be the... we'll be taking this up in the next case discussion, ma'am. Yeah. No, leaving so the sorry. placenta. Yes, ma'am. Shall we go on to the next case? Uh, I just want to inform you that we have uh, still about more than 100 people both on Zoom and on YouTube, and we still have unlimited time. So we'll continue with the discussion. Uh, I would now like to invite Dr. Maria, a colleague and a consultant in Bangalore Baptist Hospital, to present the second case. After that, we still have another nice case as the third case. Thank you, Dr. Rajneesh. Uh, I'll be presenting the second case. No. Uh, she's a 29-year-old gravid for abortion two and with, uh, with a previous ectopic pregnancy. At 28 weeks of pregnancy, she reported to the emergency with diffuse abdominal pain of one week duration and it was associated with vomiting since two days. So she was treated as gastritis as that was the first thing that it looked like, but she had no relief. A uh, significant history in the past was a uh, laparoscopic myomectomy pre uh, prior to th this pregnancy and a laparotomy for the ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Uh, on examination in the ER, uh, there was pallor, significant pallor. Her pulse rate was around 120 beats per minute with a BP of 100 by 60. And uh, uh, systemic examination was normal and per abdomen, uh, the abdomen was distended. Uh, and there was marked tenderness over the fundus of the uterus. Otherwise, the uterus was not contracted or uh, chronically contracted. It was relaxed. And the fetal heart rate was uh, good and there was no bleeding and she was not, she didn't seem to be in labor. Uh, the investigations initially which were done uh, showed a hemoglobin of 9 grams. And mainly lipase was done because they were thinking of pancreatitis and other surgical causes that turned out to be normal. And ultrasound showed a single uh, intrauterine fetus with normal growth and the placenta was in the fundal region and there was moderate amount of free fluid in the abdomen. That was the only significant finding, nothing else suggestive of anything. Uh... Uh, Shishila Rani, ma'am, uh, what would yeah. you think of as the first thing as the, in your differential diagnosis and how would you approach this patient? Um, uh, see, um, in this particular patient who has undergone a myomectomy before, and she's got some free fluid and it's a fairly advanced pregnancy. Um, uterus was not tender. It was, uterus was not tender. So, um, but there is a collection of fluid inside the abdomen. To, there are two things that come into my mind. One is the possibility of uh, uh, a blood vessel on the uterine cirrusal surface, which could have ruptured and which would have bled. This has happened in a couple of cases. And therefore, I, I think this is a very good possibility. Since there is a good amount of collection of blood and uh, this is all the information we have from the um, various investigations we have done, um, I think I would uh, do a laparotomy and see what actually has happened. Uh, if it is 24 <laughs> weeks, we could consider doing a laparoscopy also, but then I would do a laparotomy. So uh, as, as you suggested, this patient was planned for an emergency laparotomy, keeping in mind uh, any surgical cause or a uterine rupture, or like you said, any other uh, vessel rupture on the uh, uterine surface. Uh, Omar Devi, ma'am, uh, what were the pre -op, uh, preparations that you would uh, do in such a situation? And how would you counsel the patient and the attendants? Dr. Omar Devi? Sorry. So this patient, she has come at the 28th week of pregnancy with abdominal pain, distension, and suggestive of intraperitoneal bleed. So she must be bleeding within. So either there is a rupture of the uterus, previous myomectomy scar. So we have to prepare that we have to see that. Counseling her first is 
if there is a there is a possibility of a rupture uterus and also you have to be ready there may be injury to the uh, surrounding viscera bladder bowel ureter etc and you will have to receive sufficient blood transfusion so we have to counsel her that she should be ready for a laparotomy and she should be ready for uh, undergoing cesarean section she should be ready for uh, tackling any injuries and maybe a hysterectomy may be needed and um, also for the care of the preterm baby sufficient arrangement should be done so a multidisciplinary mm -hmm. team setup has to be there and the patient has to be counseled in this way so that we keep everything ready and also the investigations have to be done for this patient and to rule out other coagulation failure and other causes for the bleeding as well as a differential diagnosis Uh, yes, uh, in, in, uh, the intraoperative findings for this patient in uh, laparotomy that there was uh, two, two and a half liters of hemoperitoneum and uh, the baby was delivered by cesarean section. Uh, she uh, there was a boy baby 1.28 kg. The placenta was invading up to the serosa at the fundus and there was bleeding over the surface there and the fundus of the uterus was excised and the margins reconstructed. This is an intraoperative uh, findings. And this is a, a region where the placenta was invading the serosa. And this cut section, you can see that the placenta was invading the serosa. Lata ma'am, uh, what are the challenges that are faced during this kind of surgeries? And what are the management options for this patient? Um, actually, the diagnosis was a dilemma because uh, we wondered whether it was a non obstetric cause. There was no evidence of fetal distress. So uh, actually they said it is free fluid in the abdomen. When we tapped it, um, it was um, frank blood. That's when we decided on a laparotomy <clears throat> and we took an up and down incision on the abdomen because uh, we wanted to make sure that we um, approached the upper segment of the uterus um, properly. And also if there were to be any other upper abdominal non obstetric pathology. So um, that was the dilemma. The incision was dilemma. So we took an up and down incision on the abdomen. Um, then the placenta um, was actually localized to the fundus, but the tubes were um, fairly close to it. So since she was, um, since she didn't have any live pregnancies before and this was her first child at 28 weeks we wanted to conserve the uterus at any cost so we um, did a sort of decapitation of the fundus of the uterus um, and left a good margin of mimetrium um, that is in the interstitial area um, to protect the tubes and uh, we reconstructed the uterus so we could get away with the excision of the placental site uh, since it was a fundal placenta and it was the scar was at the myomectomy site. So um, I think that was an adequate management. And before we um, uh, 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 excise the placenta, I mean, along with the uterus, we clamped the, rather we ligated the infundibular pelvic ligaments, uh, sorry, vessels on both sides. Uh, Dr. Asha Kiran, would you like to uh, uh, highlight on the triple peak procedure and its advantages and uh, which yes. cases would you adapt it in? Okay, uh, so before answering that, I had a similar case scenario of uh, spontaneous uh, rupture of the fundus in an unscarred uterus, same like the previous case. Uh, so in that the scenario, what we did was we just repaired the fundal uh, um, rupture site and left the placenta in situ and the patient did well. Uh, so that was one of the alternative way of uh, management uh, in, with a similar case scenario. So triple, coming to the triple P procedure, it's a method of conservative procedure of uh, fast uh, disorder, and it consists of three P's. The basic concept here is to avoid hysterectomy and uh, to avoid the morbidity related to hysterectomy. 
So the first P would be pre-operative exact localization of the placenta so that you can plan your incision on the uterus. The second P would be pelvic uh, vessel devascularization so as to reduce the intraoperative uh, uh, blood loss. And the third P would be uh, placental non-separation. All attempts should be made not to uh, separate the placenta and not to disturb the placenta. And whichever myometrium wall is involved in the invasive placenta or placenta accreta, that part of the myometrium is excised and the remaining normal myometrium is uh, resutured and the uterus is reconstructed. So this procedure is of uh, great advantage in uh, conditions where you find a pass disorder which is localized to some areas. Uh, may not be a uniform uh, uh, um, disorder because placenta, the whole placenta, when you measure it, is around 20 centimeter. So you can't excise the whole uh, uh, 20 centimeter of the myometrium. Maybe in localized cases of pass disorder, this will be helpful. Thank you. No. Uh, Dr. Pali, Dr. Lakshmi, uh, do you have any comments regarding this uh, case and the management? Unmute, sir. Yeah, congratulations. That's the first thing I want to say. Was it Leda who did it, or uh, is it your case that Leda was just commenting? I don't know. <laughs> this was Dr. Lata Man's case. Yeah, okay, Leda, congratulations. Um, you mentioned that you ligated the infantile propelic vessels. Yes. You have probably done a tunique. What we do is a sliding knot so that the temporarily the infantile propelic vessels are. Uh, blocked because if you tie it off, then that side ovary also will get deprived of blood, mostly, isn't it? Okay. That anyway, just a small point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we too had this sort of a problem of fundal um, rupture, which is very notorious for its instability when you do conservative surgery. Uh, that is known to rupture subsequently. So, one or two things which uh, I planned in my mind after having dealt with one case uh, where she had a recurrent rupture was that certainly we should leave what only healthy tissue to be brought together. If it is closer to one corno, corno is the most notorious place to rupture. And in that case, we may even sacrifice that if the other side is okay. And I use actually um, PDS for closing that uterus. We cannot use proline, but PDS, which will give a longer scar, longer probably a scar tissue. And in one patient, I even went on to put mesh over that, but subsequently she hasn't come back to me pregnant, so I don't know whether it has helped or not. Anyway, the point I want to make is, it is really difficult to conservatively do a surgery of a rupture <laughs> or an incision of the fundus or corner region and to allow a subsequent pregnancy. The, regarding the triple P procedure, in patients who have percreta like the one case that you discussed early in the morning, uh, earlier, um, I wouldn't think about a triple P because you see the amount of tissue that you have to excise with the placenta may be so much that we may not be able to have a meaningful uh, reconstruction of the uterus. When uh, Chandraharan, Edwin Chandraharan presented came up with this triple P procedure, it was mainly with an idea of leaving the uterus behind. They even, most of the patients, they actually sterilize them. Uh, and uh, leaving a uterus behind with a difficult situation like this, um, I would not uh, think about. I would think about conservating the uterus for a future pregnancy, not for the sake of just leaving the uterus behind if it is anything like a percreta, like the one that you discussed. That's all my point about it. The, yes, uh, otherwise, congratulations. And it was a very useful exercise. Uh, I I a few questions, then I will try to address them. I just wanted to make one point here. This is a bleeding from the vessels from a percreta placenta rather than a rupture of the uterus. I'm not talking about the management. I'm just talking about terminology. Rupture of the vessel. That's right. Not so much of yeah. the rupture of the uterus. Yes, in a myomectomy scar, you can get a rupture of the uterus, but this is not a rupture of the uterus. This is an intact uterus, but That's the it. percreta vessels were bleeding, and That's therefore, it. you know, there was an emergency. Because if you see uh -huh. the 
fetal yeah. condition is good. So, uh, so Sheila, okay. unless there is a dehiscence or something, uh, and where the mimetrium is so very thinned out, you won't yes. have percreta. So it's almost, I mean, yes, the terminology rupture might not apply because serosa is still intact. But um, mm. yeah, uh, it yeah, is only, to I'm, dehiscence. I'm, semantics, that's all. Yeah. Just ter 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 terminology. Ma ma I case, was just uh, thinking. Sorry. In sorry. my case, uh, yeah, sorry, ma'am. In my case scenario, actually the fetus was in the abdomen uh, with spontaneous rupture of the fundal area of the placenta uh, uh, uterus due to perforation of the uh, placenta percreta. So the fetus was already in the abdomen. I think uh, so that actually the saved you the uh, worry, <laughs> I mean, uh, decision regarding where to make the incision and get the baby yes, out there. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. yeah, but yes. uh, apart from that, my my only comment on this is that lucky if you actually come across a situation mm -hmm. where the placental ad adherence or penetration is so localized that you are able to, you know, after excising it, get, a, a, you know, good closure mm -hmm. uh, without tension. Uh, you're, you're fortunate and I suppose these procedures are whether it is a triple P or excision or whatever are meant for those kind of situations. How many of us will actually come across this? I don't know. And they're especially located at the fundus where the excision as you said decapitation yeah. and suturing is easier. If That's that it. happens and if you're happy about your closure, absolutely fine. Yeah, she but was I very lucky. It is going it to was be few close. and far yeah, yeah, the other point which you come um, on is that yes. uh, that I went in with a vertical abdominal incision. Whenever you are unsure about the diagnosis, go by a vertical because Absolutely. Is, bleeders on the posterior surface, veins on the posterior surface, veins on the infundibular pelvic, all these also can present the same way, intrapetoneal bleed and the baby may still be inside. So whenever you are unsure, better to go by a vertical, vertical abdominal incision. Okay. Um, Sir, um, can, with the permission of um, the moderators, can I just ask uh, Pili sir a question? Yes, uh, sir. You did. You said uh, you would um, do a subtotal hysterectomy um, in uh, PAS, um, anterior PAS, obviously um, due to previous uh, cesarean section. Most of the time, they would have gone uh, extended up to the cervix. Uh, yes. Most of the time, because the placenta will be quite low lying. Um, so, uh, I mean, if the cervix is involved, you would certainly do a total hysterectomy, wouldn't you, sir? The, uh, Leda, I think a concept that we all have to be very clear about is this: even a centralis placenta doesn't go below the internal loss. From the internal loss to the external loss is the service, and that my service is there. If the patient had been in labor with the service taken up, then you have to do a total hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. The other is that part of the service, that thick uh, cylindrical tissue there, no need of trying to remove that because if you remove that, you want to push the bladder down further. And that is where the maximum bleeding and difficulties occur. My point is the moment you have gone below the level of the present charm, even if it's a little bit of the lower segment myometrium there, you can do a both stitch and close that. That is such a better tissue to tie and close rather than the vagina, which will come across with the total hysterectomy. Mm. So the point is, the patient had been in labor, do a total hysterectomy. If not in labor, don't labor, don't try to remove the entire cervix. Remove only, go just by palpating front to back like this, lower limit of the placenta, put your clamp across, get the uterus with the placenta. That is the point I mentioned, Leda. Because many people say, it is a placenta previa, you have the total hysterectomy. Forgetting that, even a placenta previa doesn't go below the level of the internal loss. And the unifaced service from internal loss to external loss, there will be two, three, four centimeters like that. You don't have to remove that. That mm -hmm. thick tissue, fibrous tissue of the service is so much better to tackle, tie by both stitches, than the vagina. That's my mm. point. Okay, even in PAs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Makes a lot. A very valid point. Valid point. Very valid point. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Post operatively, this patient was transfused uh, four units of Paxil and she gradually recovered. A uh, histopathology confirmed a placenta in Crete township. 
Dr. Malini, do you want to tell us about the challenges of the future pregnancy in this particular patient? Uh, definitely, uh, there will be a lot of challenges in the future pregnancy. Um, for all you know, it, it, uh, histopathological examination, maybe it is a placenta in Krita, but uh, clinically it was uh, grade 3A, I would say. Uh, so naturally, uh, no, there may be uh, chances of recurrence of pass in this uh, particular case. Uh, so recurrence of pass is uh, you know, maybe as high as uh, 28 to 29%. Uh, so one should look for uh, uh, such a, a situation when she conceives. You should uh, inform her about this thing Malini, that she could have. Sorry. Yes, uh, isn't the recurrence of uh, uh, placenta creta almost hundred percent if she removed a major portion of the fundus and the placenta is most likely to get implanted in the fundus only next time? Who knows? It may be a low lying placenta for all you know. Then you know. Then that is yeah. only one situation. That's right. You should, should be lucky because there are cases, you know, with the previous placenta previa. Next time everything was normal, so such a thing is possible. So, but then here, of course, the fundus was uh, a part of the uh, uterus was removed and reconstructed. And as uh, Madam Lakshmi, Madam told, like you know, it will be very thick. So how? What was the approximation? I wouldn't know. So. Um, so she may have a chance of a rupture, even if it is not yes. plasma per theta. She can have rupture much earlier. Yeah. We will have to have a, you know second trimester termination or preterm termination for uh, this patient. Uh, so it may rupture. That is uh, one possibility. Uh, so that should be kept in mind. And uh, she may land up in uh, uh, preterm hysterectomy or uh, hysterectomy in the second trimester. We had uh, such a case, you know, like. Uh, placenta percrita at 24th week, just like Asha Kiran told, you know, the fetus, fetus was in the peritoneal cavity. So, uh, actually, initially, the, the uterus was intact. By the time we shifted her, just the fetus had extruded into the uh, this thing, peritoneal cavity. And uh, luckily, we could uh, go ahead with the uh, hysterectomy with the placenta in situ. So, that's, that, these are some of the challenges I think we should keep in mind. Dr. Pali and Dr. Lakshmi, would you like to add anything to more to that no, regarding think, the uh, challenges for the future pregnancy? Yeah, I think the most important thing that was emphasized was that the possibility of that placenta getting implanted over the broad fundal scar is very high. If it occurs, you then go to temple every day, that is all I can tell you. And you <laughs> uh, uh, pregnancy go to live, uh, say, a salvageable level. Uh, but it need not be there. You know, yes. uh, Palacios, who has the maximum experience of uh, conservative surgery for placenta creature, where he has done 110 cases of placenta conservative surgery, and out of the 110 pregnancies, out of 400 or so conservative surgeries, and out of the 110 pregnancies, only four patients had recurrence over that area where he excised. So that is the reason why they were saying that conservative surgery is quite a viable option in this mm -hmm. case. But that was not the fundal. This is that was know, the segment. segment. But fundal mm -hmm. also we, we need not get, but think of that possibility very high. That's all I can tell you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Let's move on to the third case. So she's a gravida for parent who living two with one abortion, and she was diagnosed to have a placenta previa at 22 weeks elsewhere and was referred at 38 weeks for further management to a tertiary care center. And uh, at a referral, uh, the scan was repeated at the tertiary care center and was found to have a placenta previa involving the posterior wall and the left lateral wall with sus suspicion of accreta. So Dr. Jyoti, how would you plan your uh, management and plan the surgery in this patient? Uh, can I request to go back to the case? Yeah. Just, just want, just okay. fast. yeah. Now, this just uh, highlights the importance of attending CMAs. I wish somebody had attended the CMA so she, this lady wouldn't have been left alone at 38 plus four weeks with previous sections, with placenta previa, getting referred elsewhere because somebody would have been kind enough to deliver her at 36, 37th week maximum and reducing her risks of uh, bleeding more and uh, complications. Well, what are the good points? Well, uh, that uh, this lady is not bleeding actively. She's got a good hemoglobin. And luckily for her, she's got previous two cesarean sections and a placenta previa that is posterior. 
and uh, with the suspicion of placenta accreta. It did happen to us during the last COVID season. We had a lady referred from Chikmangalur to Hassan, Hassan to Bangalore, and she ended on our labs during the second COVID wave at 36 to 37 weeks with a little bit of bleeding. So what did we do? We, in this particular patient, what I did in my particular patient was that she did have an MRI before. So what is the role of MRI, which is such an advanced gestation? Uh, we did the re literature review because we wanted to find out. We had a patient who had a falsely uh, false positive diagnosis of placenta accreta at the fundus were actually on MRI and actually ultrasound uh, people kept saying that, no, no, it is not. And on table, we realized that MRI was wrong. So ideal situation for an MRI is actually not advanced gestation. It should be done anywhere between 24 to 30 weeks because the false positive as well as the false negatives increase after that period of pregnancy. Uh, we don't mind having a false positive, but false negative would have jeopardized the care for this particular patient. So uh, anyway, the MRI was done and the MRI said that there was an area of accreta, which did happen in our particular patient as well. It was uh, suspected to be uh, actually in creta into the bladder. But as Dr. Piley said rightly, that all cases of placenta previa, we should keep accreta at the back of the mind and get the team activated uh, whenever it is required. So uh, what do we do? We, we do have the option in this particular patient. Uh, well, I don't want to think of the options. She's had previous two cesarean sections. I would counsel her and consent her for hysterectomy, but it will be there at the back of the mind. What if, if I'm not able to do? So that will be there at the back of the mind always. So I will definitely cons uh, sorry, consent her for tubectomy. The MDT, the, the whole team will get activated in our hospital that would involve the blood bank, hematologist, interventional radiologist, ICU, anesthetist, like all my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, consent form would write clearly about hysterectomy, if not possible, conservative management with tubectomy, need for blood, blood transfusion, ICU, and later on, uh, second look laparotomy and hysterectomy if required, because we really don't know, having been there uh, with previous two sections where it is nothing is accessible, I would write that on the consent form. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, we have the habit of writing, uh, sorry, risk to the life of the mother also in the consent form because we've been there. So that's why we would always add and we would proceed with the case, which we did with that particular patient. She came in the morning at 10 o'clock, peak COVID season. And I was hoping that she's COVID negative. Luckily, she was negative because you can't imagine operating in a PPE uh, with the COVID gear. And that was during the second COVID wave where all of us were petrified. Uh, the whole team was activated. And in our team, we have a gynae oncology surgeon who comes to help us with, this, uh, with the, all the cases. And we operated on her by five o'clock in the evening. That was the quickest MDT that we ever had, 10 o'clock to five o'clock, everybody was ready and she did undergo hysterectomy and luckily it was possible in that particular case. Thank you. Moving on to this case, she was posted for an elective cesarean section. Blood was arranged. She was opened by a vertical skin incision. There were dense ad uh, adhesions between the anterior abdominal wall and the uh, a uterus. And uh, Dr. Asha, what were the challenges that you faced when you were managing this patient? Yeah, the first challenge, as uh, Jyoti ma'am already told, it was like, a, she was like a ticking bomb when she came at 38 weeks, so late. Uh, so that was the first challenge. And then uh, uh, we prepared uh, uh, everything as usual, taking uh, uh, the, informing the case to anesthetist, neonatologist, urologist, everyone. And then uh, with the pre-operative uh, uh, suspicion of uh, pass uh, disorder, we took the patient for an elective uh, uh, cesarean. And we also did a pre-operative localization of the placenta, wherein it was uh, not exactly posterior. It was posterior lateral attachment of the uh, placenta. So opening the abdomen was a great challenge because there were dense adhesions. And when we tried to uh, release the adhesions, uh, so the anterior surface of the uterus started bleeding. Uh, it was a case of increta, which was just short of the serosa. Maybe uh, we don't know whether it was an increta or percreta in some areas. Uh, so it started bleeding. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we took a classical uh, uterine incision oh. in this scenario because we couldn't approach the lower uterine segment. And then a classical uterine incision uh, and we could avoid the 
um, uh, placental uh, incision, I mean incision on the placenta. And after extraction of the baby, um, <clears throat> we waited for around 20 to 30 minutes. And in the meantime, uh, the uterine edges and the bleeders were uh, ligated and uh, we waited for to confirm the non-separation of the placenta. Um, and when we confirmed that the placenta is not separating and uh, we checked on the PV bleeding and there was no PV bleeding absolutely and there was no bleeding from the uterine cavity anywhere. And after confirming this, we cut the cord uh, close to the insertion and then we closed the uterine incision in two layers and we did the tubectomy and uh, intraoperatively uh, we gave uh, tranexamic acid. Um, we did give oxytocin to this patient, uh, five units only, because as soon as the baby is extracted, uh, the anesthetist uh, quickly gives off the oxytocin before we could tell them. Uh, but uh, nothing actually happened. No uh, hemorrhage was encountered. And uh, the average blood loss here was around 500 to 800 ml because the placenta did not separate at all. No, not even a single part of the placenta separated here. And intraoperatively, what we found was th there was a lateral bulge. Uh, so the placenta was extending more laterally into the towards the broad ligament and the parametrium. And some part was uh, in the posterior. It was uh, anteriorly also uh, visible but at a lower extent. So it was mostly a posterior lateral attachment of the uh, placenta. Yes. So this is so, what we did intraoperatively. So there was intentional retention of the placenta in this case because you thought there was extension into the parametrium. Yes, yes, yes. Manuel, madam, what are the situations where you would uh, like to go for intentional retention of the placenta? Yeah, one is this situation only where, you know, you don't know like what to do and there is no bleeding. It's better to leave her alone and maybe you can uh, delay the hysterectomy uh, for a later date. You can postpone it. Uh, means like, you know, doing hysterectomy will be more harmful for her. In such situations, you can uh, re uh, retain the placenta. And uh, in uh, places where patient wants to retain the uterus, okay, so for fertility, for future fertility purpose, for example, your uh, second case, you know, suppose she had come much earlier, say at 22 weeks of gestation and she landed up in laparotomy for some reason, bleeding and all that. So naturally, you would uh, like to preserve the uterus. So in such situations, suppose the placenta is uh, adherent and not bleeding, I would uh, definitely, we can re uh, leave the placenta behind. And, uh, you know, if this happens, usually when we do a cesarean section, uh, we have the dilemma where we do hysterectomy or we beat the placenta in situ or shall we uh, just close the uterus and do hysterectomy and things like that. But you can encounter uh, situations where after vaginal delivery, you find that it is placenta accreta and she doesn't bleed because we had one such case, placenta accreta and then after delivery, placenta wouldn't separate at all. So I don't know, it was about uh, seven to eight years uh, back ago. Uh, so we left, uh, we just cut cut the cord at the level of external loss and left her behind and then uh, uh, antibiotics up. and then uh, we just had to follow her up. She came, you know, she came for follow up and that time we didn't know exactly how to manage even methotrexate was uh, in vogue and we had given her injection methotrexate uh, and she came for follow up up to three months and up to three months the uterine size was just at the level of umbilicus. She was not at all worried, like she didn't have any complaint, but we were worried why, where she will land up in uh, sepsis, whether we should continue antibiotic, whether she'll have bleeding. So all the future problems we were thinking, but she was quite comfortable, but afterwards she was lost for follow. But the literature says that complete resorption will take place and may take up to nine months also without any problem. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, do you add anything to the intentional retention of placenta? I may just add that uh, you just may take even up to nine months for resorption without any problem is the problem. It is not. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. Always with a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah. The worry, thing but it... patient was very, very comfortable actually in this situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think um, there are anecdotal reports available with everyone. In fact, even I have managed two of them. Uh, one actually was sent to me after the placenta was left behind and then she came for follow-up and another one we did it and same. 
the thing is you you just need to uh, you can do it only when there is no torrential bleed obviously yes, so yes, so yes. totally adherent that is not bleeding you obviously can't close otherwise or you know there are some people who might if the it is just a ooze and it's not a torrential bleed you might embolize and close or you close with the uterus there and then embolize 2 3 days later then options are do you want to go ahead and do remove the uterus uh, you know few days later like dr pilee mentioned earlier much easier than on the, you know doing it at the time of uh, c section the second uh, option of course is to just leave it behind and watch the morbidity is pretty high i mean you the complications listed and i we have in cmc lost a patient because of sepsis and septicemia patient went home with this everybody thought everything was fine she came home some 48 days later just beyond this definition of maternal mortality but she still came back and she came at florid sepsis and she died so sepsis is a problem bleeding is a problem and these two things have to be more certainly remembered and so an emergency laparotomy may be required at any point in time and severe sepsis and septicemia is another big issue so i think keeping all this in mind you might do it in an occasional patient when you think you can but i say i think it is a heroic measure i think you uh, know we should consider this kind of a um, um, uh, situation only and only in a patient who is willing to come for follow up and who can be strict Clearly monitored. Only in those kind of situation, uh, possibly if somebody is not willing to come for follow up or is likely to go away, then those kind of uh, patients, you know, you will worry unnecessarily over them. And I feel, you know, monitoring is extremely important. You know, after we leave the placenta behind, we will worry, she will worry, and then you know, it will be a worse nightmare if she comes in the middle of the night with a heavy bleeding. and uh, so therefore these are the two complications one the most important one is bleeding and the second is sepsis like dr lakshmi said and then um, um, uh, and there is no role for methotrexate now though earlier it was believed that there could be some role there is no role for methotrexate at all some have mentioned about uh, vesico uterine fistula and there are some reports of uterine necrosis following a, a retained placenta following delivery so these are some of the complications but the two most uh, um, unforgiving complications are uh, uh, hemorrhage and sepsis i would say what about future fertility sushila i i i don't think there has been uh, sorry my patient yeah. my patient conceived and had a baby yeah. subsequently patient yes, yes, yes. yeah. anecdote yes mm, anecdote We, like you said, Lata, I I've also searched in the literature about the possible pregnancies yes. in this kind of situation. Well, uh, surprisingly, there are not many, not many long-term yeah. follow-ups of this kind of patients. There are maybe others, but not this. Maybe because, ma'am, they are previous cesarean, and uh, you do a concurrent tubal ligation. They are already having two or one living issues, so that's why the literature has very less finding on. Uh, um subsequent pregnancy possible it, it it is a difficult data to get okay yes. even uterine mm-hmm. artery embolization or selective arterial embolization going to the placenta etc are not going to be of much use um mm-hmm. that's what the literature says uh, of course methotrexate we have already mentioned well, yeah. the reason for that could be by embolization You are devascularizing it, you know. That's right. There is a tissue there, and where supply is taken away, and that means that's a in a heyday for bacteria. Bacterial right? infection. Yeah. Actually, it is likely to be more risky. Like you know, yes. that can happen to some myomas which go with the uh, uterine yeah. arterialization. There can be a huge ball of uh, tissue that can be necrotic and neither is for infection. Mm. yes ma'am i would like to add on this when we see the literature the complications which are mentioned uh, they mentioned they have mentioned the success rate as 78% yeah and the largest yeah. series which is uh, present till date of 167 cases is not from a single institute it is from 40 institutions and uh, there is no they are all again case series and case reports and uh, they have not just left the placenta in c2 they have done additional procedures adjuvant procedures in 60% of the cases including uterine artery embolization bilinch sutures 
uh, then other compression sutures, internal iliac artery ligation, they have even given methotrexate in, in 20% of the cases. So maybe all these adjuvant uh, treatments may will, will add on to the morbidity because there is a difference between involution and necrosis. So when you cut off the blood supply by doing all these adjuvant procedures, maybe it heals, it undergoes necrosis and that adds to the sepsis. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you should allow it to involute like how the uterus involutes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. over a period of time, obviously there will be, there is no doubt that the blood supply will be reduced over reduced. a period of many yes. weeks. Yeah. So it will undergo a slow autolysis. In my follow-up of these patients, what I have noticed is none of them will have torrential hemorrhage. They will have on and off PV bleeding, on and off PV spotting. And uh, yeah, uh, they will uh, definitely have some signs of localized sepsis, which we have to identify it early and treat. And in the case series, which I was telling, uh, in 30% of the patients, they have given antibiotics, prophylactic antibiotics. The rest, 70% have not received any prophylactic antibiotics. So maybe that has added on to the uh, huge uh, morbidity which they have reported in the literature. So unless there is a well-designed study, we cannot comment on the safety and efficacy. It's very it's difficult to do like a well-designed study also. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Moving, on. Case, yeah. Yeah. Moving on. Can I remove the placenta piecemeal? It on for two months after oh. the leaving it in situ. But then finally, the uterine cavity was empty. Yes. Another patient yes. Uh, went against medical advice with the hysterectomy to be done about three days later. But then she did not come immediately. She came back after 10 days with torrential hemorrhage and died. Ayayo. So that uh, she went against medical advice. Mm -hmm. Yes, th there are some scenarios, ma'am, where uh, the placenta is not uniformly invasive everywhere. So some areas might be a normal placenta, some areas might be accreta, some areas might be obvious invasive. So in that scenario, if you do expected management, then obviously you'll land up in problem. The bottom line, we should not send, they should not be allowed to go home. Yeah, there should be long-term follow-up <laughs> with follow all the yes. caution. May not be suitable <laughs> to our country. Okay, if, if, if this case was mine, I would probably, and if I'm not prepared to do an emergency hysterectomy at that point of time, I would probably close and then consider doing a hysterectomy at a later date in a better yeah. prepared theater and a better yes. setup. That's right. But, uh, no. better MDT. The patient um, I, is a little scary for me. Yeah. Sure. When the patient doesn't have any complaints, no, there'll be a dilemma whether we should uh, do a hysterectomy at all, leave her alone, give her some more time. Mm, it should be enough, yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. Can I say something further? Uh, Uma, ma'am, what would be yeah. the options when you encounter an unsuspecting placenta accreta at laboratory? Okay. Can I say the something? options here are, suppose I am uh, seeing an unsuspected placenta accreta, depends on the condition of the patient, whether she's stable and whether I have all the facilities to tackle the situation. And if I find that the patient is stable and I do not have any facility to tackle the situation and I find that there is obviously there is a pl placenta pre accreta and the, as evident by the blood vessels and the bluish discoloration, bulge, everything, I would make arrangements to see that all the facilities come and then only I will proceed with the um, surgery. Otherwise, I would close the abdomen and then send her to a center where the facilities are available. Now, if once the facilities are available are coming and I'm finding a placenta accreta and I, I have everything to manage. I would avoid the placenta, do an incision above that. And in one of the cases, we had to do a transfundal incision transfers and deliver the baby. It was an unsuspected placenta accreta. And uh, there was no place anywhere in the uh, body of the uterus or lower segment, anywhere we could not do only the fundus. And the patient baby was delivered and then she underwent an hysterectomy. So this is a very dangerous, tricky situation. Once you find this, you have to alert the personnel, the MDT team, arrange for blood, blood products, and also take the, um, uh, like if we should have anticipated, but if consent is not taken, again, a tricky situation, 
uh, getting a consent and um, uh, explaining about the injuries to the bladder, to the ureter, need for hysterectomy, need for blood transfusion, need for ICU care, all these things become very difficult. And so in that case, then we are in a dilemma what to do when we are not ready with the enough consent taken. And we may be forced to again close. And then if she's in a stable condition, treat her. If she's not in a stable condition, we have to deliver the baby, gear up the team, have um, um, be ready for the hysterectomy, give blood transfusion, and manage, as Dr. Piley has told, uh, arrest the bleeding by using all methods like the aortic clamp and uh, also the uh, if you are not well versed with that, at least uh, internal iliac ligation. If the table for that we have to have an hybrid table to do the ligation. What is possible? I would do a internal iliac ligation, decrease the blood to the vessels, and also from retro uh, peritoneal approach and do an hysterectomy in these cases. So various, all these methods will be done. So all depends on whether patient is stable or not, whether we are prepared or not, whether we have all the facilities or not. And that in that way, I would be managing the situation. Shobha ma'am, you wanted to add on, add <laughs> something earlier. Uh, so I had the one add-on and one question to Paini sir. So I think um, uh, first, uh, the, the question is to everybody actually. Uh, giving the given the context which uh, Dr. Uma just now did. Louder, Shoba. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay. So given the context which uh, Dr. Uma just now answered, I'm just wondering that cases like this, when we are so unprepared, can we initiate because there is such a huge expertise now available in certain pockets in our country, especially with Dr. Paili in Kerala. Can we have some kind of a helpline and a video consult at this point of time, you know, when, when an unexpectedly we see this kind of a PAS? So can we have a helpline and a registry wherein we can record our cases, especially a uh, um, troubleshooting helpline at, at the time when we discover this catastrophic possibility of massive hemorrhage because hemorrhage from placenta accreta has to be seen to be believed. Those of us who have seen can vouch for that. So we need to alert our young obstetricians also the, how, to, how to build up the team once they encounter this. And as Dr. Uma rightly said, the consent would not have been okay. So we need to stop the procedure, uh, relook. Uh, call for the help and then one of the team, possibly the main consultant, has to go out and talk to the relatives all over again and talk to the patient if she's in the regional anesthesia. That is one thing. The other thing I wanted to ask Tyler, sir, was uh, that we have encountered, uh, you know, after hysterectomy, uh, embolization of uh, uterine vessels and blood component therapy post-operative hemorrhage in the pelvis. Post-operative hemorrhage requiring laparotomy. And uh, the ooze was so generalized that we have, uh, we have packed the pelvis for 48 hours, uh, bringing the end of the pack back. And 48 hours later, we were able to, to remove the pack and uh, we were able to control the hemorrhage in that way. And um, uh, we, tamponade balloons also are available for this purpose. I just wanted to ask, Pailey, sir, when, when there is post-operative bleeding, how, what has been his experience as it happened? Unmute yourself, sir. Post-operative bleeding after a placenta accreta situation. I didn't hear you well, Shobha. Post hysterectomy, sir. Post hysterectomy in the post operative. We had, I had, in fact, two. Post embolization also. We had already done embolization also in that case. Yeah, I had, two, I had two occasions to go in again. On both occasions, it was the bladder that caused the bleeding. That is why I am very particular that the R base is the one that usually reactivates, not usually the stumps. Stumps, we are extra careful. Bladder base is the problem. And uh, as Leda said a while ago, in case you have already done the embolization and you don't know what to do, then patch. I haven't had.
to do it so far, but that's an option. But when you think about packing, packing balloon is one of the options that was mentioned. The other simpler option is, I hope you would have probably heard um, Revi from Malaysia describing his... So you're getting... Sir, again... No, muted. Muted, muted. sir. No, I am not... Ask on mute. Ask on mute. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Ravi from Malaysia mentioned about pelvic packing uh -huh. and bringing it out through a colonotomy uh, yes. incision. Yeah, colonotomy or if there is a total hysterectomy through the vagina, you can take it out. That gives a really good big bunch. And mm -hmm. the advantage there I see that it is gauze. Unlike in the case of the bakri, where it is the bakri, that plastic uh, outer surface, unlike that, if you use the gauze, it may have probably more effect or pressure on that point. And the other advantage which I found with his technique, we are keeping such a I mean, gauze and a socks filled with this material and then keeping it in case we require it sometime. So pelvic packing is an option to consider. Yes, sir. Our patient survived due to that uh, pelvic packing and uh, the surgeon advised to, uh, to do only a rough closure of the abdomen. And then we went and again did a laparotomy, removed all the pack and did a knee closure. That is what we did in our case. The advantage uh, of the pelvic pack uh, is that you don't have to do the second laparotomy. You can pull it out through the vagina. And that's a very uh, ingenious and simple uh, way of doing it. Thank you. Moving forward, uh, Lata ma'am, can we have a quick word about the preventive strategies that we have to adopt in reducing the PAS? Uh, of course, the primary prevention of cesarean section is the most important. It is the most important thing. <laughs> and uh, any most surgery... important thing. And also, I think we should encourage VBACs also. Myomectomies um, are being done very often nowadays. Laparoscopic yeah, myomectomies are becoming uh, uh, a very fancy yes. procedure. And also, um, DNCs, even for Surgical um, evacuations, DNCs, all these have to be avoided. And also even sim something simple like IUI, repeated IUI can uh, cause pleasant accretor. So I think all these um, procedures, if they can be really sort of uh, done according to an evidence-based protocol, I think it will go a long way in reducing PAs. Um, double layer closure during um, section. <clears throat> a few years ago, we had um, gone back to single layer closure, though there are no, um, uh, what can I say, comparative studies, uh, maybe double layer closure might reduce the pleasant um, um, accreta spectrum uh, because hopefully you will have a thicker um, lower segment. Um, uh, though it is not scientifically proven. Um, it's logical, probably. And um, the other thing is, um, what can I say? Yeah, uh, obviously, we are all using um, Vicryl. And also, dehiscence. If you recognize dehiscence, it's a question in my own mind. Um, dehiscence is one of the causes for uh, uh, scar ectopic, pleasant uh, accretor. Scar ectopics, ultimately, they, if they continued and if they're not recognized, they become PAS. So dehiscence in a uterus, if recognized for any reason, should we be closing if they are desiring, if the couple is desiring future fertility is a question that um, I'm not sure how to answer that. And also prevent, since I'm talking about prevention of PAS, if the uh, gestational sac is implanted um, lower down, in the <clears throat> uh, uterus, especially in a scarred uterus, whether we should um, think that it might develop into PAS and be more careful, or whether we should um, even give, um, I mean, well, treat it medically uh, with methotrexate. I'm not sure if it is really um, uh, lower down. It might be uh, probably uh, uh, an extreme treatment, but to prevent PAS, whether a lower low implantation of the sac, especially in a scarred uterus, whether we should consider. 
Thank you, ma'am. Sir, is, are there any surgical techniques yes. that you yes. would recommend yes. to prevent yes. PAS? Yes, sir. sir and Lakshmi, ma'am, can we have your comments on this? Uh, on what? On what Leda said, I have just a point to bring out. Yes, sir. You all probably know about Henry Murray from New South Wales, Australia. He was saying about a trial they did, single layer closure and double layer closure, and the incidence of placenta accreta. They proved that double layer closure has higher incidence of placenta accreta than single layer closure. Oh, so, that's uh, that is um, yeah, what I have found, Leda, is the point like this. Usually, when we close the cesarean, cesarean is the playground for all the PGs and all that, isn't it? How do we close? I just bring together somehow. We seldom explain to them the importance of the myometrium to myometrium. Mm -hmm. If the decidua is interposed between myometrium, that is how the niche occurs. Later, the decidua goes off and you see a thinned out scar. So the point I would emphasize is Myometrium to myometrium is important. Previously, we used to be told that, you know, don't include the decidua when you take yes. the bite. Senior, senior generation yeah. among you may remember that when you're taking the, you know, yeah. sticky, avoid the decidua and all that. It is important that way. So that the decidua, if it is interposed between the muscle of the lower segment, there will be a niche there. And that is what become a gutter later, inviting the implantation at that point. Second point is, we are now doing more and more women cesarean before they are in labor. So you are invariably your incision is at a higher level than if they were in labor and then you did a lower segment cesarean. So you are getting a scar at an area which is accessible for the implanting uh, zygote rather than if it is a lower segment which is formed and you put your incision after pushing the bladder down, then that scar area is away from where the implantation is located. These are a few thoughts. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to make an announcement. Uh, I was so glad to hear Shiny, sorry, Dr. Shiny mentioning the ORRT. We are implementing it. We have a scheme of doing ORRT and we are doing physical workshops for that with giving hands on. But because of the COVID, now we are doing it online. And yesterday, actually, we did one. It's online. So if you are interested, we have another session on 12th of February afternoon, two to four. If you are interested, we can send you the login details. If anybody is interested, you can join. It's online, so no additional charge for that. Okay. Sure, sir. Thank you very much for that. Um, Lakshmi, ma'am, would you want to add anything? Uh, um, yeah, all of us know that, um, you know, uh, there are no very definite um, ways of preventing uh, any surgical techniques. We can theorize, we can uh, try out you know and probably have some trials but um, uh, pr follow <laughs> apart from saying that avoid as far as possible for avoid primary c sections no particular technique has been shown to be any better than the other that is all that i can say thank you uh, thank you if any of you want to add on anything to the panel no. yeah i wanted uh, to add something the about marks. the urine tree sorry sorry sorry, sorry. Carry on, carry on. Uh, no. No, about the uretric stenting that we were discussing, I wanted to say that especially those who are beginning to do it, uh, you know, to deal with the pleasant accretor spectrum, uh, even for hysterectomy, I used to tell my PGs if this, uh, you know, the junior still you become adapted to catheterize the ureter. I think it's a very important step. And uh, till you get extremely used to it, I mean, we can see Dr. Piley saying he does it even now. So I think it may be a good idea to definitely catheterize the ureters before you proceed with it. That's a, that's a comment that I did want to make. Yeah. Uh, reducing the primary cesarean section in the long term will reduce the incidence of PS. Yes. Maybe we should uh, put a number to the number of cesarean sections that we do. Um, well, no, no cesarean section yes. after two. That should uh, uh, that should be. I mean, in, uh, at least to some extent, reduce the number of PS. I feel like you know there are people who come to me. With the third and with the fourth cesarean. Fourth cesarean, yeah, they do the, come for the fourth cesarean. My mouth when I am to actually <laughs> take care of their pregnancies. So, I, I, and they come and tell me that in Saudi it is very common to have five cesarean sections. Yeah. 
So the, the next thing I tell them is to go back and take their antenatal care in Saudi. <laughs> then having said that, you know, if we can bring down or bring a ruling saying that only two are no more than two, that would we work. Can't, uh, Sushila. Can't, uh, <laughs> not in yeah, our country, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, they don't realize people the are shouting. WHO is shouting from the top of the roof, asking us to reduce the primary section rates. Have we done it? No. That's Can the I problem. Uh, yeah. Can I share something? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to share something which worked for St. Philomena's Hospital. Okay. And, uh, it's not course, really audible. Okay. Sober, not audible. Now is it better? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So in in Saint Philomena's Hospital, Bangalore, we tried something uh, just before the pandemic because uh, you know there was an alert from the from the convent side, the management side, that uh, section rate was very high. It was going close to forty percent. So then we decided that we will put an individual consultant audit, and we will uh, in one of the in one of the meetings per month which we have for our teaching. We will just see the indications of each consultant, and it did. It did kind of make some difference and brought in a little higher level of consciousness about decision making. And uh, uh, you know uh, that that is how more patients. It, it it did make a little difference, and then they also appreciated. After that, the pandemic came and everything has has been not up to mark again. But yes, that will that may help our own audit for our work and looking at where we could have reduced our own incidence. So that helped in our institution, not that it will help every time. Okay. So, yeah. One thing uh, with the permission of chair, Dr. Sadhana Gupta here. Uh, one thing with all the previous, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, one thing with all previous cesarean section, what in my practice, what we see the IVF and the endoscopic surgeries and the hysteroscopic surgeries, that is also, I think, and I like what we think that I think all is all of us should take the IVF pregnancy is always a high risk situation for placental complication as well as adherent uh, placenta, uh, this morbidity. And second thing, we want to have opinion of Dr. Pelly for two things which I have learned through all these expertise. One is the post-operative hysteroscopic resection of the remained placenta when we have left placenta. And second mm. is the retro, like the posterior approach when we are not able to do what Dr. Asha was saying. There was no place to like put any incision. So the posterior approach for the inspection. So what's your sir, take away for the hysteroscopic resection of the placental tissue after the we leave it uh, behind? There have been many case reports of hysteroscopic removal of the placental remnants <coughs> from the uterus. Personally, sorry, as was mentioned by Leda, I think Leda, uh, it's always better to avoid ending up with placenta inside to be resolved, infected and all that. I am not at all a fan of leaving the placenta behind. So many problems. Lakshmi also highlighted that. But if you had to do it, hysteroscopic removal later is certainly not. Okay. Yes, About the posterior approach, I didn't get your question, sir. That's the literature. From the posterior, no, they are, they are doing it. UCMS and few experts I have taken a video that they start the from the posterior approach they start dissecting for the uh, hysterectomy in the parthita in placenta parthita like they start posterior uh, retrograde hysterectomy personally I have thought about it I haven't tried it I have thought about it but I can't find uh, any appeal in that that is why I don't go for it no this uh, Resecting from below, separating the placenta, the bladder first, and all that. Many people come out with that. I can't find all that as practical. So I haven't tried them. I, I should say I haven't tried them. Uh, particular incision on the abdomen, on the uterus, if you have decided to do a hysterectomy, anywhere you can apply. You can incise fundus, you can incise posterior wall. The Japanese prefer to put a transverse incision at the fundus, whichever like. I don't know whether I address your question. Uh, yes, yes, you address. I wish, we wish to have your comment and experience. Though I'm also not doing any like retrograde hysterectomy, but this was the experience that values a lot. 
Thank you, Dr. Bell. You have answered my question and query. I will say a last comment before I uh, propose the vote of thanks. Dr. Rajneesh, can I just say something? If you don't mind. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now we are talking about reducing primary cesarean section. See, we have to really, I mean, unless and until the government improves the infrastructure, because still in periphery, non-availability of anesthetists, all these matters. So, you know, the obstetricians take a hurried decision because nighttime they may not get the emergency facilities and, you know, it matters. So that is also the reason for the primary cesarean section uh, incidence increase. So the yeah. improvement in the infrastructure and availability of uh, the uh, other services will play a big role. And I think unless and until that happens in public sector, also the incidence is 50% and it will not come down. As Dr. Shobha said, we are doing individual audit. Yes, it really made some difference, but unless and until the other places, the infrastructure is improved because uh, Dr. Paili, sir, I mean, Kerala, you know, uh, it is... Uh, uh, the infrastructure is very good, but that is not the case. In fact, South, we are better. But I think all other parts of the country, it is still a concern. That's what I wanted to add. Thank, Thank you. you Actually, today, the vagina delivery needs much more infrastructure than a cesarean delivery. We have something because pelvis, hitting, CTG, legal issues, so many things. So, Dr. Shilamane rightly uh, right now put out that these are the practical issues which lead to and please insert your unshare your PPT, na? Yeah. Yes, um, thank you very much, Baptist oh, and yes. team and BSO okay. team for um, such an interesting panel. Um, congratulations, Satyavani and team. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Pai, yeah. sir, your final yeah, comments. Yeah. The question about cesarean section rate, that's something which we had been um, in my own institution all through, very keen on keeping the C section rates, primary section rates under control. And so the only way we can do it, each obstetrician, each institution feeling proud of saying that I haven't done an avoidable sure. area. And to know that, you may have to probably interact. So our own method is every morning, we have what is called the morning report. And every consultant comes together. Previous days, there was serine under things, especially serines are audited. And uh, if you feel there could be an alternative approach, then and there we say, without any loss of face, we can then tell, because this is done to everyone. So morning report, that is the one. And we have been able to keep the section rates about 15%. Robson's first four categories, primary section rates, Progress. Section Progress. Section rates, 15, and section rates, we have no control because previous cesareans, we are not very capable of doing uh, the back. We don't promote it unless the patient wants it. So our aim is to keep the primary section rate low and each and every obstetrician should feel compelled to do that out of their own conscience. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to propose a vote of thanks uh, on behalf of our department. Uh, we have the whole department behind me. Uh, from my right is Dr. Ravi. He is the gynae oncologist who is behind all the uh, complex surgeries. He is always there. Dr. Satyavani, uh, uh, high risk obstetrics. Dr. Maria is the junior consultant. Dr. Shaini, head of the department. And Dr. Nalini, former HOD and senior consultant. The two ladies behind me are Anne and Shruti, who are managing the whole show uh, behind the scene. So on behalf of uh, the department, I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank the uh, admin of Baptist Hospital and uh, uh, BSOG for this uh, honor and for this privilege to do this webinar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paili, sir, very much. And Dr. Lakshmi, ma'am, uh, on a Sunday, we have taken a full day and uh, we expect, uh, we wanted the uh, thing to have a very good audience. And so we actually, <laughs> I planned the, uh, uh, the panel for one hour, but we've actually gone beyond two hours. And we are very thankful to you for your valuable input, you and Dr. Lakshmi, ma'am. On a Sunday, very valuable inputs. Uh, Dr. Sheila Mane, Dr. Sadhana Gupta, Dr. Padmini Prasad, very good talks, very interesting. All of us were very 
enlightened and lot of inputs we receive thanks to all the chairpersons and the moderators and of and the panelists for actively participating and dr sheila mane to coming uh, to baptist and encouraging us uh, special thanks to dr sheila mane and dr shrimati who were behind the scenes for the scientific committee i have introduced team 1 to you uh, dr ann and shruti behind us and we also have from mis uh, and uh, from the admin mr uday uh, mr javed mr saravanan and uh, mr manu who have been managing all the logistics uh curfew is over we hope that we meet quickly soon as we are planning to go on site and have another uh, a nice cme and we hope to invite we hope to see all of you the invitation is open so once again thank you very much and to god be all the glory and be safe and take care thank you very much thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you. wonderfully thank to you. us thank you thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you sir for job thank you team baptist thank you thank you madam lakshmi thank you thank you thank all you. Okay. thank you baptist oh that's the team